This time I approached the geometry differently. I ignored the miles and just looked at the map. My prior exercise had given me a general idea of how far and wide the triangle could stretch on the map. I started studying the roadways and towns in this zone. Each time a location interested me, I measured the distances to see if I could come up with a triangle of approximately 328 miles. I had measured out nearly two dozen locations, failing to get even close on the approximation of mileage each time, when I came across a town on the north side of the baseline that was so small that it was denoted by only a black dot, the smallest demarcation of a population center in the map legend. It was a town called Clear. I knew of this place, and I suddenly got excited. In a moment of flash thought, I knew that it fit the poet's profile. Using my driver's license, I measured the distances. Clear was approximately 80 miles north of Las Vegas on the Blue Diamond Highway. It was then another 150 miles approximately on rural routes across the California border and down through the Sandy Valley to the 15 Freeway and the third point of the triangle at Zizek's. Adding in the baseline mileage between Zizek's and the airport in Vegas, I had a triangle of approximately 322 miles, just six miles shy of the total put on the rental car belonging to one of the missing men. My blood started to jump in my veins. Clear Nevada. I had never been there, but I knew it was a town of brothels and whatever community and outside services are spawned by such businesses. I knew of it because on more than one occasion in my career as a cop, I had traced suspects through Clear Nevada. On more than one occasion, a suspect who voluntarily surrendered to me in Los Angeles reported that he had spent his last few nights of freedom with the ladies of Clear Nevada. It was a place where men would go privately, taking care to leave no trail that would reveal them as having dipped in such murky moral waters. Married men. Men of success. Or religious piety. In a strong way, it was much like the red light district in Amsterdam, a place where the poet had previously found his victims. So much of cop work is pursuing gut instinct and hunches. You live and die by the hard facts and evidence. There is no denying that. But it is your instinct that often brings those crucial things to you and then holds them together like glue. And I was following instinct now. I had a hunch about Clear. I knew I could sit at the dinette table and plot triangles and map points for hours if I wanted to. But the triangle I had drawn with the town of Clear at the top was the one that held me still at the same time the adrenaline was jangling in my blood. I believed I had drawn McCaleb's triangle. No, more than believed it, I knew it. My silent partner, using his cryptic notes as direction, I now knew where I was going. Using my license as a straight edge, I added two lines to the map, completing the triangle. I tapped each point on the map and stood up. The clock on the wall in the kitchenette said it was almost five. I decided it was too late to go north tonight. I would arrive in near darkness, and I didn't want that. That could be dangerous. I quickly put a plan in motion to leave at dawn and have almost an entire day to do what I needed to do in clear. I was thinking about what I would need for the trip when there was a knock on my door that startled me, even though I was expecting it. I walked over to let Buddy Lockridge in. Chapter 24 Harry Bosch opened the door and Rachel could tell he was angry. He was about to say something when he saw it was her and checked himself. That told her he was waiting for somebody and that that somebody was late. Agent Walling. Expecting someone? Uh, no, not really. She saw his eyes flick past her and checked the rear parking lot. Can I come in? Sorry, sure, come on in. He stepped back and held the door. She entered a sad little efficiency apartment that was sparsely furnished in depressing colors. On the left was a dinette table circa 1960s, and she saw on it a bottle of beer, a notebook, and a road atlas open to a map of Nevada. 
Bosch moved quickly to the table and closed the atlas and his notebook and stacked them one on top of the other. She then noticed his driver's license was on the table as well. So what brings you over here to this swell place? he asked. Just wanted to see what you were up to, she said, leaving suspicion out of her voice. I hope our little welcome wagon wasn't too difficult for you today. Nope, comes with the territory. I'm sure it does. How did you find me? She stepped further into the room. You're paying for this place with a credit card. Bosch nodded but didn't seem surprised by the speed or questionable legality of her search for him. She moved on, nodding at the map book on the dinette table. Planning a little vacation there? I mean, now that you're not working the case anymore? A road trip, yeah. Where to? Not sure yet. She smiled and turned toward the open balcony door. She could see an expensive-looking black jet on the tarmac beyond the motel's parking lot. According to your credit card records, you've been renting a place here for nearly nine months. On and off, but mostly on. Yeah, they give me the long-term discount. Comes out to like twenty bucks a day or something. That's probably too much. He turned and surveyed the place as if for the first time. Yeah. They were both still standing. Rachel knew he didn't want her to sit down or stay because of the visitor he was expecting. So she decided to push things. She sat down, without being asked, on the threadbare couch. Why have you had this place for nine months? she asked. He pulled a chair away from the dinette and brought it over and sat down. It's got nothing to do with this, if that's what you mean. No, I didn't think it did. I'm just curious, that's all. You don't look like a gambler to me. I mean, not with money. And this looks like a place for hardcore types. He nodded. It is. That and people with other addictions. I'm here because my daughter lives out here. With her mother. I've been trying to get to know her. How old is she? She'll be six soon. That's nice. Her mother being Eleanor Wish? The former FBI agent? That's her. What can I do for you, Agent Walling? She smiled. She liked Bosch. He got to the point. He apparently didn't let anybody or anything intimidate him. She wondered where that came from. Was it from carrying a badge or carrying other baggage? You can call me Rachel, for starters. But I think it's more like, what can I do for you? You wanted me to contact you, didn't you? He laughed, but not with any humor attached to it. What are you talking about? The interview. The looks, the nods and smiles, all that. You chose me as sort of a pen pal in there. Tried to connect. Tried to even it up, turn it from three against one to a game of two on two. Bosch shrugged and looked out the balcony. That was just sort of a shot in the dark. I, I don't know. I just sort of thought you weren't getting a fair shake there, that's all. And I guess I know what that's like. It's been eight years since I got a fair shake from the Bureau. He looked back at her. All because of Bacchus? That and other things. I made some mistakes, and the Bureau never forgets. I know what that is like, too. He stood up. I'm having a beer, he said. Do you want one, or is this a duty visit? I could use one, duty or not. He got up and took the open beer off the dinette table and went to the small efficiency kitchen. He put the bottle in the sink and got two more out of the refrigerator. He cranked off the caps and brought them out to the seating arrangement. Rachel knew she had to be careful and alert. There was a thin line between who played whom in these situations. This place comes with glasses in the cabinet, but I wouldn't trust them, he said, handing her a bottle. Bottle's fine. She took hers and made sure she chinked it off his. She then took a short pull on the bottle. Sierra Nevada. It tasted good. She could tell he was watching to see if she was really drinking. She wiped her mouth with the back of her hand, even though she didn't have to. That tastes right. Sure does. So what part of this are they giving you? Or do you have to stand around and just keep quiet like Agent Zygo? Rachel gave him a short laugh. Yeah, I don't think I've heard him utter a full sentence yet. 
But then again, I've only been here a couple days. Basically, they brought me in because they didn't have much of a choice. I've got my little backstory with Bob Backus, and the GPS was sent to me at Quantico, even though I haven't set foot there in eight years. As you picked up on in the RV, this could be about me. Maybe, maybe not. But it cuts me in. And where did they bring you in from? Rapid City. Bosch grimaced. No, that's good, she said. Before that, it was Minot, North Dakota, a one-agent office. I think in my second year there, they actually had a spring. Man, that hurts. In L.A., what they do if they want to get rid of you is give you what they call freeway therapy, transfer you to the division furthest from where you live so you have to fight the traffic every day. A couple of years of two-hour commutes and guys turn in their badges. Is that what happened to you? No, but you probably already know what happened to me. She didn't respond to that, moving quickly back the other way. In the Bureau, they have the whole country, and then some. They don't call it freeway therapy. They call it hardship posting. They send you where nobody wants to go. And there are a lot of places like that, places they can bury an agent if they want to. In Minot, it was all Indian stuff. And those Indians don't take so kindly to those of us of the FBI persuasion. Rapid City is only a small improvement. At least there are other agents in the office. My fellow outcasts. We actually have a good time because the pressure's off. Know what I mean? Yeah. How long have you been up there? Eight years altogether. Jeez. She waved her free hand dismissively, as if it was all water under the bridge. She knew she was drawing him in. Revealing herself would make him trust her. She wanted his trust. Tell me, he said. Was it because you were the messenger? Because you shot Bacchus? Or because he got away? All that and other things. Consorting with the enemy? Chewing gum in class, the usual stuff? He nodded. Why didn't you just walk away, Rachel? Well, Harry, because I didn't want them to win. He nodded again, and she could see a gleam in his eyes. She had connected on that answer. She knew it, could feel it, and it felt good. Can I tell you something off the record, Harry? Sure. My assignment right now is to keep an eye on you. Me? Why? I don't know if you were listening in that rolling field office today, but I was kind of kicked off the case. Yes, and I'm sure you just packed it in and are quitting. She turned and looked toward the table, at the map book and his notebook. She then turned back to him and spoke in a stern but even tone. My assignment is to watch you, and to shut you down hard if you come anywhere near this investigation. Look, Agent Walling, I don't think— Don't suddenly go formal on me here. Okay, Rachel, then. If this is some kind of threat, then all right. Message received. I get it. But I don't think you... I'm not threatening you. I'm here to tell you I don't plan to carry out my assignment. He paused and studied her for a long moment. What do you mean? I mean I've checked you out. You were right about that. I know about you, and I know about what kind of a cop you were. I know what has happened with you and the Bureau in the past. I know all of that, and I know you're more than meets the eye. And my guess is that you're on to something, that you told us just enough today to get out of that RV in one piece. She stopped and waited, and finally he responded. Hey, look, if all that is a compliment, then I'll take it, but what's your point? My point is that I have a history, too, and I'm not going to sit on the sideline while they go after Bacchus and leave me back in the F.O. making coffee. Not on this one. I want to get there first. And since this is a betting town, I'm betting on you. Bosch didn't move, and he didn't say anything for a long moment. She watched his dark eyes as he churned through everything she'd said. She knew she was taking an incredible risk with him, but eight years in the Badlands had made her look at risks much differently than she had when she was in Quantico. Let me ask you something, he finally said. Why is it they don't have you in a hotel room with two guards on the door? You know, in case Bacchus shows up. Like you said, this could be all about you. 
First Terry McCaleb, then you. She shook her head, dismissing the idea. Because maybe they're using me. Maybe I'm bait. Are they? She shrugged. I don't know. I'm not privy to everything about this investigation. Either way, it doesn't matter. If he is coming at me, let him come. I'm not going to hide out in a hotel room. Not when he's out there, and not as long as I have my pals Sig and Glock with me. Oh, a two-gun agent. That's interesting. Most of the two-gun cops I knew had a little too much testosterone to go with all the extra bullets. I didn't like working with those guys. He said it with sort of a smile in his voice. She knew he was close to being hooked. I don't carry them both at once. One's on the job, one's off. And you're trying to change the subject. Which is? Your next move. Look, you know how they say it in the movies? We can do this the hard way, or we can... Hit you in the face with a phone book. Exactly. You're working alone against the grain. But you obviously have good instincts, and probably know things about this we don't know yet. Why not work together? And what happens when Agent Die and the rest of the FBI hear about this? I take the risk, I take the fall. But it won't be too hard. What are they going to do to me? Send me back to Minot? Big deal. He nodded. She watched him, tried to look through those dark eyes to see how his mind worked. Her take on Bosch was that he put case sense ahead of vanity and petty things. He would churn through it and ultimately know this was the way to go. He finally nodded again and spoke. What are you doing tomorrow morning? Watching you. Why? Where are you staying? The Embassy Suites on Paradise near Harmon. I'll pick you up at eight. And where are we going? To the top of the triangle. What do you mean? Where? I'll explain tomorrow. I'm thinking I can trust you, Rachel, but let's take it one step at a time. Are you going with me? All right, Bosch, I'll go with you. You getting formal with me now? Just a slip. I don't want to get formal with you. She smiled, and she watched him try to read it. All right, then. I'll see you tomorrow, he said. I have to get ready now to go see my kid. He stood up, and so did she. She took one more drink from her beer and put it down half-finished on the dinette table. Eight o'clock tomorrow, she said. You pick me up? Right. You sure you don't want me to drive? Uncle Sugar, pay for the gas. That's all right. Can you get the photos of the missing men? I had them on the newspaper clip, but Agent Die took it from me. I'll see what I can do. There's probably a six-pack that won't be missed at the F.O. And one other thing. Bring both your friends. What friends? Sig and Glock. She smiled and shook her head at him. You can't carry a weapon now, can you? Legally, anyway. No, I can't. I don't. Must feel naked. Yeah, you could say that. She gave him another smile. Well, I'm not giving you a weapon, Harry. No way. He shrugged. Had to ask. He opened the door and she walked out. After he closed it, she walked down the steps to the parking lot and looked back up at the door. She wondered if he was watching her through the peephole. She got into the Crown Vic she had signed out of the carpool. She knew she was close to the edge of trouble. What she had revealed to Bosch and agreed to do the next day with him guaranteed the final stage of the destruction of her career if things went sideways. But she didn't care. It was a gambling town. She trusted Bosch, and she trusted herself. She would not let them win. As she backed the Crown Vic out, she noticed a cab pull to a stop in the parking lot. A chubby man with sun-bleached hair and a loud Hawaiian shirt got out and studied the numbers on the doors of the rooms. He was carrying a thick envelope, or a file folder that looked yellowed and old. Rachel watched as he bounded up the steps and walked to number 22, Bosch's door. The door was open before he had to knock. Rachel backed out and drove out of the lot onto Koval. 
She drove around the block and parked in a spot that gave her a good view of both of the parking lot exits of Bosch's sorry motel. She was sure Bosch was up to something, and she was going to find out what it was. Chapter 25 Bacchus had caught only a glimpse of the man who answered the motel room door when Rachel Walling knocked, but he thought he recognized him from a time many years before. He felt his pulse quicken. If he was right about the man she was meeting in room 22, then the stakes had grown considerably higher. He studied the motel and his situation. He had located the three bureau surveillance cars. The agents were hanging back. One agent had deployed and was sitting across Koval on a bus bench. He looked out of place, wearing a gray suit and supposedly waiting for a bus. But that was the FBI's style. That left the motel clear for Bacchus to move about. It was L-shaped, with parking on all sides. He realized that if he was on the other side of the building, he might catch another glimpse of the man Rachel was with through a rear window or balcony. He decided not to risk moving the car from the front parking lot to the rear. It might draw the attention of the bench warmer across the street. Instead, he cracked the door and slipped out of his car. He had the interior lights switched off, so there was no threat of exposure. He crab-walked between two other cars and straightened up, pulling a baseball cap over his head and yanking the brim down as he emerged. The hat said UNLV on it. Bacchus walked through the breezeway on the bottom floor of the two-story motel. He passed the soda and candy machines and came out on the other side and started walking through the rear parking lot as if looking for his car. He glanced up at the lighted balcony that he believed corresponded with the door to room 22, where he had seen Rachel enter. He could see the sliding door was open. Glancing around as if looking for his lost car, Bacchus saw that the agent on the bench did not have a visual angle on the rear lot. No one was watching him here. He casually moved to a position directly below the balcony of room 22. He tried to listen for any verbal morsel that would spill through the open slider. He heard Rachel's voice, but could not make out the words until he very clearly heard her say, Must feel naked. This confused and intrigued him. He was thinking about the possibility of climbing up to the second level so that he could hear the conversation in room 22. The sound of a door shutting ended that idea. He guessed Rachel had just left. Bacchus returned to the breezeway and hid behind a coke machine when he heard a car's ignition fire. He waited and listened. He detected the sound of another car entering the lot. He moved from the coke machine to the corner and glanced out. A man was getting out of a taxi, and Bacchus recognized him, too. It was Terry McCaleb's charter partner. There was no doubt. Bacchus felt like he had just tripped across a treasure of intrigue and mystery. What was Rachel up to? How had she connected with the charter partner so quickly? And what was the LAPD doing here? He looked past the taxi and saw Rachel's Crown Victoria pull out onto the street and drive away. He waited a moment and saw one of the Grand Ams stop and pick up the man on the bus bench and then take off. Bacchus yanked the brim of his hat down again and stepped out of the breezeway. He walked toward his car. Chapter 26 I was looking through the peephole thinking about Agent Walling and wondering how the brutal terrain of the FBI and the Dakotas had not robbed her of her fire and sense of humor. I liked her for that and sensed a connection. I was thinking that I might be able to trust her. At the same time, I was thinking I had just been played by a pro. I was sure she hadn't told me everything she was up to. Nobody ever does. But she had told me enough. We wanted the same thing, maybe for different reasons but I wasn't second-guessing my decision to take on the extra rider in the morning. The view through the peephole was suddenly filled with the concave image of Buddy Lockridge. I opened the door before he could knock and quickly pulled him inside. I wondered if Walling had seen him on her way out. Perfect timing, Buddy. Did anybody talk to you or stop you out there? Where, here? 
Yeah, here. No, I just got out of the cab. Okay, then where have you been? He explained his lateness by saying there were no cabs at the Bellagio, a story I didn't believe. I saw one of the pockets of his jeans bulging when I took from him the two files he carried. That's bullshit, buddy. Cabs can be hard to find in this town, but not at the Bellagio. There are always cabs there. I reached over and slapped my hand against his full pocket. You stopped to play, didn't you? You've got a pocket full of chips there. Look, I stopped to play a couple quick shots of blackjack before coming. But I got lucky, man. I couldn't lose. Look at this. He reached into the pocket and pulled out a handful of five-dollar chips. I was kicking ass, and you can't walk away from good luck. Yeah, great. That'll help you pay for that room you've got. Buddy looked around my place, taking it in. Through the open balcony, there was traffic and jetliner noise. Gladly, he said. I ain't going to stay here. I almost laughed, considering what I'd seen of his boat. Well, you're welcome to stay wherever you want, because I don't need you out here anymore. Thanks for bringing the files. His eyes widened. What? I've got a new partner, the FBI. So you can go back to L.A. as soon as you want, or you can play blackjack until you own the Bellagio. I'll pay the airfare, like I said, and for the chopper ride to the island and forty bucks toward the room. That's the daily rate at this place. I held up the files. I'll throw in a couple hundred for your time getting these and getting here. No way, man. I came all the way out here, man. I can still help. I've worked with the agents before when me and Terry worked a thing. That was then, buddy. This is now. Come on. I'll give you a ride back to your hotel. I hear cabs are scarce, and I'm going that way anyway. After closing the balcony door, I walked him out of the apartment and locked up. I brought the files with me for reading later. As we were walking down the steps to the parking lot, I looked around for the security man but didn't see him. I looked around for Rachel Walling and didn't see her either. I did see my neighbor Jane putting a shoebox into the trunk of a car, a white Monte Carlo. From my angle on the steps, I could see the trunk was crowded with other, larger boxes. You're better off with me, Buddy said, protest still clinging to his voice. You can't trust the Bureau man. Terry was in it, and he didn't even trust them. I know, Buddy. I've been dealing with the Bureau for thirty years. He just shook his head. I watched Jane get in her car and back out. I wondered if it was the last time I would see her. I wondered if my telling her I'd been a cop had spooked her and made her split. Maybe she had heard some of my conversation with Agent Walling through the thin walls. Buddy's comments about the Bureau reminded me of something. You know, when you get back there, they're going to want to talk to you. About what? About your GPS. They found it. Wow, great. You mean it wasn't Finder? It was Shandy? Think so. But the news isn't all that great, Buddy. How come? I unlocked the Mercedes and we got in. I looked at Buddy as I was starting the engine. All your waypoints were wiped out. There's only one on it now, and you won't catch any fish there. Ah, God damn it! I should have known. Anyway, they're going to ask you all about it, and all about Terry and that last charter, just like I did. So they're running behind you, huh? Playing catch-up. You're the man, Harry. Not really. I knew what was coming. Buddy turned in his seat and leaned toward me. Take me with you, Harry. I'm telling you, I can help. I'm smart. I can figure things out. Put your seat belt on, buddy. I jumped into reverse before he got a chance, and he almost went into the dashboard. We headed over to the strip and slowly made our way down to the Bellagio. It was early evening and the sidewalks were cooling off and getting crowded. I saw that the overhead trams and walkways were becoming full. The neon from every facade on the street was lighting dusk up like a brilliant sunset. Almost. Buddy continued to lobby me for a part in the investigation, but I fended him off at every turn. After we pulled in around the huge front fountain and under the casino's giant entry portico, I told the valet man that we were just picking somebody up and he directed me to a curb telling me not to leave the car unattended. Who are we picking up? Buddy asked.
new life in his voice. Nobody, I just said that. Tell you what, you want to work with me, buddy? Then stay here in the car for a few minutes so they won't tow it away. I need to run in here real quick. What for? To see if somebody's here. Who? I jumped out of the car and closed the door without answering his question, because I knew with Buddy that every answer led to another question, and then another, and I didn't have time for that. I knew the Bellagio like I knew the turns on Mulholland Drive. This was where Eleanor Wish, my ex-wife, made her living, and where I had watched her do so on more than one occasion. I quickly made my way through the plush casino, around the orchard of slot machines, and to the poker room. There were only two poker tables working. It was very early. I quickly scanned the thirteen players and did not see Eleanor. I checked the podium and saw the table manager was a man I knew from coming here with Eleanor and then hanging out and watching while she played. I went over. Freddy, what's shaking? A lot of ass shaking around here tonight. That's good. Gives you something to look at. I'm not complaining. Do you know, is Eleanor coming in? It was Eleanor's habit to let the table managers know if she intended to come in and play on a particular night. Sometimes they would save places at tables of high rollers or higher skilled players. Sometimes they would set up private games. In a way, my ex was a secret Vegas attraction. She was an attractive woman who was damn good at poker. That presented a challenge to men of a certain kind. The smart casinos knew this and played to it. Eleanor was always treated well at the Bellagio. If she needed anything, from a drink to a sweet to a rude player removed from a table, she got it. No questions asked. And that was why she usually played here on the nights she played. Yeah, she's coming in, Freddy told me. I don't have anything for her right now, but she'll be coming along. I waited before hitting him with another question. I had to finesse this. I leaned on the railing and casually watched the dealer at the hold'em table put down the final deal of the hand, the cards scraping on the blue felt like quiet little whispers. Five people had stayed in for the whole ride. I watched a couple of their faces when they brought the last card up and peeked at it. I was watching for tells, but didn't see any. Eleanor had told me once that the real players call the last card in hold'em the river, because it gives you life or takes it away with it. If you've played the hand through to the seventh card, everything rides on it. Three of the five players folded right away. The remaining two went back and forth to a call, and one of the men I had watched took the pot with three sevens. What time did she say she was coming in? I asked Freddy. Uh, she said the usual time, around eight. Despite my attempt at being casual about it, I could tell Freddy was getting hesitant, realizing his allegiance should be to Eleanor and not her ex-husband. I had what I needed, so I thanked him and walked away. Eleanor was planning on putting our daughter to bed and then coming into work. Maddie would be left with the live-in nanny watching over her. When I got back to the casino entrance, my car was empty. I looked around for Buddy and spotted him talking to one of the valet men. I called to him and waved goodbye, but he came running over and caught me at the door of the Mercedes. You taking off? Yeah, I told you, I was just going in for a couple minutes. Thanks for staying with the car, like I asked. He didn't get it. No problem, he said. You find him? Find who? Whoever you were going in there to see. Yeah, Buddy, I found him. I'll see you. Come on, man, let's do this thing together. Terry was my friend, too. That gave me pause. Buddy, I understand, but the best thing you can do right now, if you want to do something for Terry, is go back home. Wait for the agents to show up and then tell them every single thing you know. Don't hold back anything. You mean, including that you sent me over there to the boat to steal the file and get the photos? Now he was just trying to taunt me because he finally understood that he was out. I don't care if you tell them. 
I said. I told you, I'm working with them. They'll know it before you even meet them. But just so you have it straight, I didn't tell you to steal anything. I'm working for Graciela. That boat and everything in it belongs to her, including those files and those photographs. I poked him hard in the chest. Got it, buddy? He physically backed off. Yeah, I got it. I was just... Good. I then put my hand out. We shook hands, but there wasn't anything very pleasant about it. I'll catch you later, buddy. He let go of my hand, and I got in and closed the door. I started it up and drove away. In the mirror, I watched him go in through the revolving door and knew he would lose all his money back to the casino before the night was over. He had been right. He should never have walked away from luck. The dashboard clock told me that Eleanor would not be leaving her house for the night's work at the casino for another ninety minutes. I could head over there now, but knew it would be best to wait. I wanted to see my daughter, but not my ex-wife. To her everlasting credit, Eleanor had been kind enough to allow me full visiting privileges while she was working, so that would not be a problem. And I didn't care if Maddie was awake or not. I just wanted to see her, hear her breathing and touch her hair. But it seemed that every time Eleanor and I crossed paths, we skidded sideways, and anger from both of us ruled the moment. I knew it was best this way, to come to the house when she was not there. I could have gone back to the double X and spent an hour reading the poet file, but instead I drove. Paradise Road was much less congested than the Strip. It always is. I took Harmon over and then turned north and almost immediately into the parking lot of the Embassy Suites. I thought maybe Rachel Walling might want a cup of coffee and a fuller explanation of the next day's excursion. I cruised through the lot looking for a bureau car that would be obvious to me because of its cheap hubcaps and government plate, but I didn't see one. I pulled out my cell, called information, and got the number for the embassy suites. I called and asked for Rachel Walling's room and was put through. The phone rang repeatedly but was not answered. I hung up and thought for a moment. I then reopened my phone and called the cell number she had given me. She answered right away. Hey, it's Bosch. What are you up to? I said as casually as I could. Nothing, just hanging out. You at the hotel? Yeah, why? What's up? Nothing. I just thought you might want a cup of coffee or something. I'm out and about and have some time to kill. I could be at your hotel in a couple of minutes. Oh, well, thanks, but I think I'm going to stay in tonight. Of course you can't come out, I thought. You're not even there. I'm kind of jet-lagged, to tell you the truth. It always hits me the second day. Plus, tomorrow we've got the early start. I understand. No, it's not that I don't want to. Maybe tomorrow, okay? Okay. Are we still on for eight? I'll be out front. We hung up and I felt the first weight of doubt in my stomach. She was up to something, playing me in some way. But then I tried to dismiss it. Her assignment was to keep tabs on me. She'd been up front about that. Maybe I had this latest thing all wrong. I made another circuit around the parking lot looking for a Crown Vic or an LTD, but didn't see one. I quickly drove out of the lot then and back onto Paradise Road. At Flamingo, I turned west and went back across the strip and over the freeway. I pulled into the lot of a steakhouse near the Palms, the casino favored by many of the locals, because it was off the strip and it drew a lot of celebrities. The last time Eleanor and I had talked civilly, she told me she was thinking of switching her allegiance from the Bellagio to the Palms. The Bellagio was still where the money went, but most of that went into Baccarat and Pai Gao and craps. Poker was a different skill, and it was the only game where you weren't playing against the house. She had heard through the local grapevine that all the celebrities and athletes that came over from L.A. to the Palms were playing poker and losing lots of cash while they learned. In the steakhouse bar, I ordered a New York strip and a baked potato. The waitress tried to talk me out of ordering the steak medium well, but I remained firm. 
In the places I'd grown up, I never got any food that was pink in the middle, and I couldn't start enjoying it now. After she took the order back to the kitchen, I thought about an army kitchen I once wandered into at Fort Benning. There were complete sides of beef being boiled gray, through and through, in a dozen huge vats. A guy with a shovel was scooping oil off the surface of one of the vats and dumping it in a bucket. That kitchen was the worst thing I had ever smelled until I went into the tunnels a few months later and one time crawled into a place where the V.C. hid their dead from the Army statistic takers. I opened the poet file and was settling into a thorough read when my phone buzzed. I answered without checking the ID screen. Hello. Harry, it's Rachel. You still want to get that coffee? I changed my mind. My guess was that she had hurried to the embassy suite so she could be there and not be caught in a lie. Um, I just ordered dinner on the other side of town. Shit, I'm sorry. Well, that'll teach me. You by yourself? Yeah, I've got some stuff to work on here. Well, I know what that's like. I pretty much eat by myself every night. Yeah, me too, if I eat. Really? What about your kid? I was no longer comfortable or trusting while talking to her. I didn't know what she was doing, and I didn't feel like going over my sad marital or parental history. Uh, listen, I'm getting a look from somebody here. I think cell phones are against the rules. Well, we don't want to break the rules. I'll see you tomorrow at eight, then. Okay, Eleanor, goodbye. I was about to close the phone when I heard her voice. Harry? What? I'm not Eleanor. What? You just called me Eleanor. Oh, that was a mistake. Sorry. Do I remind you of her? Maybe. Sort of. Not now, but from a while back. Oh, well, I hope not from too far back. She was referring to Eleanor's fall from grace in the Bureau. A fall so bad that even a hardship posting in Minot was out of the question. I'll see you tomorrow, Rachel. Good night, Harry. I closed the phone and thought about my mistake. It had shot up right out of the subconscious, but now that it was out in the open, it was obvious. I didn't want to think about that. I wanted to retreat into the file in front of me. I knew I would be more comfortable studying the blood and madness of some other person and time. Chapter 27 at 8.30 I knocked on the door of Eleanor Wish's house, and the Salvadoran woman who lived there and took care of my daughter answered. Marisol had a kind but worn face. She was in her fifties, but looked much older. Her story of surviving was devastating, and whenever I thought about it, I was left feeling lucky about my own story. Since day one, when I had unexpectedly shown up at this house and discovered I had a daughter, Marisol had treated me kindly. She had never viewed me as a threat and was always completely cordial and respectful of my position as both father and outsider. She stepped back and let me in. She's sleeping, she said. I held up the file I was carrying. That's okay. I have work. I just want to go sit with her for a while. How are you doing, Marisol? Oh, I am fine. Eleanor went to the casino? Yes, she go. And how was Maddie tonight? Maddie, she a good girl, she play. Marisol always kept her reports to a minimum. I had tried speaking to her in Spanish before, thinking the reason she spoke so little was because of her English skills. But she said little more to me in her native language, preferring to keep her reports on my daughter's life and activities to a few words in any language. Okay, well, thank you, I said. If you want to go to bed, I'll just let myself out later. I'll make sure the door is locked. I had no key to the house, but the front door would lock after I closed it. Yes, is okay. I nodded and headed down the hallway to the left. I entered Maddie's room and closed the door. There was a nightlight plugged into the far wall, and it cast a blue glow across the room. I made my way to the side of her bed and turned on the bed table light. I knew from experience that Maddie would not be disturbed by the light. The five-year-old's dreams were so deep, she could seemingly sleep through anything, even a Lakers playoff game on the television, or a 5.0 earthquake. 
The light revealed a nest of tangled dark hair on the pillow. Her face was turned away from my view. I used my hand to sweep the ringlets back off her face, and I leaned down and kissed her cheek. I turned my head sideways so my ear was closer to her. I checked for the sound of breathing and was rewarded. One little moment of unfounded fear fell away from me. I walked over to the bureau and turned off the baby monitor, the other half of which I knew was in the TV room or Marisol's bedroom. There was no need for it now. I was there. Maddie slept in a queen-size bed with a cover spread that had all manner of cats printed on it. With her little body taking up so little space in the bed, there was plenty of room for me to prop the second pillow against the headboard and climb on next to her. I slipped my hand under the covers and placed it gently on her back. I waited without moving until I could feel the slight rise and fall of her breathing. With the other hand, I opened the poet file and started to read. At dinner, I had gotten through most of the file. This included the suspect profile, authored in part by Agent Rachel Walling, as well as the investigative reports and crime scene photos that accumulated while the investigation was current and the Bureau was tracking the killer dubbed the Poet across the country. That was eight years earlier, when the Poet killed eight homicide detectives, traveling from east to west, before his run came to an end in Los Angeles. Now, as my daughter slept next to me, I began with the reports that came after FBI Special Agent Robert Backus had been identified as the suspect, after he had been shot by Rachel Walling and then disappeared. The summary from the autopsy of a body found by a Department of Water and Power inspector in a storm water tunnel in Laurel Canyon was included here. The body was found almost three months after Backus was shot and had fallen through a window of a cantilevered home near the canyon and disappeared into the darkness and brush below. FBI credentials and a badge belonging to Robert Backus were found on the body. The deteriorated clothing was also his, a suit hand-tailored for Backus in Italy when he'd been sent over to consult on an investigation of a serial killer in Milan. However, scientific identification of the body was inconclusive. The remains were badly decomposed, leaving fingerprint analysis impossible, and parts of the body were even missing, initially presumed to have been taken by rats and other animals foraging in the tunnels. The entire lower mandible and upper bridge were missing, precluding a comparison to the dental records belonging to Robert Backus. Cause of death could not be determined either, though a gunshot wound channel was found in the upper abdomen the area Agent Walling reported seeing her bullet strike, and a rib was fractured, possibly by the force of a bullet. No bullet fragments were recovered, however, suggesting a through-and-through -through wound, and so no comparison to a bullet from Walling's weapon was possible. No DNA comparison or identification was ever made. After the shooting, when it was thought that Bacchus might still be alive and on the run, Agents descended on the fugitive's home and office, but they were in search of evidence to the crimes he had committed and clues as to why. They did not plan for the possibility that they might one day need to identify his putrefied remains. In a gaffe that would haunt the investigation and leave the Bureau open later to charges of malfeasance and cover-up, no potential DNA receptors, hair and skin from the shower drain, saliva from the toothbrush, fingernail clippings from the waste cans, dandruff and hair from the back of the desk chair were ever collected. And three months later, when the body was found in the stormwater tunnel, it was too late. Those receptors were compromised or non-existent. The building where Bacchus had owned a condo mysteriously burned to the ground three weeks after the Bureau had finished with it and Bacchus's office had been taken over and completely renovated and redecorated by an agent named Randall Alpert, who took his place in the Behavioral Sciences Unit. A search for a blood sample from Bacchus proved futile and once again embarrassing for the Bureau. When Agent Walling shot Bacchus in the house in Los Angeles, a small amount of blood had spattered the floor. A sample was collected but then inadvertently destroyed in the lab in Los Angeles when medical waste was disposed of. 
a search for blood that Bacchus may have given during personal medical examinations, or as donations to blood banks, proved fruitless. Through his own cunning planning, luck, and bureaucratic malfeasance, Bacchus had disappeared without leaving anything of himself behind. The search for Bacchus officially ended with the discovery of the body in the drainage tunnel. Even though scientific confirmation of identity was never made, the credentials, badge, and Italian suit were enough for Bureau Command to act swiftly in announcing closure to a case that had held wide sway in the media and had severely undercut the Bureau's already tarnished image. But meantime, a quiet investigation continued into the psychological backgrounding of the killer agent. These were the reports I now read. Led by the Behavioral Sciences Section, the very unit in which Bacchus worked, this investigation seemed more concerned with the question of why he did what he did than with the question of how he was able to do it under the noses of the top experts in the killing field. This investigative direction was probably a protective measure. They looked at the suspect, not the system. The file was replete with reports of investigations into Agent Bacchus's early nurturing, adolescence, and upbringing. Despite the number of crisply written observations, speculations, and summaries, there was very little there. Just a few threads unraveled from the full fabric of personality. Bacchus remained an enigma, his pathology a secret. He was the case that the best and brightest ultimately couldn't crack. I sorted through the threads. Bacchus was the son of a perfectionist father, a decorated FBI agent, no less and a mother he never knew. The father was reported to have been physically brutal to the boy, possibly blaming him for the mother's abandonment of the family, and punished him severely for infractions that included bedwetting and taunting of neighborhood pets. One report came from a seventh-grade classmate who reported that Robert Bacchus had once confided that when he was young, his father punished him for bedwetting by handcuffing him to a towel rack in the bathroom shower enclosure. Another former classmate reported that Bacchus once claimed that he slept each night with a pillow and a blanket in a bathtub because he feared the punishment that wetting the bed might bring. A childhood neighbor reported suspicions that it had been Bacchus who had killed a pet dachshund by cutting the dog in half and leaving its parts in a vacant lot. As an adult, Bacchus exhibited obsessive-compulsive tendencies. He had fixations on cleanliness and order. Many testimonials in this regard came from fellow agents in behavioral sciences. Bacchus was well known in the unit for delaying scheduled meetings for many minutes while he was in the restroom, washing his hands. No one ever saw him eat anything for lunch in the cafeteria at Quantico but a simple grilled cheese sandwich. Every day, a grilled cheese sandwich. He also compulsively chewed gum and would take great pains to make sure he was never out of the juicy fruit brand he liked. One agent described his chewing as measured, meaning he believed that Bacchus may have counted the number of times he chewed each stick of gum, and when a specific number was reached, he would then remove the gum and start over with a fresh stick. There was a report on an interview with a former fiancé. She told the reporting agent that Bacchus required her to shower often and extensively, particularly before and after they made love. She said that while house hunting before the nuptials, he told her he would want to have his own bedroom and bathroom. She called off the marriage and ended the relationship when one time he called her a slob because she had kicked off her high heels in her own living room. The reports were just glimpses of a damaged psyche. They weren't really clues to anything. Whatever Bacchus's strange habits were, they still didn't fully explain why he began killing people. Thousands of people suffer from mild to severe forms of obsessive-compulsive disorder. They don't add killing to their list of personal tics. Thousands were abused as children. They do not then all become abusers. McCaleb had acquired far fewer reports on the reappearance four years later of the poet, Bacchus, in Amsterdam. All that was in the file was a nine-page summary report in which the facts of the killings and the forensic findings were recounted. 
I had skimmed this report before, but now read it closely and found aspects of it tying in with the theory I was formulating about the town of Clear. In Amsterdam, the five known victims were men who were tourists traveling alone. This put them in the same profile as the victims known to be buried in Zizix, with the exception of one man who was in Las Vegas with his wife, but away from her when she spent the day in their hotel spa. In Amsterdam, the men were last seen in the city's Rasa Birth Zone, where legalized prostitution is carried out in small rooms behind the neon frame windows where women in provocative clothing offer themselves to passers-by. In two of the incidents, the Dutch investigators located prostitutes who reported being with the victims the night before their bodies were found, floating in the nearby Amstel River. Though the bodies were found in different locations in the river, the reports indicated that the point of entry into the water for all five victims was believed to have been the area around the Six House. This location was a property owned by an important family in Amsterdam history. I found this of interest, partly because Six House and Zizix sounded a bit alike to me, but also because of the question of whether the killer had chosen the Six House randomly or in some attempt to flaunt his crimes at authority by choosing a structure that symbolized it. The Dutch detectives never got much further with the investigation. They never found the mechanism by which the killer got to the men, controlled them, and killed them. Bacchus would have never even made a blip on their suspect radar if he hadn't wanted to be noticed. He sent the police the notes that asked for Rachel Walling, and led to his identity. The notes, according to the summary report, contained information about the victims and crimes that seemingly only the killer would know. One note contained the passport of the last victim. To me, the connection between Amsterdam's Rasa Burt and Clear Nevada was obvious. Both were places where sex was legally exchanged for money. But more important, they were places where I assumed men might go without telling others, where they might even take measures to avoid leaving a trail. In some ways, this made them perfect targets for a killer and perfect victims. It added an extra degree of safety to the killer. I finished my survey of McCaleb's file on the poet and started through it once more, hoping that I had missed something, maybe just one detail that would bring the whole picture into focus. Sometimes it happens that way. A missed or misunderstood detail becomes the key to the whole puzzle. But I didn't find that detail on the second go-round, and soon the reports just seemed repetitive and tedious. I grew tired, and somehow I ended up thinking about that kid handcuffed in the shower. I kept picturing that scene, and I felt bad for the kid and angry for the father who did it and the mother who never cared to know about it. Did this mean I felt sympathy for a killer? I didn't think so. Bacchus had taken his own tortures and turned them into something else, and then turned it on the world. I had an understanding of that process, and I felt sympathy for the boy he had been. But I felt nothing for Bacchus the man, but a cold resolve to hunt him down and make him pay for what he did. Chapter 28 The place smelled horrible, but Bacchus knew he could live with it. It was the flies that repulsed him the most. They were everywhere, dead and alive, carrying germs and disease and dirt. As he huddled under the blanket, his knees drawn up, he could hear them buzzing in the darkness, flying blind, hitting the screens and the walls, making little sounds. They were out there, everywhere. He realized he should have known that they would come, that they were part of the plan. He tried to block out their sounds. He tried to think and concentrate on the plan. It was his last day here. Time to move. Time to show them. He wished he could stay to watch, to bear witness to the event. But he knew that there was much work to do. He stopped breathing. He could feel them now. The flies had found him and were crawling on the blanket looking for a way in, a way to get to him. He had given them life, but now they wanted to get to him and eat him. 
His laugh broke sharply from beneath the blanket, and the flies that had alighted on it scattered. He realized he was no different from the flies. He too had turned against the giver of life. He laughed again, and he felt something go down his throat. Ah! He retched. He coughed. He tried to get it out. A fly, a fly had gone down his throat. Bacchus jumped up and almost tripped as he climbed out. He ran to the door and out into the night. He shoved his finger down his throat until everything came up and came out. He dropped to his knees, gagged, and spit it all out. He then pulled the flashlight from his pocket and studied his effluent with the beam. He saw the fly in the greenish-yellow bile. It was still alive, its wings and legs mired in the swamp of human discharge. Bacchus stood up. He stepped on the fly and then nodded to himself. He wiped the bottom of his shoe on the red dirt. He looked up at the silhouette of the rock outcropping that rose a hundred feet above him. It was blocking the moon at this hour. But that was all right. That just made the stars all the brighter. Chapter 29 I put the thick file aside and studied my daughter's face. I wondered what she could be dreaming about. She had experienced so little in her life. What inspired her dreams? I was sure there were only good things waiting for her in that secret world, and I wished it would always stay that way. I grew tired myself and soon closed my eyes to rest for a few minutes. And soon I, too, dreamed. But in my dream there were shadow figures and angry voices. There were sudden and sharp movements in the darkness. I didn't know where I was or where I was going. And then I was grabbed by unseen hands and pulled up out of it, back to the light. Harry, what are you doing? I opened my eyes and Eleanor was pulling the collar of my jacket. Hey, Eleanor, what is it? For some reason I tried to smile at her but I was still too disoriented to know why. What are you doing? Look at this all over the floor. I was beginning to register that she was angry. I pulled myself forward and looked over the edge of the bed. The poet file had slid off the bed and spilled on the floor. The crime scene photos were spread everywhere. Prominently displayed were three photos of a Denver police detective who had been shot by Bacchus in a car. The back of his head was obliterated blood and brain matter all over the seat. There were other photos of bodies floating in canals, photos of another detective whose head was taken off with a shotgun. Oh, shit. You can't do this, Eleanor said loudly. What if she woke up and saw this? She'd have nightmares the rest of her life. She's going to wake up if you don't keep your voice down, Eleanor. I'm sorry, okay? I didn't mean to fall asleep. I slid off the bed and knelt on the floor, quickly gathering the file together. As I did so, I checked my watch and saw it was almost 5 a.m. I had slept for hours. No wonder I was so groggy. Seeing the time also told me that Eleanor was home late. She usually didn't play this long. It probably meant she'd had a bad night and had tried to chase her losses, a bad gambling strategy. I quickly gathered the photos and reports and slid them back into the file. Then I stood up. Sorry, I said again. God damn it! It's not what I need to come home and find. I didn't say anything. I knew it was a no-win situation for me. I turned and looked back at the bed. Maddie was still sleeping, with her brown ringlets across her face again. If she could sleep through anything, then I hoped she could sleep right through the roaring silence of her parents' anger toward each other. Eleanor walked quickly out of the room, and in a few moments I followed her. I found her in the kitchen, leaning against a counter with her arms folded tightly in front of her. Bad night? Don't blame my reaction to this on what kind of night I had. I raised my hands in surrender. I'm not. I blame it on me. I messed up. I just wanted to sit with her for a little while, and I fell asleep. Maybe you shouldn't do that anymore. What, come visit her at night? I don't know. She moved to the refrigerator and took out a bottle of spring water. She poured a glass and then held the bottle up for me. I told her I didn't want any. 
What is that file, anyway? she asked. Are you working a case here? Yes, a murder. It started in L.A. and came over this way. I have to go up into the desert tomorrow. What a nice convenience for you. Along the way you get to drop in here and scare your daughter. Come on, Eleanor. It was stupid and I'm an idiot. But at least she didn't see anything. She could have. Maybe she did. Maybe she woke up and saw those dreadful pictures and then went back to sleep. She's probably having a horrible nightmare. Look, she hasn't moved all night. I can tell. She's been down for the count. It won't happen again. So can we just leave it at that? Sure, fine. Look, Eleanor, why don't you tell me about your night? No, I don't want to talk about it. I just want to go to bed. I'll tell you something, then. What? I hadn't planned on bringing this up, but it all sort of snowballed, and I knew I needed to tell her. I'm thinking about going back to my job. What do you mean, the case? No, the cops. The LAPD has a new program. Old guys like me can come back in. They're looking for experience. If I do it now, I won't even have to go back to the academy. She took a long drink of water and didn't respond. What do you think about that, Eleanor? She shrugged like she didn't care. Whatever you want to do, Harry, but you won't see your daughter as much. You'll get involved in cases and you know how that goes. I nodded. Maybe. And maybe it won't matter. She hasn't had you around for most of her life. And whose fault is that? Look, let's not open that can of worms again. If I had known about her, I would have been here. I didn't know. I know, I know. I'm the one. It's all my fault. I'm not saying that. I'm... I know what you're saying. You don't even have to say it. We were both quiet for a moment, letting the anger ebb. I looked down at the floor. Maybe she could come over there, too, I said. What are you talking about? What we talked about before, about this place, about her growing up here. She shook her head very deliberately. And I haven't changed my mind about that. What do you think, that you're going to raise her by yourself? You with middle-of-the-night call-outs, long hours, long investigations, guns in the house, crime scene photos spread all over the floor? Is that what you want for her? You think that's better than Vegas? No, I was thinking maybe you could come over there, too. Forget it, Harry. I'm not talking about this again. I'm staying here, and so is Madeline. You make whatever decision is best for you, but you don't make it for me and Maddie. Before I could respond, Marisol stepped into the kitchen, her eyes creased with sleep. She was wearing a white bathrobe with Bellagio written in script on the pocket. Very loud, she said. You're right, Marisol, Eleanor said. I'm sorry. Marisol went to the refrigerator and got out the water bottle. She poured herself a glass and then put the bottle away. She left the kitchen without further word. I think you should go, Eleanor said to me. I'm too tired to talk about this right now. All right. I'm just going to check on her and say goodbye. Don't wake her up. No kidding. I went back into my daughter's bedroom. We had left the light on. I sat on the side of the bed closest to her and just watched her sleep for a few moments. Then I brushed back her hair and kissed her cheek. I smelled the scent of baby shampoo in her hair. I kissed her again and whispered good night. I turned off the light and then sat there for another couple minutes, watching and waiting. For what, I don't know. I guess maybe I was hoping Eleanor would come in and sit on the bed, too, that maybe we could watch our sleeping daughter together. After a while, I got up and turned the monitor on again. I left the room to head out. The house was quiet as I walked back through to the front. I didn't see Eleanor. She had gone off to bed, not needing to see me again. I pulled the front door closed and made sure it was locked as I went out. The loud snap of steel on steel had a finality to it that ricocheted through me like a tumbling bullet. Chapter 30 At eight the next morning, I was in my Mercedes in front of the lobby entrance of the Embassy Suites on Paradise Road. I had two large Starbucks coffees in the cup holders and a bag of donuts. I was freshly showered and shaved. 
I had changed the clothes I slept in. I had gassed up the car and maxed out my withdrawal limit at the station's ATM. I was ready for a day in the desert, but Rachel Walling did not come out through the glass doors. After waiting five minutes, I was about to call her when my phone rang first. It was her. Give me five minutes. Where are you? I had to go into the FO for a meeting. I'm driving back now. What meeting? I'll tell you when I see you. I'm on Paradise now. All right. I closed the phone and waited, looking at the billboard on the back of a cab that was waiting in front of me. It was an advertisement for a floor show at the Riviera. It showed the beautifully proportioned rear ends of a dozen women standing side by side and naked. It made me think about the changing nature of Vegas and what had been mentioned in the Times article on the missing men. I thought about all the people who had moved here on the family ticket, only to have that ticket punched with this and a thousand other billboards just like it after they got here. A basic G car, a Crown Victoria, pulled up next to me from the opposite direction, and Rachel put down the window. You want me to drive? I want to drive, I said, thinking it would give me a little slice of control over things. She made no argument. She pulled the Crown Vic into a parking space and got into my car. I didn't move the Mercedes. Are you going to drink both of those coffees? She asked me. No, one's for you. Sugar's in the bag. They didn't have cream to go. I don't use it. She lifted one of the coffees and drank from it. I looked forward out through the windshield. Then I checked the rear view, and I waited. Well, she finally said, are we going? I don't know. I think we need to talk first. About what? About what is going on. What do you mean? What were you doing at the field office so early? What's going on, Agent Walling? She let out her breath in annoyance. Look, Harry, you're forgetting something here. This investigation is of high importance to the Bureau. You could say the director is directly involved. And? And so when he wants a 10 a.m. briefing, that means us agents in Quantico and out in the field get together at 9 a.m. to make sure we know what we're telling him and that there's not going to be blowback on anybody. I nodded. Now I got it. And 9 a.m. in Quantico is 6 a.m. in Vegas. You got it. So what happened at the tent? What did you all tell the director? That's FBI business. I looked at her, and she was waiting with a smile. But I will tell you because you're about to tell me all of your secrets, too. The director is going to go public. It's too risky not to. It will look like a cover-up if this comes out later in uncontrolled fashion. It's all about managing the moment, Harry. I put the car in drive and headed toward the parking lot exit. I had already plotted my route. I'd take Flamingo to the 15 and then a quick jog over to the Blue Diamond Highway. Then it would be a straight shot north to clear. What's he going to say? He'll hold a press conference late this afternoon. He'll announce that Bacchus is apparently alive and we're out looking for him. He'll hold up the picture Terry McCaleb took of the man who called himself Shandy. Did they check all of that out yet? Yes. There's no trace line on Shandy yet. It was probably just a name he gave Terry. But photographic analysis and comparison of the photos Terry took and photos of Bacchus are underway as we speak. The initial report is they're going to come in as a match. It was Bacchus. And Terry didn't recognize him. Well, he obviously recognized something. He took the pictures, so there was some sort of suspicion. But the guy had a beard, hat, and glasses. The analyst on it said he'd also changed his nose and teeth, and maybe had cheek implants. There's a lot of things he could have done, even a surgery that would have changed his voice. Look, I looked at the photos and didn't see it for sure, and I worked directly with Bacchus for five years, much longer than Terry. Terry got moved out to L.A. to man the behavioral sciences outpost. Any idea where he got all of that done? We're pretty sure we know. About six years ago, the bodies of a surgeon and his wife were found in their burned-out home in Prague. The home had a surgical suite, and the doctor was the subject of an Interpol intelligence file. 
the wife was his nurse. He was suspected of being a face man, a surgeon who would change your face for a certain price. The theory was that someone he changed murdered him and his wife to cover the trail. All records he might have kept on the faces he changed were lost in the fire. It was ruled an arson. What connected Bacchus to him? Nothing for sure, but as you can imagine, everything Bacchus did or touched as an agent was gone over once he was revealed. His entire case history was audited as much as possible. He did a lot of consulting on cases abroad, part of the FBI image machine. He went to places like Poland, Yugoslavia, Italy, France, you name it. He went to Prague? She nodded. He went to Prague on a case to consult. Young women disappearing and ending up in the river. Prostitutes. The doctor, the face man, was questioned in the investigation because he did the breast augmentations on three of the victims. Bacchus was there. He helped question the doctor. And he could have been told about the doctor's suspected sideline. Exactly. We think he knew and we think he went there to change his face. That wouldn't have been easy. His real face was on the front of every newspaper and magazine back then. Look, Bob Bacchus is a psychopathic killer, but he is a very smart psychopath. Outside of the made-up guys in books and movies, nobody's ever been smarter at this. Not even Bundy. We have to assume that he had an escape plan all along, from day one. When I put him out that window eight years ago, you better believe he already had a plan in place. I'm talking about money, IDs, whatever he would need to reinvent himself and get away. He probably carried it with him. We assume from L.A. he made his way back east first, and then split to Europe. He burned down his condo, I said. Right. We give him credit for that, which puts him in Virginia three weeks after I shot him in L.A. That was a shrewd move. He torched the place, and then got to Europe, where he could lie low for a while change his face, and then start again. Amsterdam. She nodded. The first killing in Amsterdam occurred seven months after the face man burned in Prague. I nodded. It all seemed to fit together. Then I thought of something else. How is the director going to announce the surprise that Bacchus is alive when four years ago you had Amsterdam? He's got all kinds of deniability on that. First and most important, that was another director's watch, so he can lay anything he needs to off on him. That's FBI tradition. But realistically, that was another country, and it wasn't an investigation we were running, and it was never absolutely confirmed. We had handwriting analysis, but that was really it, and that is not in the same league as fingerprinting or DNA when it comes to confirming. So the director can simply say nothing was for sure about Bacchus in Amsterdam. Either way, he's safe. He just has to worry about the here and the now. Manage the moment. FBI 101. And you people are going along with his going public? No, we asked for a week. He gave us the day. The press conference is at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Like anything's going to happen today. Yeah, we know. We're fucked. Bacchus will probably go under, change his face again, and not turn up for another four years. Probably. But the director won't get hit with any blowback on it. He'll be safe. We were silent for a few moments thinking about that. I could understand the director's decision, but it certainly helped him more than it helped the investigation. We were on the 15, and I was pulling into the exit lane for the Blue Diamond Highway. What happened at the 9 a.m.? before the director's meeting. The usual round-robin. Updates from every agent. And? And there's not a lot that is new. A few things. We talked about you, mostly. I'm counting on you, Harry. For what? For a new lead here. Where are we going? Do they know we're riding together, or are you still supposed to be watching me as in watching me? I think they would prefer the latter. In fact, I know they would. But that would be boring, and besides, like I said, what are they going to do to me if they find out I'm riding with you? Send me back to Minot? BFD. I got to like that place. Minot might not be a big fucking deal, but maybe they'll send you someplace else. 
Don't they have bureau offices in Guam and places like that? Yes, but it's all relative. I heard Guam isn't that bad. A lot of terrorism angles, which is all the rage. And after eight years in Minot and Rapid City, a change like that might not be bad, no matter what the investigations are about. What was said about me at the meeting? It was mostly me, since you were my assignment. I told them I ran a check through the L.A. field office and got your pedigree. I gave them that and told them you went behind the wall last year. What do you mean, that I retired? No, Homeland Security. You ran afoul of them, went behind the wall and came back out again. That impressed Sherry Dye, made her more willing to let you run a little. I had been wondering about that. Actually, I'd been wondering why Agent Dye had not simply put the clamps on me. What about Terry McCaleb's notes? I asked. What about them? Better minds than mine must have gone to work on them. What did they come up with? What was their take on the triangle theory? It is an established pattern with serials that they commit what we call triangle crimes. We see it often. That is, the victim can be traced through three points of a triangle. There is their point of origin or entry, their home, or in this case, the airport. Then there is what we call the point of prey, the place where killer and victim come into contact, where they crisscross. And then there is the point of disposal. With serials, the three points are never the same because it is the best way for them to avoid detection. That is what Terry saw when he read that newspaper story. He circled it because the Metro guy was going the wrong way with it. He wasn't thinking triangle, he was thinking circle. So, is the Bureau working on the triangle now? Of course they are. But some things take time. Right now, there is a higher emphasis on crime scene analysis. But we've got somebody in Quantico working the triangle. The FBI is effective, but sometimes slow, Harry. I am sure you know this. Sure. It's a tortoise and hare race. We're the tortoise, you're the hare. What are you talking about? You're moving faster than us, Harry. Something tells me you figured out the triangle theory and are taking a shot at the missing point, the point of prey. I nodded. Whether I was being used or not didn't matter. They were allowing me to stay in the hunt, and that was what was important to me. You start with the airport and you end with Zizek's. That leaves one more point. The intersection of predator and prey. And I think I've got it. We're going there. Then tell me. First tell me one more thing about McCaleb's notes. I think I already told you everything. They're still being analyzed. William Bing, who's that? She hesitated, but only for a moment. That's a no-go, a dead end. How so? William Bing is a heart transplant patient who was in Vegas Memorial getting a checkup and some tests. We think Terry knew him, and when he was over here, he visited him in the hospital. Did you people talk to Bing yet? Not yet. We're trying to track him. Seems odd. What? That he would visit a guy? No, not that. I mean that he would write that on the file if it wasn't connected to the case. Terry wrote stuff down. It's pretty obvious from all his files and notebooks that he wrote stuff down. If he was coming over here to work on this, then maybe he wrote Bing's name and the hospital number down on the file so he wouldn't forget to visit or call him. Could be a lot of reasons. I didn't respond. I still had trouble seeing it. How did he know the guy? We don't know. Maybe the movie. Terry got hundreds of letters from transplant people after that movie came out. He was sort of a hero to a lot of people in the same boat as he was. As we headed north on Blue Diamond, I saw a sign for the Travel America truck stop and remembered the receipt I'd found in Terry McCaleb's car. I pulled in, even though I had gassed up the Mercedes after leaving Eleanor's house that morning. I stopped the car and just looked at the travel complex. What is it? You need gas? No, we're fine. It's just that McCaleb was here. What is this? You getting a psychic reading or something? No, I found a receipt in his car. I wonder if this means he went up to Clear. To Clear what? No, the town of Clear. That's where we're going. Well, we might never know unless we get up there and ask some questions. I nodded and pulled the car back onto Blue Diamond and started north again.
Along the way, I told Rachel my theory of the theory. That is, my take on McCaleb's triangle and how clear fit into it. I could tell that my telling it drew her interest. She may have even been excited about it. She agreed with my take on the victims and how and why they may have been chosen. She agreed that it appeared to mirror the victimology, her word, in Amsterdam. We brainstormed for an hour on it and then grew quiet as we started to get close. The barren, rugged landscape was giving way to outposts of humanity, and we began to see billboards advertising the brothels that waited just ahead. Have you ever been to one of these? Rachel asked me. No. I thought about the steam and cream tents in Vietnam, but didn't bring them up. I didn't mean like as a customer, but as a cop. Still, no but I tracked a few people through them, and by that I mean by credit cards and other means. We're not going to find the people here overly cooperative, at least I never did by phone, and calling in a local sheriff is a joke. The state collects taxes from these joints. A big chunk of it goes back to the home county. I get it. So how do we handle it? Almost smiling because she had used the word we, I threw the question back at her. I don't know, she said. I guess we just go in through the front door. Meaning we play it straight and just go in and ask our questions. I wasn't sure it was the right way to go, but she had a badge, and I didn't. We cleared the town of Pahrump, and in another ten miles came to an intersection where a sign with clear on it and an arrow to the left was posted. I turned and the asphalt soon gave way to a crushed rock road that kicked up a flume of dust behind my car. The town of Clear could see us coming from a mile away. That is, if it was looking for us. But the town of Clear, Nevada, turned out to be little more than a trailer park. The gravel road led us to another intersection and another sign with an arrow. We turned north again and soon came to a clearing where an old trailer sat with rust dripping from its rivets. A sign running along the top edge of the trailer said, Welcome to Clear. Sports bar open. Rooms for rent. There were no cars parked in the clearing in front of the bar. I drove on past the welcome wagon, and the new road curved into a neighborhood of trailer homes baking like beer cans in the sun. Few were in better shape than the welcome wagon. Eventually, we came to a permanent structure that appeared to be a town hall, as well as the location of the spring the town was named for. We kept going and were rewarded by another arrow on another sign, this one reading simply, Brothels. Nevada licenses over 30 brothels across the state. In these places, prostitution is legal, controlled, and monitored. We found three of those state-licensed businesses at the end of the road in Clear. The gravel road widened into a large turnaround, where three similar-looking and designed brothels sat waiting for customers. They were called Sheila's Front Porch, Tawny's High Five Ranch, and Miss Delilah's House of Holies. Nice, Rachel said as we surveyed the scene. Why are these places always named after women? as if women actually owned them. You got me. I guess Mr. Dave's House of Holies wouldn't go over so well with the guys. Rachel smiled. You're right. I guess it's a shrewd move. Name a place of female degradation and slavery after a female, and it doesn't sound so bad, does it? It's packaging. Slavery? Last I heard, these women were volunteers. Some of them are supposedly housewives who come up from Vegas. If you believe that, then you are naive, Bosch. Just because you can come and go doesn't mean you're not a slave. I nodded thoughtfully, not wanting to get into a debate with her about this subject, because I knew it would bring me back to examining and questioning things in my own past. Rachel apparently wanted to drop it there, too. So, which one do you want to start with? she asked. I pulled the car to a stop in front of Tawny's High Five Ranch. It didn't look like much of a ranch. It was a conglomeration of three or four trailers that were connected by covered walkways. I looked to my left and saw that Sheila's front porch was of similar design and configuration, and it had no front porch. 
Miss Delilah's to my right was the same, and I got the distinct impression that the three seemingly separate brothels were not competitors, but rather branches of the same tree. I don't know, I said. Looks like eeny, meeny, miny, mo to me. Rachel cracked her door open. Wait a second, I said. I've got this. I handed her the file of photos Buddy Lockridge had brought to Vegas the day before. Rachel opened it and saw the front and side shots of the man known as Shandy, but presumed to be Robert Backus. I'm not even going to ask where you got these. Fine, but you carry them. It will have more weight coming from you, since you've got the badge. For the moment, at least. Did you bring the photos of the missing men? Yes, I've got them. Good. She took the file and got out of the car. I did likewise. We both walked around to the front of the car, where we stopped for a moment and surveyed the three brothels again. There were a few cars parked in front of each. There were also four flathead Harleys lined up like a row of mean chrome in front of Miss Delilah's House of Holies. Airbrushed on the gas tank of one of the bikes was a skull smoking a joint with a smoke ring forming a halo above it. Let's take Delilah's last, I said. Maybe we'll get lucky before we need to go there. The bikes? Yeah, the bikes. They're road saints. I say let sleeping dogs lie. Good enough for me. Leading the way, Rachel marched toward the front door of Sheila's. She didn't wait for me because she knew I would be following in her wake. Chapter 31 Inside Sheila's, we were greeted by the sickly sweet smell of perfume mixed with too much incense. We were also greeted by a smiling woman in a purple kimono, who did not seem the least bit surprised or put out by the idea of a couple coming into the brothel. Her mouth drew into an edge as straight and sharp as a guillotine's when she saw the FBI credentials Rachel flipped open. That's nice, she said with a falsely pleasant note in her voice. Now, let me see the warrant. No warrant today, Rachel replied evenly. We would just like to ask a few questions. I don't have to speak with you unless you have a court order telling me to. I run a legal and fully licensed business here. I noticed two women dressed in a page from Victoria's Secret sitting on a couch nearby. They were watching a television soap opera and seemingly uninterested in the verbal skirmish brewing at the front door. They were both attractive in a certain way, but worn down around the eyes and mouths. The scene suddenly reminded me of my mother and some of her friends, the way they looked to me when I was a boy and I watched them getting ready to go out at night and work. I suddenly felt completely ill at ease in this place and wanted to go. I even hoped the woman in the kimono would succeed in sending us out. No one is doubting the legality of your operation, Rachel said. We simply need to ask a few questions of you and your staff, and then we'll be gone. Get the court order, and we'll be happy to oblige. Are you Sheila? You can call me that. You can call me anything you want as long as you're saying goodbye when you do it. Rachel raised the ante by going to her don't-fuck-with-me voice. If I go for that court order, I'm going to first call for a sheriff's unit and I will have that car sit out in front of this trailer until I get back. You might run a legal operation here, Sheila, but which one of these places are all the guys going to pick when they see the sheriff sitting on this one? I figure two hours back to Vegas, a few hours waiting to get in to see the judge, and then two hours back. I'm off at five, so I probably won't be back till tomorrow. That okay with you? Sheila came back hard and swift. If you call the sheriff, ask him to send out Dennis or Tommy. They know the place real well, and they're also customers. She smirked at Rachel and held firm. She'd called her bluff, and Rachel had nothing left. They just stared at each other as the moments went by. I was about to step in and say something when one of the women on the couch beat me to the punch. She, the one closest to us, offered, Let's just get it over with. Sheila broke her stare from Rachel and looked at the woman at the couch. She then backed down 
but her anger remained barely below the surface. I'm not sure there was any other way to handle it once Sheila jumped on us like that, but it was clear to me that all the posturing and threatening was going to end up getting us nothing. We set up in Sheila's small office and interviewed the women one by one, starting with Sheila and ending with two women who were working when we first entered the establishment. Rachel never introduced me to anyone, so the problem of my standing in the investigation never came up. Uniformly, the women could not or would not identify any of the missing men who ended up in the ground in Zizek's, and the same went for the photographs of Shandy on McCaleb's boat. At the end of a half hour, we were out of there, with nothing to show for it but an incense intoxication headache for me and stress fractures in Rachel's outlook. Disgusting, she said as we walked down the pink sidewalk toward my car. What? That place. I don't know how anyone could do that. I thought you said they were slaves. Look, it's not your job to throw things back at me. Right. What are you so upset about? I didn't see you in there saying anything to her. You were a big help. That's because I wouldn't have done it that way. Two minutes into that place, I knew we wouldn't get anything. Oh, and you would have? No, I'm not saying that. I told you, these places are like rocks. It's hard to get water, and bringing up the sheriff was definitely the wrong way to go. I told you, half his pay probably comes from the brothels in his territory. So you just want to criticize and not offer any solution. Look, Rachel, point your gun at somebody else. I'm not the one you're angry with, all right? If you want to try something different in this next place, I'll give it a shot. Go right ahead. All right, then. Give me the photos and you wait in the car. What are you talking about? I'm going in. This is not the place for the pomp and circumstance, Rachel. I should have realized that when I invited you, but I didn't think you'd be shoving your badge down people's throats as soon as you walked in. So you're going to go in there and finesse it? I'm not sure I'd call it finesse. I'm just going to do it the old-fashioned way. Does that mean taking off your clothes? No. It means taking out my wallet. The FBI doesn't buy information from potential witnesses. That's right. I'm not the FBI. If I find a witness this way, the FBI won't have to pay a thing. I put my hand on her back and gently directed her to the Mercedes. I opened the door for her and ushered her in. I gave her the keys. Turn on the air conditioner. Either way. This shouldn't take too long. I rolled the file up with the photos and put it into my back pocket under my jacket. The sidewalk leading to the door of Tawny's High Five was also made of pink cement, and I was beginning to see the appropriateness of that. The women we had encountered in Sheila's were hard cases with pink lining. And so was Rachel. I was beginning to feel like my feet were in buckets of pink cement. I buzzed the door and was let in by a woman who was dressed in cut-off blue jeans and a halter top that barely contained her apparently surgically enhanced breasts. Come on in. I'm Tammy. Thanks. I stepped into the front room of the trailer, where there were two couches facing each other on opposite walls. Three women sat on the couches and looked at me with practiced smiles. This is Georgette and Gloria and Mecca. Tammy said, and I'm Tammy. You can choose one of us now or wait for Tawny. She's in the back with a customer. I looked at Tammy. She seemed the most eager. She was very small and top-heavy and had short brown hair. She would be considered attractive to some men, but not to me. I told her she would do just fine, and she led me back through a hallway that turned to the right and into another trailer. There were three private rooms on the left, and she went to the third one and used a key to open it. We went in, and she closed the door, but didn't lock it. There was barely enough room to stand, because a king-size bed took up most of the space. Tammy sat down on the bed and patted the spot next to her. I sat, and she reached to a shelf full of well-thumbed mystery novels and pulled down what looked like a restaurant menu and gave it to me. 
It was a thin folder with a caricature drawing on the front. It showed a naked woman on her hands and knees and bent over, turning to look back at and wink at the man who was entering her from the rear. The man was naked too, except for a cowboy hat and the holstered six shooters on his hips. One hand was up in the air and holding a lasso. The rope rose above the couple and formed the words, Tawny's High Five. You can get a t-shirt with that on it, Tammy informed me. Twenty bucks. Great, I said, as I opened the folder. It turned out that it was a menu of sorts. It was personalized to Tammy. It contained a single sheet of paper with two columns on it. One listed the sexual acts she was willing to perform and the lengths of individual sessions, and the other listed the prices these services would cost the customer. After two of the listed sexual acts were asterisks. At the bottom it was explained that an asterisk denoted a personal specialty. So, I said, staring at the columns, I think I might need a translator for some of these. I'll help you. Which ones? How much is it just to talk? What do you mean? Like talk dirty to you? Or you talk dirty to me? No, just talk. I want to ask you about a guy I'm looking for. He's from around here. Her posture changed. She sat up straighter, and in doing so put a couple inches of space between us, which was fine because her perfume was searing my already incense-burned nasal plates. I think you better talk to Tawny when she's finished. I want to talk to you, Tammy. I've got a hundred bucks for five minutes. I'll double it if you give me a line on this guy. She hesitated as she thought about it. Two hundred bucks wouldn't even cover an hour's work, according to the menu. But I had a feeling the menu prices were negotiable. And besides, there was nobody lined up on the pink cement to get in here. Somebody's going to take my money here, I said. It might as well be you. Okay, but it has to be quick. If Tawny finds out you ain't a paying customer, she's going to kick you out and put me at the back of the line. Now I understood. She had answered the door because she was up. I could have picked from any of the women on the couches, but Tammy got the first shot at me. I reached into my pocket for my money and gave her the hundred. I kept the rest in my hand as I pulled out the file and opened it. Rachel had made a mistake asking the women at Sheila's if they recognized any of the men in the photos. That was because she didn't have the confidence I had. I was more certain of my theory, and I didn't make that mistake with Tammy. The first photo I showed her was the front shot of Shandy on Terry McCaleb's boat. When was the last time you saw him around here? I asked. Tammy looked at the photo for a long moment. She didn't take it from me, though I would have given it to her to hold. After what seemed like an interminable moment, when I thought the door would swing open and the woman named Tawny would order me out, she finally spoke. I don't know. At least a month, maybe more. He hasn't been around. I felt like climbing on the bed and bouncing, but I kept my cool. I wanted her to believe I knew everything she was telling me. She would feel more comfortable that way and be more forthcoming. Do you remember where it was you saw him? Just out front. I walked a customer out and Tom was there waiting. Uh-huh. Did he say anything to you? No, he never does. He doesn't even know me, really. Then what happened? Nothing happened. My guy got in the car and they drove away. I was beginning to get a picture. Tom had a car. He was a driver. Who called him? Was it you, or had the client already done that? It was Tawny, probably. I don't really remember. Because it happened all the time? Yeah. But he hasn't been around in, what, a month? Yeah, maybe more. Is that enough of a lead? I mean, what do you want? She was looking at the second hundred in my hand. Two things. You know Tom's last name? No. Okay, how does somebody get a hold of him if they need a ride? Call him, I guess. Can you get me the number? Just go over to the sports bar. That's where we call him. 
I don't know the number offhand. It's up there next to the phone in front. The sports bar, okay. I didn't give her the money. One last thing. You keep saying that. I know, but I mean it this time. I showed her the six-pack of photos Rachel had brought of the missing men. These were better and much clearer than the photos that had run with the newspaper article. These were full-color candidates given to Vegas Metro by their families and then turned over as a courtesy to the FBI. Any of these guys your customers? Look, mister, we don't talk about customers. We're very discreet and don't give out that kind of information. They're dead, Tammy. It doesn't matter. Her eyes widened and then lowered to the photos in my hand. These she took, and she looked through them like they made up a hand of cards. I could tell by the way her eyes flared that she'd been dealt an ace. What? Well, this one guy looks like a guy that was here. He was with Mecca, I think. You could ask her. I heard a horn honk twice. I knew it was from my car. Rachel was getting impatient. Go get Mecca and bring her back here. I'll give you the rest of the money then. Tell her I've got some money for her, too. Don't tell her what I want. Tell her I just want two girls at once. All right, but that's it. You pay me. I will. She left the room and I sat on the bed looking around while I waited. The walls were paneled with fake cherry wood. There was one window with a frilly curtain. I leaned across the bed and pulled the curtain open. The view was of nothing but barren desert. The bed and the trailer might as well be sitting on the moon. The door opened and I turned back, ready to give Tammy the rest of her money and to dive into my pocket for Mecca's share. But there weren't two women in the doorway. There were two men. They were big, one larger than the other and their arms below their black T-shirts were completely carved up with jailhouse ink. On the bigger man's bulging bicep was a skull with a halo above it, and that told me who they were. "'What's up, Doc?' said the bigger one. "'You must be Tawny,' I said. Without a word, he reached down and grabbed two fists full of my jacket. He pulled me up off the bed and tossed me out into the hallway to the waiting arms of his partner. The new one shoved me down the hallway in the opposite direction I had come into the trailer from. I realized that the horn honk from Rachel had been a warning, not a sign of impatience. I was wishing I had read that right when Big and Little Steroid shoved me through a back door and onto the rocky terrain of the desert. I went down to my hands and knees and was gathering myself and getting up when one of them put his boot on my hip and shoved me down again. I tried to get up again, and this time they let me. I said, what's up, Doc? You got business here? I was just asking questions, and I was willing to pay for the answers. I didn't think that was a problem. Well, pal, that is a problem. They were advancing on me, the big man first. He was so big, I couldn't even see his little brother behind him. I was taking a step backward for every one they took forward, and I had a bad feeling that that was what they wanted. They were backing me toward something, maybe a hole in the ground out there in the sand and rock. Who are you, boy? I'm a private detective from L.A. I'm just looking for a missing man, that's all. Yeah, well, people who come here don't want to be looked for. I understand that now. I'll just clear out of here and you won't... Excuse me. We all stopped. It was Rachel's voice. The bigger man turned back toward the trailer and his shoulder lowered a few inches. I could see Rachel coming out the back door of the trailer. Her hands were at her sides. What's this? You bring your mother? Big Steroid said. Something like that. While he was looking at Rachel, I clasped my hands together and swung a sledgehammer into the back of his neck. He went forward and into his partner. But the blow was nothing more than a surprise attack. He didn't go down. He wheeled on me and started coming at me, balling his fists into twin sledgehammers.
I saw Rachel move her arm under her blazer and flip it back to get her gun, but her hand caught momentarily in the material and she was late getting to her weapon. Hold it, she yelled. But the steroid boys didn't stop. I ducked under the bigger man's first punch, but when I came up behind him, I was right in front of little brother. He grabbed me in a bear hug and lifted me off the ground. For some reason, at this point, I noticed that there were women watching from the three back windows of the rear trailer. I had drawn an audience to my own destruction. My arms were trapped inside of my attacker's embrace, and I was feeling severe pressure building on my spine at the same time the air was crushed out of my lungs. Just then, Rachel finally freed her weapon and fired two shots into the air. I was dropped to the ground, and I watched as Rachel Crab walked away from the trailer to make sure no one could get up behind her. FBI, she shouted. On the ground, both of you, on the ground. The big men complied. As soon as I got some air back into my lungs, I got back up. I tried to dust some of the dirt off my clothes, but all that did was spread it around. I looked at Rachel and nodded. She kept her distance from the men on the ground and signaled me over with her finger. What happened? I was interviewing one of the women and asked her to bring in another, but then these guys showed up and dragged me out here. Thanks for the warning. I did try to warn you. I honked. I know, Rachel. Take it easy. That's what I'm thanking you for. I just misread it. So, what do we do? I don't care about these guys. Cut them loose. But there are two women inside, Tammy and Mecca. We need to take them. One knows Shandy, and the other, I think, can ID one of the missing men as being a customer. Rachel computed this and slowly nodded. Good. Is Shandy a customer? No, he's some sort of driver. We need to get over to the sports bar and ask around there. Then we can't just cut these two loose. They might just come meet us again over there. Besides, there were four bikes out front. Where are the other two? I don't know. Hey, come on, Big Steroid yelled. We're breathing sand over here. Rachel approached the two men on the ground. Okay, get up. She waited until they were up and staring at her with malevolent eyes. She dropped her gun down to her side and spoke calmly to them, as if this was the way she normally got to know people. Where are you guys from? Why? Why? Because I'm trying to get to know you. I'm deciding whether to arrest you. For what? He started it. Not what I saw. I saw two big men assaulting a smaller man. He was trespassing. Last I checked, trespassing was not a valid defense of assault. If you want to see if I'm wrong, then keep... Parump. What? Parump. And do you own these three operations? Nah, we're just security. I see. Well, I'll tell you what. If you two find the other two whose bikes are out front and go back to Pahrump, then we'll let bygones be bygones here. That's not fair. He was in there asking... I'm the FBI. I'm not interested in what's fair. Take it or leave it. After a moment, the bigger man broke from his stance and started walking toward the trailer. The smaller big man followed. Where are you going? Rachel barked. We're leaving, like you told us. Good. Make sure you put on your helmets, gentlemen. Without looking back, the bigger man raised a brawny arm and shot us a bird as he walked. The smaller big man saw this and did the same. Rachel looked at me and said, I hope this works. Chapter 32 The women in the back seat were angry but Rachel didn't care. This was the closest she had been, the closest anybody had been to Bacchus since that night in Los Angeles, the night she had watched him crash backward through the glass and into the void that seemed to swallow any trace of him. Until now. And the last thing she was going to let bother her were the protests of the two prostitutes in the back seat of Bosch's car. The only thing that bothered her was her decision to let Bosch drive. They now had two custodies and were transporting them in a private car. It was a security issue, and she wasn't sure yet how they were going to handle the stop at the sports bar. I know what we'll do, Bosch said as he drove away from the three brothels at the end of the road. So do I, Rachel said. 
You'll stay with them while I go in. No, that won't work. You'll need backup. We just proved that we shouldn't split up. Then what? I turn on the child locks on the back doors. They won't be able to open them. And what's to stop them from climbing over to the front seat and getting out? Look, where are they going to go? They have no choice. Right, ladies? He looked up into the rearview mirror. Fuck you, answered the one named Mecca. You can't just do this. We're not the ones who committed any crimes. Actually, as I explained before, we can, Rachel said in a bored tone. You have been taken into federal custody as material witnesses in a criminal investigation. You will be formally interviewed and then released. Well, just do it now and get it over with. Rachel had been surprised to learn when she looked at the woman's driver's license that her name really was Mecca. Mecca McIntyre. What a name. Well, Mecca, we can't. I already explained that, too. Bosch pulled into the gravel lot in front of the sports bar. There were no other cars. He lowered all the windows a couple of inches and turned off the car. I'm going to put the alarm on, he said. If you climb over and open the door, it will set off the alarm. We'll then come out and chase you down, so don't bother, okay? We won't be gone long. Rachel got out and closed the door. She checked her cell phone again and was still not getting service. She saw Bosch check his and shake his head. She decided she would commandeer the phone in the sports bar, if there was one, and call the Vegas F.O. to report what she had. She expected Sherry Dye to be very angry and pleased. By the way, Bosch said as they came to the ramp leading up to the door of the trailer, do you carry an extra magazine for your SIG? Of course. Where, on your belt? That's right, why? Nothing. I just saw back there behind the trailer that your hand sort of got caught in your jacket. I didn't get caught. I just... What's your point? Nothing. I was just going to say that I always carried my extra in my jacket pocket. It gave it some weight, you know? So when you had to flip it back, the extra weight carried it all the way back and out of the way. Thanks for the tip, she said evenly. Can we concentrate on this now? Sure, Rachel. You going to take the lead here? If you don't mind. Not at all. He followed her up the ramp. She thought she saw a smile on his face in the reflection on the glass of the trailer's door. She opened it, engaging an overhead bell that announced their arrival. They stepped into a small and empty barroom. To their right was a pool table, its green felt faded by time and stained by drink spills. It was a small table, but still did not have enough clearance in the small space. Even breaking a rack would probably require holding a cue at a forty-degree angle. To the left of the door was a six-stool bar with three shelves of glasses and take-your-pick poison behind it. There was no one in the bar, but before Rachel or Bosch could call out a hello, a set of black curtains to the left of the bar split and a man stepped out, his eyes creased with sleep even though it was almost noon. Can uh, I help you? Kind of early, isn't it? Rachel hit him with the credentials, and that seemed to crack his eyes open a little wider. He was in his early sixties, she guessed, though his unkempt bed hair and the unshaven white stubble on his cheeks may have skewed her estimate. He nodded as though he had just solved some sort of internal mystery. So you're the sister, right? he asked. Excuse me? You're Tom's sister, right? He said you might come. Tom who? Tom Walling, who do you think? We're looking for a man named Tom who drives customers from the brothels. Is that Tom Walling? That's what I'm telling you. Tom Walling was my driver. He told me that one day his sister might come here looking for him. He never said she was no FBI agent. Rachel nodded, trying to cover the jolt. It wasn't necessarily the surprise that buzzed her. It was the audacity and the deeper meaning, the magnitude of Bacchus's plan. What is your name, sir? Billings Rhett. 
I own this place, and I'm also the mayor around here. The mayor of Clear? That's right. Rachel felt something tap her arm and looked down to see the file containing the photos. Bosch was giving it to her, but staying back. He seemed to know things had suddenly swung. This was now more about her than Terry McCaleb, or even Bosch. She took the file and removed one of the photographs McCaleb had taken of the fishing client known to him as Jordan Shandy. She showed it to Billings Red. Is that the man you knew of as Tom Walling? Rhett spent only a few seconds looking at the photo. That's it, right down to that Dodger's hat. We get all the games here on the dish, and Tom was Dodger blue through and through. He drove a car for you? The only car. I'm not that big of an operation. And he told you his sister would come here? No, he said she might. And he gave me something. He turned and looked at the shelves behind the bar. He saw what he was looking for and reached up to the top shelf. He pulled down an envelope and handed it to Rachel. The envelope left a rectangle in the dust on the glass shelf. It had been up there a while. The envelope had her full name on it. She turned her body slightly as if to shield it from Bosch and started to open it. Rachel, Bosch said. Should you process it first? It doesn't matter. I know it's from him. She tore the envelope open and pulled out a three-by-five card. She started to read the handwritten note on it. Dear Rachel, If, as I hope you are the first to read this, then I have taught you well. I hope this finds you in good health and spirits. Most of all, I hope this means you have survived your internment within the Bureau and are back on top. I hope he who taketh away can also giveth back. It was never my intention, Rachel, to doom you. It is my intention now, with my last act, to save you. Goodbye, Rachel. R. She reread it quickly and then handed it over her shoulder to Bosch. As he read, she continued with Billings Rhett. When did he give you that, and what exactly did he say? It was about a month ago, give or take a few days, and it was when he told me he was leaving. He paid me the rent, said he wanted to keep the place, and he gives me the card and says that it's for his sister, and that she might come by looking for him. And here you are. I'm not his sister, she snapped at him. When did he first come to clear? Uh, hard to remember. Three or four years ago? Why did he come here? Rhett shook his head. Beats me. Why do people go to New York City? Everybody's got their reasons. He didn't share his particular reason with me. How did he end up driving for you? He was in here shooting balls one day, and I asked him if he needed some work. He said he wouldn't mind, and it went from there. It's not a full-time gig. Just when we get a call for somebody looking for a ride. Most people drive themselves up here. And back then, three or four years ago, he told you his name was Tom Walling? No, he told me that when he rented the trailer from me. That was when he first got here. What about a month ago? Did you say he paid rent and then left? Yeah, he said he'd be back and wanted to keep the place. He rented it up through August. But he went traveling, and I haven't heard from him. From outside the trailer, an alarm sounded. The Mercedes. Rachel turned to Bosch, but he was already heading to the door. I got it, he said. He went through the door, leaving Rachel alone with Rhett. She turned back to him. Did Tom Walling ever tell you where he came from? Nah, he never mentioned it. He didn't talk much. And you never asked? Honey, you don't ask questions in a place like this. People that come here, they don't like answering questions. Tom, he liked to do the driving and pick up a few bucks, and every now and then he'd come in and shoot a game by himself. He didn't drink. He just chewed gum. He never messed with the whores, and he was never late on a pickup. All that was fine by me. The guy I got driving now, he's always... I don't care about the guy you've got now. The bell rang behind her, and she turned to see Bosch coming through. He nodded to her, telling her everything was all right. They tried the door. I guess the child lock doesn't work. 
She nodded and turned her attention back to Rhett, proud mayor of a brothel town. Mr. Rhett, she asked, where is Tom Walling's place? He's got the single wide on the ridge west of town. Rhett smiled, revealing a rotten tooth on the front lower row, and continued. He liked being outside of town. He told me he didn't like being so close to all the excitement around here. So I set him up out there, behind Titanic Rock. Titanic Rock? You'll know when you get there, if you saw the movie. One of these smart-ass rock climbers that comes out here marked it, too. You'll see it. Just take the road behind this place west, and you'll be all right. Just look for the ship going down. Chapter 33 I was outside with the two women in the Mercedes, running the air conditioning and cooling them down. Rachel was still inside on the bar's phone talking to Sherry Dye and coordinating the arrival of backup. My guess was that agents would soon drop out of the sky in helicopters and descend on clear Nevada in force. The trail was fresh. They were close. I tried to talk to the two girls. It was hard to think of them as women despite what they did for a living, and even though they were old enough. They probably knew everything there was to know about men but they didn't seem to know anything about the world. In my mind, they were just girls who had taken wrong turns or been kidnapped and taken away from womanhood. I was beginning to understand what Rachel had said earlier. Did Tom Walling ever come into the trailer and hire any of the girls? I asked. Not that I seen, Tammy said. Somebody said he was probably queer or something, Mecca added. Why did they say that? Cause he lived like a hermit or something, Mecca replied. And he never wanted no pussy even though Tawny would have thrown him some on the house, like with the other drivers. Are there a lot of drivers? He was the only one from around here, Tammy said quickly, apparently not liking Mecca in the lead. The others come up from Vegas. Some of them work for the casinos. If there are drivers down there, how come somebody would hire Tom to go all the way down and get them? They didn't, Mecca said. Sometimes they did, Tammy corrected. Well, sometimes, the dummies. But mostly we called for Tom if somebody got dropped off and stayed a while or rented one of the old Billings trailers and then needed a ride back because his ride was long gone. The casino rides don't wait around too long, unless you're one of those high rollers and then probably... And then what? Then you wouldn't come to clear in the first place. They got prettier girls in Pahrump. Tammy said matter-of-factly, as if it was strictly a business disadvantage and not something that bothered her personally. And it's a bit closer and the pussy costs more, Mecca said. So what we get up and clear is your cost-conscious consumer. Spoken like a true marketing expert. I tried to get the conversation back on track. So, for the most part, Tom Walling came over and drove customers back to Las Vegas or wherever they came from. Right. Right. And these guys, these customers, could have been totally anonymous? You don't check IDs, right? The customers could use whatever name they wanted when they came in there. Uh-huh, unless they look like maybe they ain't 21 yet. Right. We check the ID of the young ones. I could see how it could be done, how Bacchus could have sized up brothel customers as his victims. If it appeared they had taken measures to guard their identities and hide that they had made the trip to clear, then they had inadvertently made themselves perfect victims. It also played into what was known about the demons that drove his killing spree. The profile work in the poet file indicated that Bacchus's pathology was wrapped up in his relationship with his father, a man who on the outside held the vaunted image of FBI agent, hero and good man, but on the inside was a man who abused his wife and son to the extent that one fled the home because she could, while the one who couldn't get away was left to retreat into a world of fantasies involving the killing of his abuser. I realized there was something missing. Lloyd Rockland, the victim who had rented a car, how did he fit in if he didn't need a driver? I opened the file Rachel had left in the car and pulled out the photo of Rockland. I showed it to the women. 
This guy. Do either of you recognize him? His name was Lloyd. Was? Mecca asked. Yeah, that's right, was. Lloyd Rockland. He's dead. Do you recognize him? Neither of them did. I knew it was a long shot. Rockland disappeared in 2002. I tried to think of an explanation that would allow Rockland to fit into the theory. You serve alcohol in there, right? If the customer wants it, we can provide it, Mecca said. We got a license. Okay, what happens when a guy drives all the way up from Vegas and gets too drunk to drive home? He can sleep it off, she responded. He can take a room if he pays for it. What if he wants to get back? What if he needs to get back? He can call over here and the mayor will take care of it. The driver will take him back in his car, and then the driver just catches a ride back like with one of the casino cars or something. It works out. I nodded. It worked out for my theory as well. Rockland could have gotten drunk and had to be driven back by the driver, Bacchus. Only he wasn't driven back to Vegas. I knew I would have to ask Rachel to check the remains identified as Rockland's for a high alcohol level. It would be another confirmation. Mister, are we going to have to stay here all day? Mecca asked. I don't know, I said as I looked up at the trailer door. Rachel tried to keep her voice low because Billings Rhett was at the other end of the bar acting like he was doing a crossword puzzle when she knew he was trying to listen to and understand everything she was saying, and that could be heard from the phone. What's the ETA? she asked. We'll be in the air within twenty and then another twenty to you, Sherry Dye said. So sit tight, Rachel. Got it. And Rachel, I know you. I know what you will want to do. Stay out of the suspect's trailer until we can go in there with an ERT. Let them do their job. Rachel almost told Di that the fact was that she didn't know her, that she couldn't begin to understand the first thing about her. But she didn't. Got it, she said instead. What about Bosch? Di asked next. What about him? I want him kept away from this. That will be sort of hard since he found the place. This is all because of him. I understand that, but we would have gotten there eventually. We always do. We'll thank him, but we have to brush him aside after that. Well, you get to tell him that. I will. So are we set? I've got to get over to Nellis. All set. See you inside the hour. Rachel, one last thing. Why didn't you drive up there? It was Bosch's hunch. He wanted to drive. What's the difference? You were giving him control of the situation, that's all. That's second-guessing after the fact. We thought we might get a line on the missing men, not be led right to... That's fine, Rachel. I shouldn't have brought it up. I have to go. Di hung up on her end. Rachel couldn't hang up because the phone was stretched from the back wall and over the bar. She held it up to Rhett and he put down his pencil and came over. He took the phone and hung it up. Thank you, Mr. Rhett. In about an hour, a couple helicopters are going to land here, probably right in front of this trailer. Agents will want to talk to you, more formally than I did. They will probably talk to a lot of people in your town. Not good for business. Probably not, but the faster people cooperate, the faster they'll take off and be out of here. She didn't mention anything about the horde of media that would also probably descend on the place once it was revealed publicly that the little brothel town in the desert was where the poet had holed up unnoticed for all of these years and had chosen his latest victims. If the agents ask where I am, tell them I went up to Tom Walling's trailer, okay? Sounded like you were getting told not to go up there. Mr. Rhett, just tell them what I asked you to tell them. Will do. By the way, have you been up there since he came in here and told you he was leaving for a while? No, I haven't managed to get up there. He paid the rent on the place, so I didn't think it was my business to snoop around his things. That's not the way we are here in clear. Rachel nodded. Okay, Mr. Rhett. 
Thanks for your cooperation. He shrugged as if to say he either had no choice or his cooperation was minimal. Rachel turned from the bar and headed for the door, but just as she got there, she hesitated. She reached inside her blazer and pulled the extra magazine for her Sig Sauer off her belt. She hefted its weight once in her hand and then slipped it into the pocket of her blazer. She then went out the door and got into the Mercedes next to Bosch. So, he said, is Agent Die mad? Nope. We just brought in the case brick. How could she be mad? I don't know. Some people have the ability to be mad no matter what you bring them. Are we just going to sit here all day? Mecca asked from the back seat. Rachel turned around to look back at the two women. We're going over to the Western Ridge to check out a trailer. You can go with us and stay in the car, or you can go into the bar and wait. More agents are on the way. You'll probably be able to get your interviews over with here and not have to go into Vegas. Thank God, Mecca said. I'll wait here. Me too, said Tammy. Bosch let them out of the car. Just wait here, Rachel called to them. If you go back to your trailer or go anywhere else, you won't get far, and it will just make them mad. They didn't acknowledge this cautioning. Rachel watched them walk up the ramp and into the bar. Bosch got back in and put the car into reverse. You sure about this? he asked. My guess is that Agent Die told you to sit still until the reinforcements got here. She also said one of the first things she was going to do was send you on your way. You want to wait for that, or do you want to go see this trailer? Don't worry, I'll go. I'm not the one with the career to worry about. Such as it is. We followed the dirt road Billings Red had directed us to, and it ranged west from the settlement of Clear and up a sloping landscape for a mile. The road then leveled off and curved behind a reddish-orange outcropping of rock that was exactly as Rhett had described it. It looked like the tail end of the great passenger ship as it drew upward out of the water at a sixty-degree angle, and then plunged downward into the sea. According to the movie, anyway. The rock climber Rhett mentioned had climbed to the appropriate spot at the top and had used white paint to scrawl S.S. Titanic across the rock surface. We didn't stop to appraise the rock or the paintwork. I drove the Mercedes around it, and we soon came to a clearing where there was a small trailer sitting on concrete blocks. There was a junked car on four flats next to it, and an oil drum used to burn trash nearby. On the other side was a large fuel tank and a power generator. To preserve possible crime scene evidence, I stopped just outside the clearing and killed the engine. I noticed that the generator was silent. There was a stillness about the whole scene that seemed ominous in some way. I had a real sense that I had come to the end of the world, a place of darkness. I wondered if this was where Bacchus had taken his victims, if this was the end of the world for them. Probably, I concluded. It was a place of waiting evil. Rachel broke the silence. Well, are we just going to look at it, or are we going to check it out? Just waiting on you to make the move. She opened her door, and then I opened mine. We met at the front of the car. That was when I noticed that the trailer's windows were all open, not what I would expect someone would do if they were leaving their home for a long period of time. After that recognition came the odor. You smell that? She nodded. Death was in the air. It was much worse, much stronger than at Zizek's. I instinctively knew that what we would find here would not be the buried secrets of the killer. Not this time. There was a body in that trailer, at least one, that was open to the air and decomposing. With my last act, Rachel said. What? The card. What he wrote on the card. I nodded. She was thinking suicide. You think? I don't know. Let's check. We walked slowly forward, neither saying a word after that. 
The smell grew stronger, and we both knew that whatever and whoever was dead inside the trailer had been baking in there for a long time. I broke from her side and walked to a set of windows to the left of the trailer's door. Cupping my hands to the screen, I tried to look into the darkness within. My hands hitting the screen set off an alarm of buzzing flies within the trailer. They were bouncing against the screen, looking to get out as if maybe the scene and the smell inside were too much even for them. There was no curtain across the window, but I couldn't see much from the angle I had, at least not a body or an indication of one. It looked like a small sitting area with a couch and a chair. There was a table with two stacks of hardback books on it. Behind the chair was a bookcase with its shelves full of books. Nothing, I said. I stepped back from the window and looked up the length of the trailer. I saw Rachel's eyes focused on the door, and then the doorknob. Something came to me then, something that didn't fit. Rachel, why did he leave the note for you at the bar? What? The note. He left it at the bar. Why there? Why not here? I guess he wanted to make sure I got it. If he hadn't left it there, you would have still come up here. You would have still found it here. She shook her head. What are you saying? I don't get... Don't try the door, Rachel. Let's wait. What are you talking about? I don't like this. Why don't you look around the back, see if there's another window you can see in or something? Okay, I will. You just wait. She didn't answer me. I walked around the left side of the trailer, stepped over the hitch, and headed toward the other side. But then I stopped and walked out to the trash barrel. The barrel was one-third full with the charred remains of burned refuse. There was a broom handle on the ground that was charred on one end. I picked it up and dug around in the ashes in the barrel, as I was sure Bacchus had done while the fire was burning. He had wanted to make sure everything got burned. It appeared to be mostly paperwork and books that had been burned. There was nothing recognizable until I came across a blackened and melted credit card. There was nothing I recognized on it, but I guessed that the forensics experts might be able to connect it to one of the victims. I dug around further and saw pieces of melted black plastic. Then I noticed one book that was burned beyond recognition on the outside, but still had some partially intact pages on the inside. With my fingers, I lifted it out and gingerly opened it. It looked like it was poetry, though it was hard to be sure, since all the pages were partially burned away. Between two of these pages, I found a half-burned receipt for the book. At the top, it said, Book Car but the rest was burned away. Bosh, where are you? It was Rachel. I was out of her sight. I placed the book back into the barrel and stuck the broom handle in as well. I headed toward the back side of the trailer. I saw another open window. Hold on a second. Rachel waited. She was growing impatient. She was listening for the distant sound of helicopters crossing the desert. She knew as soon as she heard them that her chance would be over. She would be pushed back, possibly even punished for how she had handled Bosch. She looked back down at the doorknob. She thought about Bacchus and whether this could be his last play. Was four years here in the desert enough? Did he kill Terry McCaleb and send her the GPS only to lead her eventually to this? She thought about the note he had left, his telling her he had taught her well. An anger welled up inside her, an anger that wanted her to throw open the door and... We've got a body. It was Bosch, calling from the other side of the trailer. What? Where? Come around, I've got a view. There's a bed and I see one body. Two, three days old. I can't see the face. Okay, anything else? She waited. He didn't say anything. She put her hand on the knob. It turned. The door's not locked. Rachel, don't open it, Bosch called. I think, I think there is gas. I smell something besides the body, something besides the obvious, something underneath. Rachel hesitated, but then turned the knob fully and opened the door an inch. Nothing happened. She slowly pulled the door all the way open. Nothing happened. 
Flies saw the opening and buzzed by her and into the light. She waved them away from her eyes. Bosh, I'm going in. She stepped up into the trailer. More flies. They were everywhere. The smell hit her fully then, invading her and tightening her stomach. Her eyes adjusted to the dimness after the brightness outside, and she saw the photos. They were stacked on tables and taped to the walls and refrigerator. Photos of the victims, alive and dead, tearful, pleading, pitiful. The table in the trailer's kitchen had been turned into a workstation. There was a laptop connected to a printer on one side and three separate stacks of photos. She picked up the largest stack and started to flip through it, again recognizing some of the men in the photos as the missing men whose photos she had carried with them to clear. But these weren't the sort of family photos she had carried. These were shots of a killer and his victims, men whose eyes pleaded to the camera, asking forgiveness and mercy. Rachel noticed that all of the shots were at a downward angle, with the shooter, Bacchus, in the dominant position, focusing down on his victims as they hoped and pleaded for their lives. When she could look no more at them, she put the photos down and took up the second stack. There were fewer photos here, and these were mostly focused on a woman and two children as they moved through a shopping mall. She put them down and was about to move the camera weighing down the third stack of photos when Bosch stepped into the trailer. Rachel, what are we doing? Don't worry, we have five, maybe ten minutes. We'll back out as soon as we hear the choppers and let the evidence recovery team take over. I just want to see if... I'm not talking about beating other agents to the punch. I don't like this, the door being left open. Something's not... He stopped when he caught his first glimpse of the photos. She turned back to the table and lifted the camera that rested on the last stack of photos. She looked down at a photo of herself. It took her a moment to place it, but then realized where she had been photographed. He was with me all the way, she said. What are you talking about? Bosch asked. This is O'Hare, my layover. Bacchus was there watching me. She quickly shuffled through the photos. There were six of them, all shots of her on the day she traveled. The last shot was of Rachel and Sherry Dye greeting each other in baggage claim, Sherry holding a sign down at her side that said Bob Bacchus on it. He's been watching me. Like he watched Terry. Bosch reached the printer's tray and used a finger from each hand to lift a photo by its edges and without leaving a print. It apparently was the last image Bacchus had printed here. It showed the front of a two-story house of no particular design. In the driveway was a station wagon. An old man stood next to the driver's door and was looking at a keychain as if searching for the key to unlock the car. Bosch proffered the photo to Rachel. Who's this? She looked at it for a long moment. I don't know. The house? Never seen it before. Bosch carefully put the photo back in the tray so that it would be found in its original position by the evidence team. Rachel moved behind him and walked down the hallway toward a closed doorway. Before she reached it, she stepped through the open door of a bathroom. It was neat except for the dead flies covering all surfaces. In the bathtub, she saw two pillows and a blanket arranged as if for sleeping. She remembered the intelligence gathered on Bacchus and felt a physical repulsion building in her chest. She stepped out of the bathroom and went to the closed door at the end of the hallway. Is this where you saw it? she asked. Bosch turned and watched her approach the door. Rachel! Rachel didn't stop. She turned the knob and pulled the door open. I heard a distinct metallic ching sound that my mind did not associate with any door lock. Rachel stopped her movement, and her posture stiffened. Harry? I started moving toward her. What is it? Harry! She turned toward me in the close confines of the wood-paneled hallway. I looked past her face and saw the body on the bed. A man on his back, 
a black cowboy hat canted down on his head to obscure his face, a pistol in his right hand, a bullet wound to the upper left chest. Flies were buzzing all around us. I heard a louder hissing sound and pushed further by her and saw the fuse on the floor. I recognized it as a chemical fuse, a braiding of wires treated with chemicals that would burn anywhere under any condition, even underwater. The fuse was burning fast. We could not stop it. There were maybe four feet of it coiled on the floor, and then it disappeared under the bed. Rachel bent down and reached for it to pull it. No, don't. That could set it off. There's nothing. We have to get out of here. No, we can't lose this scene. We need Rachel. No time. Go, run, now. I pushed her back up the hallway and turned my body to block any attempt by her to return. I started moving backward, my eyes fixed on the figure on the bed. When I thought Rachel had given up, I turned and she was waiting. She shoved by me. We need DNA, she yelled. I watched her move into the room and leap onto the bed. Her hand came up and grabbed the hat off the dead man's head, revealing a face that was distorted and gray with decomposition. She then backed off the bed and headed toward the doorway. Even in the moment, I admired her thinking and what she had just done. The hat brim would most definitely contain skin cells that would hold the body's DNA. She carried the hat past me and started running for the door. I looked down to see the burn point on the fuse line disappear under the bed. I started to run behind her. Was it him? she yelled over her shoulder. I knew what she meant. Was the cadaver on the bed the man who showed up on Terry McCaleb's boat? Was it Bacchus? I don't know. Just go, go, go! I hit the door two seconds behind Rachel. She was already on the ground heading directly away in the direction of Titanic Rock. I followed her lead. I had taken maybe five strides when the explosion ripped through the air behind me. I was hit with the full force of the deafening concussion and knocked forward to the ground. I remembered the tuck and roll maneuver from basic training, and it served to give me a few more yards distance from the explosion. Time became disjointed and slow. One moment I was running, the next I was on my hands and knees, my eyes open, trying to raise my head. Something momentarily eclipsed the sun, and I managed to look up to see the shell of the trailer thirty feet in the air over me, its walls and roof intact. It seemed to float and almost hang up there. Then it came crashing down ten yards in front of me, its splintered aluminum sides as sharp as razors. It made a sound like a five-car pileup when it hit the ground. I checked the sky for more incoming and saw I was clear. I turned to look back at the trailer's original location and saw intense fire and thick black smoke billowing into the sky. Nothing was recognizable on the trailer pad. Everything had been consumed by the blast and fire. The bed and the man in it were gone. Bacchus had planned this exit perfectly. I got to my feet but was unsteady because my eardrums were still reacting and my equilibrium was off. It sounded as though I was walking through a tunnel with trains speeding by me on both sides. I wanted to put my hands over my ears, but knew that it would do no good. The noise was reverberating from inside. Rachel had been only a few feet from me before the blast, but now I couldn't see her. I stumbled around in the smoke and started to think that maybe she was under the trailer's skin. But finally I found her on the ground to the left of the trailer debris. She was lying still in the dirt and rocks. The black hat was on the ground next to her, like a sign of death. I moved as quickly as I could to her. Rachel! I got down on my hands and knees and first examined her without touching her. She was lying face down, and her hair had fallen forward to further hide her eyes from my view. I was suddenly reminded of my daughter as I used a hand to gently pull the hair back. As I did this, I noticed blood on the back of my palm and for the first time realized I was wounded in some minor way. I decided I would worry about that later. Rachel! I couldn't tell if she was breathing or not. It seemed that my senses were working on the domino theory. With my hearing gone at least temporarily, the coordination of the other senses was gone as well. I patted her cheek lightly. Come on, Rachel, wake up. 
I didn't want to turn her over in case there were unseen injuries that I might aggravate. I patted her cheek again, this time harder. I put my hand on her back, hoping that I would feel the rise and fall of breath as I could with my daughter. Nothing. I put my ear to her back, but this was laughable considering my condition. It was just instinct moving ahead of logic. I was thinking that I had no choice and had to turn her over when I saw the fingers of her right hand twitch and then form a fist. Rachel suddenly lifted her head off the ground and groaned. It was loud enough that I could hear it. Rachel, are you all right? I... I'm... There's evidence in the trailer. We need it. Rachel, there is no trailer anymore. It's gone. She struggled to turn over and sit up. Her eyes opened wide at the sight of the burning debris of what had been the trailer. I could see that her pupils were dilated. She had a concussion. What did you do? she asked in an accusatory tone. It wasn't me. The place was rigged to go up. When you opened the bedroom door. Oh. She turned her head back and forth as if working a kink out of her neck. She saw the black cowboy hat on the ground next to her. What is this? His hat. You grabbed it on the way out. DNA? Hopefully, though I'm not sure what good it will be. She looked back at the flaming trailer bed. We were too close. I could feel the heat of the fire, but I still wasn't sure she should be moving. Rachel, why don't you lie back down? I think you have a concussion. You might have other injuries. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. She put her head down on the ground and just looked up at the sky. I decided that wasn't a bad position and did the same. It was like we were at the beach or something. If it had been night, we could have counted the stars. Before I could hear them coming, I felt the approach of the helicopters. A deep vibration in my chest made me look to the southern sky and I saw the two Air Force choppers coming over the top of Titanic Rock. I weakly raised an arm and waved them in. Chapter 34 What the hell happened out there? Special Agent Randall Alpert's face was rigid and almost purple. He had been waiting for them in the hangar at Nellis when the helicopter landed. His political instincts had apparently told him not to go to the scene himself. At all costs, he had to be able to distance himself from the blowback that would rise from the explosion in the desert and possibly reach all the way to Washington. Rachel Walling and Sherry Dye stood in the huge hangar and braced for the onslaught. Rachel didn't answer his question because she thought it was only the opener on a tirade. She was reacting slowly, her head still a bit fuzzy from the blast. Agent Walling, I asked you a question. He had rigged the trailer, Sherry Dye said. He knew she... I asked her, not you, Alpert barked. I want Agent Walling to tell me exactly why she could not follow orders and how this whole thing has gotten completely fucked up beyond recognition. Rachel raised her hands, palms out, as if to signify there was not a damn thing she could have done about what happened out there in the desert. We were going to wait for the ERT, she said, as Agent Dye instructed. We were on the periphery of the location, and that's when we realized it smelled like there was a body in there. And then we thought maybe there could be someone alive in there, somebody hurt. And how the hell did you get that idea simply because you smelled a dead body? Bosch thought he heard something. Oh, here we go. The old cry for help routine. No, he did. But it was the wind, I guess. Out there it picks up. The windows were left open. It must have created a sound that he heard. And what about you? Did you hear it? No, I didn't. Alpert looked at Di and then back at Rachel. She could feel his eyes burning through her, but she knew it was a good story and she wasn't going to blink. She and Bosch had worked it out. Bosch was beyond Alpert's reach. If she was acting on Bosch's alarm, she could not be faulted either. 
Alpert could rant and rave, but could do nothing more than that. You know what the problem with your story is. It's with your first word. We. You said we. There was no we. You were given an assignment of maintaining a cover on Bosch, not joining him in the investigation, not joining him in his car and driving up there, not questioning witnesses together and entering that trailer together. I understand that, but given the circumstances, I decided it was in the best interest of the investigation to pool our knowledge and resources. Quite frankly, Agent Albert Bosch was the one who found that place. We wouldn't have what we have right now if not for him. Don't kid yourself, Agent Walling. We would have gotten there. I know that, but velocity was a factor. You said so yourself after the morning briefing. The director was going before the cameras. I wanted to push the case so that he would have as much information as possible. Well, forget about that now. Now we don't know what we have. He postponed the news conference and has given us until noon tomorrow to figure out what we have out there. Sherry Dye cleared her voice and risked intruding again. That's impossible, she said. That's a well-done crispy critter out there. They're using multiple bags to get it out of there. An ID and cause of death is going to take weeks, if an ID and cause of death are even possible. Luckily, it appears that Agent Walling was able to obtain a DNA sampling from the body, and that would speed things. But we have no comparative evidence. We... Maybe you weren't listening ten seconds ago, Alpert said. But we don't have weeks. We've got less than twenty-four hours. He turned away from them and put his hands on his hips, striking a pose that showed the burden that weighed upon him as the only intelligent and savvy agent left on the planet. Then let us go back up there, Rachel said. Maybe in the debris we'll find something that— No, Alpert yelled. He spun back around to them. That won't be necessary, Agent Walling. You have done enough. I know Bacchus and I know the case. I should be out there. I decide who should be and shouldn't be out there. I want you to get back to the field office and start the paperwork on this fiasco. I want it on my desk by 8 a.m. tomorrow. I want a detailed listing of everything you saw inside that trailer. He waited to see if she would argue the order. Rachel remained silent, and this seemed to please him. Now, I've got the media all over this. What do we put out that doesn't give away the store and won't upstage the director tomorrow? Di shrugged. Nothing. Tell them the director will address it tomorrow. End of story. That won't work. We have to give them something. Don't give them Bacchus, Rachel said. Tell them agents wanted to speak to a man named Thomas Walling about a missing persons case. But Walling had rigged his trailer and it exploded while agents were on the premises. Alpert nodded. It sounded good to him. What about Bosch? I'd leave him out of it. We don't have any control over him. If a reporter got to him, he might lay the whole thing out. And the body. Do we say it was Walling? We say we don't know because we don't. Ideas forthcoming, so on and so forth. That should be enough. If the reporters go to the brothels, they'll get the whole story. No, they won't. We never told anyone the whole story. By the way, what happened to Bosch? Di answered that one. I uh, took his statement and released him. Last I saw, he was driving back to Vegas. He'll keep quiet about this? Di looked at Rachel and then back at Alpert. Put it this way, he isn't going to be looking to talk to anybody about it. And as long as we keep his name out of it, there will be no reason for anyone to go looking for him. Alpert nodded. He dug a hand into one of his pockets and came out with a cell phone. When we're finished here, I have to call Washington. Gut reaction time. Was that Bacchus in that trailer? Rachel hesitated, not wanting to respond first. At this point, there is no way to tell. Di said. If you're asking if you should tell the director that we got him, my answer right now is no, don't tell the director that. That could have been anybody in that trailer. For all we know, it was an eleventh victim, and we may never know who it was. Just somebody who went to one of the brothels and was intercepted by Bacchus. Alpert looked at Rachel, expecting her take. The fuse 
she said. What about it? It was long. It was like he wanted me to see the body but not get too close. But he also wanted me to get out of there. And? On the body there was a black cowboy hat. I remember there was a man on my plane from Rapid City in a black cowboy hat. For Christ's sake, you were flying from South Dakota. Doesn't everybody wear cowboy hats there? But he was there with me. I think this whole thing was a setup. The note in the bar, the long fuse, the photos in the trailer, and the black hat. He wanted me to get out of there in time to tell the world he was dead. Alpert didn't respond. He looked down at the phone in his hands. There's too much we don't know yet, Randall, Di offered. He shoved the phone back into his pocket. Very well. Agent Di, is your car here? Yes? Take Agent Walling to the field office now. They were dismissed, but not before Alpert looked at Rachel and threw one more grimace at her. Remember, Agent Walling, my desk by eight. You got it, Rachel said. Chapter 35 Eleanor Wish answered my knock, and that surprised me. She stepped back to let me in. Don't look at me that way, Harry, she said. You have this impression that I'm never here and that I work every night and leave her with Marisol. I don't. I work three or four nights a week, and that's usually it. I raised my hands in surrender, and she saw the bandage around my right palm. What happened to you? Cut myself on a piece of metal. What metal? It's a long story. That thing up in the desert today? I nodded. I should have known. Is that going to hurt you playing the saxophone? Bored with retirement, I had started taking lessons the year before from a retired jazz man I had come across on a case. One night, when things were good between Eleanor and me, I had brought the instrument with me and played her a tune called Lullaby. She had liked it. Actually, I haven't been playing anyway. How come? I didn't want to tell her that my teacher had died and music had dropped out of my life for a while. My teacher wanted me to switch from alto to tenor, as in tenor fifteen miles away from him. She smiled at the lame joke, and we left it at that. I had followed her through the house and into the kitchen, where the table was actually a felt-covered poker table, with cereal milk stains on it thanks to Maddie. Eleanor had dealt six hands face up for practice. She sat down and started gathering up the cards. Don't let me stop you, I said. I just came by to see if I could put Maddie to bed. Where is she? Marisol's giving her a bath. But I was counting on putting her to bed tonight. I've worked the last three nights. Oh, well, that's fine. I'll just say hello then, and goodbye. I'm driving back tonight. Then why don't you do it? I got a new book to read her. It's on the counter. No, Eleanor. I want you to do it. I just want to see her, because I don't know when I'll get back. Are you still working a case? No, that all sort of ended up there today. The TV news didn't have much on it when I watched. What is it? It's a long story. I didn't feel like telling it once again. I walked over to the counter to look at the book she had bought. It was called Billy's Big Day, and its cover showed a monkey standing on the highest step at an Olympic-style award ceremony. The gold medal was being put around his neck. A lion had received the silver and an elephant the bronze. Are you going back to join the department again? I was about to open the book, but I put it down and looked at Eleanor. I'm still thinking about it, but it's looking that way. She nodded as though it was a done deal. Any further thoughts from you on it? No, Harry. I want you to do what you want. I wondered why it was that when people tell you what you want them to tell you, it always comes with suspicion and second-guessing attached. Did Eleanor really want me to do what I wanted to do? Or was her saying that a way of undermining the whole thing? 
Before I could say anything, my daughter came into the kitchen and stood at attention. She wore blue and orange striped pajamas, and her dark hair was wet and slicked back on her head. Presenting a little girl, she said. Eleanor and I both broke out the smiles and simultaneously offered our opened arms for hugs. Maddie went to her mother first, and that was all right with me. But it felt a little like when you hold out your hand to someone to shake, and they don't see it or just plain ignore it. I lowered my arms, and after a few moments, Eleanor saved me. Go give Daddy a hug. Maddie came to me, and I lifted her up into a hug. She was no more than forty pounds. It is an amazing thing to be able to hold everything that is important to you in one arm. She put her damp head against my chest, and I didn't mind that she was getting my shirt wet. That was no problem at all. How are you, baby? I'm fine. I drew your picture today. You did? Can I see it? Put me down. I did as instructed, and she ran off out of the kitchen, her bare feet slapping on the stone tiles as she headed to the playroom. I looked at Eleanor and smiled. We both knew the secret. No matter what we had or didn't have for each other, we would always have Madeline, and that might be enough. The running of tiny feet could be heard again, and soon she was back in the kitchen, towing a piece of paper held high like a kite. I took it from her and studied it. It showed the figure of a man with a mustache and dark eyes. He had his hands out, and in one hand was a gun. On the other side of the page was another figure. This one was drawn in reds and oranges and had eyebrows drawn in a severe black V to indicate he was a bad guy. I crouched down to my daughter's height to look at the drawing with her. Is this me with the gun? Yes, because you're a please man. I nodded. She had said it like please man. And who's this mean guy? She pointed a tiny finger at the other figure on the drawing. That is Mr. Demon. I smiled. Who is Mr. Demon? He's a wrestler. Mummy says you wrestle with demons, and he's the boss of all of them. I see. I looked over her head at Eleanor and smiled. I wasn't mad about anything. I was simply in love with my daughter and how she viewed her world. The literal way in which she took it all in and took it on. I knew it wouldn't last long, and so I treasured every moment I saw and heard of it. Can I keep this picture? How come? Because it is beautiful, and I want to always have it. I have to go away for a while, and I want to be able to look at it all the time. It will remind me of you. Where are you going? I'm going back to the place they call the City of Angels. She smiled. That's silly. You can't see angels. I know. But look, Mummy has a new book to read to you about a monkey named Billy. So I'm going to say goodnight now, and I'll get back to see you as soon as I can. Is that okay, baby? Okay, Daddy. I kissed her on both cheeks and hugged her tight. Then I kissed the top of her head and let her go. I stood up with my picture and handed her the book Eleanor would read to her. Marisol, Eleanor called. Marisol appeared within a few seconds, as if she had been waiting in the nearby living room for her cue. I smiled and nodded to her as she received her instructions. Why don't you take Maddie in and get her set up, and I'll be right in after saying goodnight to her father. I watched my daughter leave with her nanny. I'm sorry about that, Eleanor said. What, the picture? Don't worry about it. I love it. It's going on my refrigerator. I just don't know where she picked it up. I didn't directly say to her that you fight demons. She must have overheard me on the phone or something. Somehow I would have liked it better knowing she had said it directly to our daughter. The idea that Eleanor was talking about me in such a way to someone else, someone she didn't mention at the moment, bothered me. I tried not to show it. It's all right, I said. Look at it this way. When she goes to school and kids say their dad is a lawyer or a fireman or a doctor or something, she's got the trump card. She'll tell them her daddy fights demons. 
Eleanor laughed, but then cut it off when she thought of something. I wonder what she'll say her mother does. I couldn't answer that, so I changed the subject. I love how her view of the world is uncluttered by deeper meanings, I said as I looked at the picture again. It is so innocent, you know? I know, I love that too, but I can understand if you don't want her thinking you're out there literally wrestling with demons. Why didn't you explain it to her? I shook my head and thought of a story. When I was a kid, and I was still with my mother, there was this time that she had a car, a two-tone Plymouth Belvedere with push-button automatic transmission. I think her lawyer gave it to her to use or something, for a couple of years. Anyway, she suddenly decided she wanted to go cross-country on a vacation. So we packed the car and just took off, her and me. Anyway, somewhere in the south, I don't remember where, we stopped for gas and there were two water fountains on the side of this service station. There were signs, you know. One said white, and the other said colored. And I just sort of went up to the one marked colored because I wanted to see what color the water was. Before I got to it, my mom yanked me back and sort of explained things to me. I remembered that and sort of wished she'd just let me see the water and didn't explain anything. Eleanor smiled at the story. How old were you? I don't know. About eight. She stood up then and came over to me. She kissed me on the cheek, and I let her. I put my arm loosely around her waist. Good luck with your demons, Harry. Yeah. If you ever change your mind about things, I'm here. We're here. I nodded. She's going to change your mind, Eleanor. You wait and see. She smiled, but in a sad way, and gently caressed my chin with her hand. Will you make sure the door's locked when you leave? Always. I let go of her and watched her walk out of the kitchen. I then looked down at the drawing of the man fighting his demon. In the picture, my daughter had put a smile on my face. Chapter 36 Before going up to my efficiency at the double X, I stopped by the office and told Mr. Gupta, the nightman, that I would be checking out. He told me that because I had been keeping the place on a weekly basis, my credit card had already been dinged for the entire week, and I told him that was fine, I was still leaving. I told him I would leave the key on the dinette table after I gathered up my belongings. I was about to leave the office when I hesitated and then asked him about my neighbor Jane. Yes, she's gone too. Same thing. What do you mean, same thing? We charge her for a week, but she not stay awake. Hey, do you mind me asking, what was her full name? I never got it. She is Jane Davis. You like? Yeah, she was nice. We talked on the balconies. I didn't get to say goodbye. She didn't leave a forwarding address or anything like that, did she? Gupta smiled at the prospect of this. He had very pink gums for someone with such dark skin. No address, he said. Not that one. I nodded my thanks for the information he had given me. I left the office and went up the stairs and then down the walkway to my room. It took me less than five minutes to gather my things. I had some shirts and pants on hangers. I then took out of the closet the same box in which I had brought everything and filled it with the rest of my belongings and a couple of toys I kept in the place for Maddie. Buddy Lockridge had been close, calling me Suitcase Harry, but Beer Box Harry would have been better. Before leaving, I checked the refrigerator and saw I had one bottle of beer left. I took it out and cranked it open. I figured one beer for the road wouldn't hurt me. I had done worse in the past before a drive. I thought about making another cheese sandwich, but skipped it when the thought reminded me of Bacchus's routine of eating grilled cheese sandwiches each day at Quantico. I went out onto the balcony with the beer for one last look at the rich men's jets. It was a cool and crisp evening. 
The blue lights on the far runway twinkled like sapphires. The two black jets were gone, their owners either quick winners or losers. The big gulf stream remained in place, red dust caps over the intakes on its jet engines. It was settled in. I wondered what the jets might have had to do with Jane Davis and her stay at the double X. I looked over at Jane's empty balcony, just four feet from my own. The ashtray was sitting on the railing, and I could see it was still filled with half-smoked butts. Her unit had not been cleaned yet, and that gave me an idea. I looked around and down at the parking lot. I saw no human movement except for out on Koval, where the traffic was stalled at a traffic light. I saw no sign of the night security man or anyone else in the parking lot. I quickly hoisted myself up onto the railing and was about to climb across to the next balcony when I heard a knock on my door. I quickly dropped back down and went in and answered the door. It was Rachel Wallet. Rachel? Hello? Is something wrong? No, nothing that catching Bacchus couldn't cure. Can I come in? Sure. I stepped back to let her enter. She saw the box with my belongings piled into it. I spoke first. How did it go today when you got back into town? Well, I got the usual tongue lashing from the SAC. Did you lay it all on me? As planned. He fumed and fussed, but what's he going to do? I don't want to talk about him right now. Then what? Well, for starters, do you have another one of those? She meant the beer. Actually, no, I was just finishing this one and was going to take off. Then I'm glad I caught you. You want to split it? I'll get you a glass. You said you wouldn't trust the glasses here. Well, I could wash. She reached over for the bottle and took a sip from it. She handed it back, her eyes staying on mine. She then turned and pointed to the box. So, you're leaving? Yeah, back to L.A. for a while. You'll miss your daughter, I guess. A lot. You'll come back to see her? As often as I can. That's nice. Anything else? What do you mean? I asked, though I thought I knew what she meant. Will you be coming back for anything else? No, just my daughter. We stood there looking at each other for a long moment. I held the beer out to her, but when she came forward, it was for me. She kissed me on the lips and then quickly we put our arms around each other. I know it had something to do with the trailer, our nearly dying together out there in the desert, that made us press so hard against each other and move toward the bed, that made me reach over and put the beer bottle on the table so I could use both my hands as we pulled at each other's clothes. We fell onto the bed and made survivors love. It was quick and maybe to some degree even brutal on both our parts but most of all it satisfied the primal urge in both of us to fight death with life. When it was over, we were entwined on top of the bed covers, she on top of me, my fists still tangled in her hair. She leaned to her left and reached for the beer bottle, knocking it over first and spilling most of what was left on the bed table and floor. There goes my security deposit, I said. There was enough left in the bottle for her to take a draw and then pass it to me. That was for today, she said as I drank. I gave her the rest. What do you mean? After what happened out there, we had to do this. Yeah. Gladiator love. That's why I came here, to catch you. I smiled, thinking of a gladiator joke from an old movie I liked. But I didn't tell her, and she probably thought I was smiling at her words. She leaned down and put her head on my chest. I held up some of her hair, more gently this time, to look at the singed ends. I then moved my hands down and rubbed her back, thinking it was strange that we were being so gentle with each other now, just moments after being gladiators. I don't suppose you'd be interested in opening a branch of your private investigations office in South Dakota, would you? I smiled and stifled a laugh in my chest. How about North Dakota? she asked. I could be going back there, too. 
You have to have a tree to have a branch. She hit me with a gentle fist on the chest. I didn't think so. I shifted my body so that I came out of her. She groaned but stayed on top of me. Does that mean you want me to get up and get off and get out of here? No, Rachel, not at all. I looked over her shoulder and saw that the door was unlocked. I had a vision of Mr. Gupta coming up to see if I had left yet and finding the two-backed monster on the bed in the supposedly empty unit. I smiled. I didn't care. She raised her face up to look at me. What? Nothing. We left the door unlocked. Somebody could come in. You left it unlocked. This is your place. I kissed her, realizing I had not kissed her lips during the entire time we had made love. Another strange thing. You know what, Bosch? What? You're good at this. I smiled and told her thanks. A woman can play that card any time and every time and always get the same response. I mean it. She dug her nails into my chest to underline her point. With one arm I held her tightly to me, and we rolled over. I figured I had at least ten years on her, but I wasn't worried about it. I kissed her again and got up, gathering my clothes off the floor and walking over to the door to lock it. I think there's one last clean towel in there, I said. You can use it. She insisted I take the first shower, and I did. Then while she showered, I left the unit and walked across Koval to a convenience store to pick up two more beers. I was going to limit it to that because I was driving that night and didn't want alcohol to slow me down getting to the road or while on it. I was sitting at the dinette when she came out of the bathroom fully dressed and smiling when she saw the two bottles. I knew you'd make yourself useful. She sat down and we clicked bottles. To gladiator love, she said. We drank and just were quiet for a few moments. I was trying to figure out what the last hour now meant to me and to us. What are you thinking about? she asked. About how this could get complicated. It doesn't have to. We can just see what happens. That didn't sound the same to me as being asked to move to the Dakotas. Okay. I better get going. Where to? Back to the F.O., I guess. See what's shaking. Did you hear what happened to the fire barrel out there after the blast? I forgot to look. No, why? I looked in it when we were out there for just a minute. It looked like he had been burning credit cards, maybe IDs. The victims? Probably. He burned books in it, too. Books? Why do you think he did that? I don't know, but it's strange. Inside the trailer, he had books all over the place. So he burned some, and some he didn't burn. Seems strange. Well, if there's anything left of the barrel, the ERT will get to it. Why didn't you mention it before when you were interviewed out there? Because my head was ringing and I sort of forgot, I guess. Short-term memory loss associated with concussion. I don't have a concussion. I meant the blast. Could you tell what books they were? Not really. I didn't have time. There was one I picked out. It was the least burned of what I could see. It looked like it was poetry, I think. She looked at me and nodded, but didn't say anything. What I don't get is why he burned the books. He set the whole trailer to go up, but he takes the time to go out to the barrel and burn some books. Almost like... I stopped talking and tried to put the pieces together. Almost like what, Harry? I don't know, like he didn't want to leave the trailer thing to chance. He wanted to make sure those books were destroyed. You are assuming that both things are together. Who knows? Maybe he burned the books six months ago or something. You can't just connect the two things. I nodded. She was right about that. But still the incongruity bothered me. The book I found was near the top of the barrel, I said. It was burned the last time the barrel was used. There was also a receipt in it, half-burned. But maybe they can trace it. When I get back, I'll check it out. But I don't remember seeing that barrel after the blast. I shrugged. 
Neither do I. She stood up, and so did I. There's one other thing, I said as I reached into the inside pocket of my jacket. I pulled out the photo and handed it to her. I must have grabbed it while I was in the trailer and then sort of forgot about it. I found it in my pocket. It was the photo taken from the printer tray, the two-story house with the old man out front next to the station wagon. Great, Harry. How am I going to explain this? I don't know, but I figured you'd want to try to ID the place or the old man. What's the difference now? Come on, Rachel, you know it's not over. No, I don't know that. It bothered me that she could not talk to me after we had been so intimate just a few minutes before. Okay. I picked up my box and the clothing I had on hangers. Wait a minute, Harry. You're just going to leave it like that? What do you mean it's not over? I mean we both know that wasn't Bacchus in there. If you and the Bureau aren't interested in it, that's fine, but don't bullshit me, Rachel. Not after what we went through today, and not after what we just did. She relented. Look, Harry, it's out of my hands, okay? Right now we are waiting on forensics to make a call on it. The Bureau's official position probably won't be formulated until tomorrow when the Director holds a press conference. I'm not interested in the official position of the Bureau. I was talking to you. Harry, what do you want me to say? I want you to say you're going to get this guy, no matter what the director says tomorrow. I headed to the door, and she followed. We left the efficiency, and she pulled the door closed for me. Where's your car? I asked. I'll walk you over. She pointed the way, and we went down the steps and to her car parked near the office. After she opened the door, we turned and faced each other. I want to get this guy, she said. More than you could know. Okay, good. I'll be in touch. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. When I do, I'll let you know. Okay. See you, Bosch. Goodbye, Rachel. She kissed me, and then she got in the car. I walked to my car, ducking between the two buildings that made up the double X to get to the other parking lot. I was pretty sure it was not the last time I would see Rachel Walling. Chapter 37 On the way out of town, I could have avoided the traffic of the Strip, but I decided not to. I thought all the lights might cheer me up. I knew I was leaving my daughter behind. I was going to Los Angeles to rejoin the department. I would see my daughter again, but I wouldn't be able to spend the kind of time with her I needed and wanted to. I was leaving to join the depressing legions of weekend fathers, the men who have to compress their love and duty into twenty-four-hour stands with their children. The thought of it raised a dark dread in my chest that a billion kilowatts of light could not cut through. There was no doubt I was leaving Las Vegas as a loser. Once I cleared the lights and the city limits, the traffic grew sparse and the skies dark. I tried to ignore the depression my choice had put upon me. Instead, I worked the case as I drove, following the logic of the moves from the perspective of Bacchus, grinding it down until the story was smooth powder and I had only unanswered questions left. I saw it the same way the Bureau did. Bacchus, having adopted the name Tom Walling, was living in clear and preying on the customers he drove from the brothels. He operated with impunity for years because he chose the perfect victims. That is, until the numbers went against him and investigators from Vegas started to see a pattern and put together their list of six missing men. Bacchus probably knew that it was only a matter of time before the connection might be made to clear. He probably knew that that time would be even shorter once he saw Terry McCaleb's name in the newspaper. Maybe he even got wind that McCaleb had gone to Vegas. Maybe McCaleb had even gone up to clear. Who knows? Most of the answers died with McCaleb, and then in that trailer in the desert. There were so many unknowns in this story. But what did seem obvious from this point was that Bacchus had closed up shop. 
he made plans to end his desert run in a blaze of glory, to take out his two protégés, McCaleb and Rachel, in a pathological display of mastery, and to leave behind in his trailer a burned and destroyed body that would beg the question of whether he was alive or dead. In recent years, Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden had gotten good mileage by leaving behind the same question. Maybe Bacchus saw himself on the same stage. The books in the fire barrel bothered me the most. Despite Rachel's dismissing them because the circumstances of their burning were unknown, it still seemed like an important piece of the investigation to me. I wished I had spent more time studying the book I had pulled out, maybe even identifying it. The burned book gave an indication of a part of the poet's plan nobody knew about yet. Remembering the partial receipt I'd seen in the book, I opened my cell phone, checked to make sure I had service, and called information for Las Vegas. I asked if there was a listing for a business called Book Car, and the operator told me there was not. I was about to hang up when she told me there was, however, a listing for a store called Book Caravan on Industry Road. I told her I would try it, and she connected me. I guessed that the store would be closed because it was almost midnight. I was hoping for a message machine on which I could ask the owner to call me in the morning. But the call was answered after two rings by a gruff voice. You're open? Twenty-four hours. How can I help you? I got an idea what kind of store it was by the hours. I took a shot anyway. You don't sell any books of poetry there, do you? The gruff man laughed. Very funny, he said. There once was a man from Timbuktu. As far as poetry goes, fuck you. He laughed again and hung up on me. I closed the phone and had to smile at his on-the-spot rhyming skill. Book Caravan seemed like a dead end, but I would call Rachel in the morning and tell her it might be worth checking for connections to Bacchus. A green highway sign came out of the darkness and into the spray of my headlights. Zizek's Road, One Mile I thought about pulling off and driving down the bouncing desert road into the darkness. I wondered if there was still a forensic crew on duty at the burial site. But what would the point of going down that road be other than to engage with the ghosts of the dead? The mile came and went, and I drove on by the exit leaving the ghosts alone. The beer and a half I'd had with Rachel proved to be a mistake. By Victorville, I was growing fatigued, too much thinking with the added mix of alcohol. I pulled off for coffee in a McDonald's that was open late and designed to look like a train depot. I bought two coffees and two sugar cookies and sat in a booth in an old train car, reading through Terry McCaleb's file on the poet investigation. I was getting to know the order of reports and their summaries just about by heart. After one cup of coffee, I had nothing going and closed the file. I needed something new. I needed to either let it go and hope and believe the Bureau would get the job done or find a new angle to pursue. I'm not against the Bureau. My take is that it's the most thorough, well-equipped, and relentless law enforcement agency in the world. Its problems lie in its size and the many cracks in communication between offices, squads, and so on down the line to the agents themselves. It only takes a debacle like 9-11 to make clear to the world what most people in the law enforcement world, including the FBI agents, already know. As an institution, it cares too much about its reputation and it carries too much weight in politics, going all the way back to J. Edgar Hoover himself. Eleanor Wish once knew an agent who had been assigned to Washington headquarters back during the time J. Edgar ruled the place. He said the unspoken law was that if an agent was in an elevator and the director got on, the agent was not allowed to address him, even to say hello, and was required to immediately step off so the big man could ride alone and ponder his great responsibilities. That story always stuck with me for some reason. I think because it carries the perfect arrogance of the FBI. 
The bottom line was I didn't want to call Graciela McCaleb and tell her that her husband's killer was still out there and that the FBI would handle it. I still wanted to handle it. I owed that to her and to Terry, and I always paid what I owed. Back on the road, the coffee and sugar got me going again, and I pressed on toward the City of Angels. When I hit the 10 freeway, I also hit the rain, and traffic slowed to a crawl. I flipped on the radio to KFWB and learned it had rained all day and wasn't expected to stop until the end of the week. There was a live report from Topanga Canyon where residents were sandbagging their doors and garages, expecting the worse. Mudslides and flooding were the dangers. The catastrophic fires that swept through the hills the year before had left little ground cover to hold the rain or soil. It was all coming down. I knew the weather would cost me an extra hour getting home. I checked my watch. It was just past midnight. I had planned to wait until getting home to call Kiz Ryder, but decided it might be too late to call by then. I opened my phone and called her at home. She picked up right away. Kiz, it's Harry. You up? Sure, Harry. I can't sleep when it rains. I know what you mean. So, what's the good word? Everybody counts or nobody counts. Which means? I'm in if you're in. Come on, Harry, don't put that on me. I'm in if you're in. Come on, man, I'm already in. You know what I mean. This is your salvation, Kiz. We got sidetracked, we both did. You and I know what we should be doing. It's time we both went back to it. I waited. There was a long period of silence from her. Then finally she spoke. This is going to upset the man. He's got me on a lot of things. If he's the man you say he is, he'll understand. He'll get it. You'll be able to make him get it. More silence. Okay, Harry, okay. I'm in. All right, then. I'll come down tomorrow and sign up. All right, Harry. I'll see you then. You knew I'd call, didn't you? Put it this way. I have the papers you have to fill out sitting on my desk. You were always too smart for me. I meant what I said about us needing you. That's the bottom line. But I also didn't think you'd last long out there on your own. I know guys who have pulled the pin and gone the P.I. route, sold real estate, cars, appliances, even books. It worked fine for most of them, but not you, Harry. I figured you knew that, too. I didn't say anything. I was staring into the darkness beyond the reach of my lights. Something Kiz had just said triggered the avalanche. Harry, you still there? Yeah, listen, Kiz. You just said books. We knew a guy who retired and sold books. Is that Ed Thomas? Yeah, I came to Hollywood about six months before he put in his papers. He left and opened a bookstore down in Orange. I know. You ever been there? Yeah, one time he had Dean Kuntz signing one of his books there. I saw it in the paper. He's my favorite, and he doesn't sign books too many places, so I went down. There was a line out the door and down the sidewalk, but as soon as Ed saw me, he ushered me right on up to the front, and he introduced me, and I got my book signed. It was embarrassing, actually. What's the name of it? Mm, I think it was Strange Highways. That deflated me. I thought I was about to make a leap in logic and a connection. No, actually, it was after that, Kiz said. It was Soul Survivor, the, the plane crash story. I realized what she was saying and how we'd gotten confused. No, Kiz, what's the name of Ed's bookstore? Oh, it's called Book Carnival. I think that was what it was called when he bought the business. Otherwise, I think he'd have called it something else, something mysterious, since he sells mostly mystery books there. Book Car, as in Book Carnival. I involuntarily pressed the accelerator down harder. Kiz, I gotta go. I'll talk to you later. I closed the phone without waiting for a goodbye from her. 
Glancing between the road and the phone's display, I scrolled through my recent calls list and pressed the connect button after highlighting Rachel Walling's cell number. She answered before I even heard it ring. Rachel, it's Harry. Sorry to call so late, but it's important. I'm in the middle of something, she whispered. You're at the field office still? That's right. I tried to think of what would keep her there after midnight on a day that had started so early. Is it the trash barrel, the burn book? No, we haven't gotten there yet. It's something else. I have to go. Her voice was somber, and because she had not used my name, I got the idea there were other agents present and that whatever she was in the middle of was not good. Rachel, listen, I have something. You have to come to L.A. Her tone changed. I think she could tell by the urgency in my voice that this was serious. What is it? I know the poet's next move. Chapter 38 I'll have to call you back. Rachel closed her phone and slid it into the pocket of her blazer. Bosch's last words echoed in her heart. Agent Walling, I'd appreciate it if you could stay in our conversation. She looked up at Alpert. Sorry. She looked past him at the telecommunication screen where Brass Duran's face was larger than life. She was smiling. Agent Duran, continue, Alpert said. Actually, I'm finished. That's all we have at this time. We can confirm through the latents that Robert Bacchus was at that trailer. We cannot confirm that he was in it when it exploded. What about the DNA? The DNA evidence gathered by Agent Walling, at great danger, I might add, and later by the ERT, will only be useful if we have something to compare it with. That is, if we somehow find a source of Robert Bacchus's DNA or we use it to identify the body that was in the trailer as someone else. What about Bacchus's parents? Can't we extract his DNA from... We went that route before. His father was dead and cremated before we thought of it. The science wasn't really there back then, and his mother has never been located. There is some thought that she might have been his first victim. She disappeared some years ago without the proverbial trace. This guy thought of everything. In the case of the mother, it was more likely a revenge thing for her abandonment. It is hard to believe that he did something back then in order to prevent later DNA extraction. All I meant was that we are genuinely fucked. I am sorry, Randall, but the science can only go so far. I know that, Agent Durant. Can you tell me anything else? Anything new? I guess not. Terrific. Okay. So then I will tell the director just that. That we know Bacchus was in that trailer. We have forensics and witness accounts to that effect. But as of this time, we cannot take the next step and say he is dead and good riddance. Is there no way we can convince the director to sit tight and give us more time to sew it all up for the good of the investigation? Rachel almost laughed. She knew the good of the investigation would always take second place to political considerations in the Hoover Building in D.C. I have already tried, Albert said. The answer is no. There is too much at stake. The cat is out of the bag on this, thanks to the explosion in the desert. If that was Bacchus blown to bits out there, then fine, we'll eventually confirm it and everything will be fine. If that was not Bacchus and he has some other play in mind... The director has to get on record with this now, or the consequences of the blowback could be fatal. So, he is going on record with what we know now. Bacchus was there. Bacchus is the suspect in the killings in the desert. Bacchus may or may not be dead. There is no dissuading him at this point. Alpert had thrown Rachel a look when he said the cat was out of the bag, as if he held her responsible for everything. She thought about revealing what Bosch had just told her, but in that instant decided against it. Not yet. Not until she knew more. Okay, people, that's it, Alpert announced abruptly. 
Brass, we'll see you on the big screen tomorrow morning. Agent Walling, can you stay behind for a moment? Rachel watched Brass leave the screen, and then it went black. The transmission ended. Alpert then walked up close to the table where Rachel sat. Agent Walling. Yes? Your work is done here. Excuse me? You're finished. Go back to your hotel and pack your bags. There's still a lot to do here. I want to— I don't care what you want. I want you out of here. You have undermined this investigation since you arrived. Tomorrow morning I want you on the first plane back to wherever it is you come from. Understand? You are making a mistake. I should be a part of— You are making a mistake arguing with me about it. I can't make it any clearer for you. I want you out of here. Turn in your paperwork and get on a plane. She stared at him, trying to communicate all the anger that was behind her eyes. He held a hand up as if to ward something off. Be careful what you say. It could come back to bite you on the ass. Rachel swallowed back her anger. She spoke in a controlled and calm voice. I'm not going anywhere. Alpert looked like his eyes might pop out of his head. He turned and waved Di out of the room. He then turned back to Rachel and waited for the sound of the door closing. Excuse me, what did you just say? I said, I am not going anywhere. I am staying on this case, because if you put me on a plane, I won't go back to South Dakota. I'll go to D.C. headquarters and right into the Office of Professional Responsibility to file on you. For what? What are you going to file? You've used me as bait since the beginning, without my knowledge or consent. You don't know what you're talking about. Go ahead. Go to the OPR. They'll laugh you back to the Badlands and put you down for another ten years out there. Sherry made a mistake, and then you did too. When I called in from Clear, she asked me why we took Bosch's car. Then in the hangar, you did the same thing. You knew I'd gone up there in Bosch's car. I started thinking about that, and then I figured out why. You put a GPS tag on my car. I went underneath it tonight and found it. Standard Bureau issue. Even has the code label still on it. There will be a record of who checked it out. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I'm sure the OPR will be able to figure it out. My guess is Sherry will help them. I mean, if I were her, I wouldn't tie my career to you. I'd tell the truth, that you brought me out here as bait, that you thought I would draw Bacchus out. I bet you had a shadow team on me the whole time. There'll be a record of that, too. What about my phone and my hotel room? Did you bug them? Rachel saw Alpert's eyes change. He went inward, his mind no longer consumed by her accusations but by the future consequences of an ethics complaint and investigation. She saw him recognize his own doom. One agent bugging and following another agent, using her as unwitting bait in a high-stakes gamble. Under the current climate of media scrutiny and bureau-wide avoidance of any controversy, his actions wouldn't hold up. It would be he who would go down, not her. Quickly and quietly, he would be dealt with. Maybe, if he was lucky, he'd end up working side by side with Rachel in the Rapid City office. The Badlands are really quite beautiful in the summer, she said. She stood up and headed to the door. Agent Walling, Alpert said to her back, hold on a second. Chapter 39 Rachel's plane landed a half-hour late at Burbank because of the rain and wind. It had not let up through the night, and the city was cast in a shroud of gray. It was the kind of rain that paralyzed the city. Traffic moved at a crawl on every street and every freeway. The roads weren't built for it. The city wasn't either. By dawn, the stormwater culverts were overflowing. The tunnels were at capacity and the runoff to the Los Angeles River had turned the concrete-lined canal that snaked through the city to the sea 
into a roaring rapids. It was black water, carrying with it the ash of the fires that had blackened the hills the year before. There was an end-of-the-world gloom about it all. The city had been tested by fire first, and now rain. Living in L.A. sometimes felt like riding shotgun with the devil to the apocalypse. People I saw that morning carried a what's-next look in their eyes. Earthquake? Tsunami? Or maybe a disaster of our own making? A dozen years earlier, fire and rain had been the harbingers of both tectonic and social upheaval in the City of Angels. I didn't think there was anybody here who doubted it could happen again. If we are doomed to repeat ourselves in our follies and mistakes, then it is easy to see nature and balance operating on the same cycle. I thought about this as I waited for Rachel at the curb outside the terminal. The rain pounded the windshield, turning it translucent and murky. The wind rocked the car on its springs. I thought about rejoining the cops, already second-guessing my decision and wondering if I would be repeating myself in folly or if I had a chance this time at grace. I didn't see Rachel in the rain until she knocked on the passenger side window. She then opened the back hatch and threw in her bag. She was wearing a green parka with the hood up. It must have done her well facing the elements in the Dakotas, but it looked too large and bulky on her in L.A. This better be good, Bosch, she said as she climbed in and dropped wetly onto the passenger seat. She showed no outward sign of affection, and neither did I. It was one of the agreements we'd made on the phone. We were to act as professionals until we played my hunch out. Why, you got alternatives? No, it's just that I put everything on the line last night with Alpert. I'm one fuck up short of a permanent posting in South Dakota where, by the way, the weather might actually be nicer than this. Well, welcome to L.A. I thought this was Burbank. Technically. After we cleared the airport, I dropped down to the 134 and took that east to the 5. Between the rain and the morning rush hour, our progress was slow as we skirted around Griffith Park and pointed south. I wasn't ready to begin worrying about time yet, but I was getting close. For a long time, we rode silently because the mix of rain and traffic made the drive intense, probably more so for Rachel, who had to sit and do nothing while I had control of the wheel. Finally, she spoke, if only to siphon off some of the tension in the car. So, are you going to tell me this grand plan of yours? No plan, just a hunch. No, you said you knew his next move, Bosch. I noticed that since we had made love on the bed of my efficiency unit, she had started calling me by my last name. I wondered if this was part of the agreement to act as professionals or some form of reverse endearment, calling someone you had been most intimate with by his least intimate name. I had to get you here, Rachel. Well, all right then, I'm here. Tell it to me. It's the poet who has the grand plan. Bacchus. What's he going to do? Remember the books I told you about yesterday, the books in the barrel and the one I pulled out? Yes? I think I figured out what it all means. I told her about the partially burned receipt I had seen and how I thought Book Car was actually Book Carnival, the bookstore operated by retired police detective Ed Thomas, the last intended target of the poet eight years before. You think because of this book in the fire barrel that he's here and is going to make good on the killing we took away from him eight years ago? Exactly. That's a stretch, Bosch. I wish you had told me all of this before I risked my ass flying over here. There's no such thing as coincidence, especially like this. Okay, run the story out for me then. Give me the profile. Tell me the poet's grand plan. Well, that's the Bureau's job to profile crimes. I'm not going to do that. But this is what I think he's doing. I think the trailer and the explosion were all set up to look like the grand finale. And then, as soon as the director steps in front of the television cameras and says, I think we've got him, 
he's going to take out Ed Thomas. The symbolism would be perfect. It's the grand gesture, the ultimate fuck you. It's checkmate, Rachel. While the Bureau is bragging about itself, he moves in right under their noses and takes out the guy the Bureau was all puffed up about saving the last time. And why the books in the barrel? How does all that fit in? I think they were books he bought from Ed Thomas. From Book Carnival by mail order or maybe even in person. Maybe they were marked in some way and could be traced back to the store. He didn't want that, so he burned them. He couldn't risk that they might survive the trailer blast. But then, on the other end, after Ed Thomas is gone and Bacchus has split, the agents would find his connection to the store and would begin to see how long and how hard Bacchus was planning this. It would help show his genius. That's what he wants, right? I mean, you were the profiler. Tell me if I'm wrong. I was the profiler. Right now I handle Indian crimes in the Dakotas. The traffic was starting to open up as we passed by downtown, the spires of the financial district disappearing in the upper mist of the storm. The city always looked haunting in the rain to me. There was a foreboding sense about it that always depressed me, that always made me feel like something had broken loose in the world and was wrong. There is only one thing wrong with all of that, Bosch. What? The director is holding a press conference today but he isn't going to say we caught the poet. Just like you, we don't think that was Bacchus in that trailer. So, Bacchus doesn't know that. He'll watch it on CNN like everybody else. But it won't change his plan. Either way, I say he hits Ed Thomas today. Either way, he makes his point. I am better and smarter than you. She nodded and thought about that for a long moment. Okay, she finally said. What if I'm buying it? What is our play? Have you called Ed Thomas? I don't know what our play is yet, and I haven't called Ed Thomas. We're heading toward his store now. It's down in Orange, and he opens up at 11. I called and got his hours off the answering machine. Why his store? All the other cops back as killed were in their homes. One in his car. Because at the moment I don't know where Ed Thomas lives. And because of the book. My guess is Bacchus will make his move at the bookstore. If I'm wrong and Ed doesn't show up at the store, then we find out where he lives and go there. Rachel nodded in agreement with the plan. There were three different books written on the poet case. I read them all and they all had postscripts on the players. They said Thomas retired and opened a bookstore. I think one even named the store. There you go. She looked at her watch. Are we going to make it there before he opens? We'll make it. Did they set a time for the director's press conference? Three o'clock, D.C. time. I checked the dash clock. It was 10 a.m. We had an hour before Ed Thomas opened for business and two hours before the press conference. If my theory and hunch were correct, we would be in the presence of the poet very soon. I was ready. And I was juiced. I felt the high octane moving in my blood. By old habit, I dropped my hand off the wheel and checked my hip. I had a Glock 27 holstered there. It was illegal for me to be carrying a weapon, and if I ended up using it, there could be trouble, the kind that could prevent me from rejoining the police department. But sometimes the risks you face dictate the other risks you must take. And my guess was that this was going to be one of those times. Chapter 40 The rain made it hard to watch the store. If we had left the windshield wipers on, it would have been a dead giveaway. So we watched at first through the murk of water on glass. We were parked in the lot of a strip shopping center on Tustin Boulevard in the city of Orange. Book Carnival was a small business between a rock shop and what looked like a vacant slot. Three doors down was a gun store. There was a single public entrance. Before taking our position in the front lot, we had driven behind the shopping center and seen a rear door with the store's name on it. There was a doorbell and a sign that said, Ring Bell for Deliveries. 
In a perfect world, we'd have been on the front and back of the store with a minimum of four sets of eyes. Bacchus could come in either way, posing as a customer through the front or as a delivery man through the back. But nothing was perfect about the world on this day. It was raining, and it was just the two of us. We parked the Mercedes at a distance from the front of the store, but still close enough to see and act, if necessary. The front counter and cash register were just behind the front window of Book Carnival. This worked in our favor. Shortly after we watched him open the store for business, we watched Ed Thomas take a position behind the counter. He put a cash drawer into the register and made some phone calls. Even with the rain and the blurring of the windshield, we could keep him in view as long as he stayed at the register. It was the recesses of the store behind him that disappeared in the gloom. On the occasions that he left his post and walked back toward the shelves and displays in the rear, we lost sight of him, and the tingling sense of panic took hold. On the way down, Rachel had told me about the discovery of the GPS tag on her car and the confirmation that she had been used by fellow agents as bait for Bacchus. And now here we sat watching a former colleague of mine, in a way using him as the new bait. It didn't sit well with me. I wanted to go in and tell Ed the crosshairs were on him, that he should take a vacation, get out of town. But I didn't because I knew if Bacchus was watching Thomas and saw any deviation in the norm, then we might lose our only chance at him. So Rachel and I got selfish with Ed Thomas's life, and I knew in the days ahead I would deal with the guilt from that. The only question was, depending on how things turned out, how much guilt there would be. The first two customers of the day were women. They arrived shortly after Thomas had unlocked the front door. And while they were browsing in the store, a man pulled up, parked in front, and went in as well. He was too young to be Bacchus, so we didn't go to full alert. He left in a hurry and without purchasing a book. Then, when the two women left, clutching their bags of books, I got out of the Mercedes and ran across the lot to the overhang in front of the gun shop. Rachel and I had decided not to bring Thomas into our investigation, but that wasn't going to stop me from going into the store on a reconnaissance mission. We decided that I would go into the store with a cover story, nonchalantly reacquaint myself with Thomas, and see if he might already be alert to the idea that he was being watched. So once the first customers of the day had come and gone, I made the move. I first ducked into the gun store, since it was the store closest to where we had parked, and it would have looked odd to anyone watching the shopping plaza for me to park on one end and go directly to the bookstore at the other end. I took a cursory look at the gleaming firearms displayed in the glass counter and then up at the paper shooting targets on the back wall. They had the usual silhouettes, but they also had versions featuring the faces of Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. I guessed that these were the big sellers. When a man behind the counter asked if I needed help, I told him I was just browsing, and then walked out of the store. I walked down toward Book Carnival, stopping first to check out the empty storefront next door. Through the soaped glass, I could see boxes marked with what I guessed were the titles of books. I realized Thomas was using the slot for storing books. There was a for lease sign and a phone number, which I committed to memory in case it played into an angle we would work later. I entered Book Carnival, and Ed Thomas was behind the counter. I smiled, and he smiled in recognition, but I could tell that it took a few seconds for him to place the face he recognized. Harry Bosch, he said once he had it. Hey, Ed, how are you doing? We shook hands, and his eyes behind the glasses had a warmth to them I liked. I was pretty sure I hadn't seen him since his retirement dinner at the Sportsman's Lodge up in the valley six or seven years before. There was more white than not in his hair, but he was still tall and thin like I remembered him from the job. He had a tendency at crime scenes to hold his notebook up high and close to his face when he was writing. This was because his glasses were always a prescription or two behind his eyes. The arm's high pose got him the nickname of the Praying Mantis around the homicide table. I suddenly remembered that now. 
I remember the flyer for his retirement party showed a caricature of Ed as a superhero with a cape and a mask and a large P on his chest. How's the book business doing? It's doing good, Harry. What brings you down here from the Big Bad City? I heard you retired a couple of years ago. Yeah, I did, but I'm thinking about going back. You miss it? Yeah, I, I sort of do. We'll see what happens. He seemed surprised, and I knew then that he didn't miss a thing about the job. He'd always been a reader, always had a box of paperbacks in the trunk for surveillances and while sitting on wiretaps. Now he had his pension and his bookstore. He was doing well without all of the nastiness of the job. You just passing by? No, actually, I came here for a real reason. You remember my old partner, Kiz Ryder? Yeah, sure, she's been in here before. That's what I mean. She's been helping me with something, and I want to get her a little gift. I remember she told me once that your store was like the only place around where you could get a book signed by a writer named Dean Kuntz. So I was wondering if you got any of those around. I'd like to get her one. I think I might have something left in the back. Let me go check. Those things go fast, but I usually keep a stash. He left me at the counter and walked through the store to a door at the back that appeared to lead to a stockroom. I assumed the rear delivery door was back there. When he was out of sight, I leaned over the counter and looked at the shelves beneath. I saw a small video display tube with its screen cut into four segments. There were four interior camera angles showing the cash register area, with me leaning over the counter, a long view of the entire store, a tighter view of a group of shelves, and the rear stockroom, where I could see Thomas looking at a similar VDT tube on a shelf. I realized he was looking at me leaning over his counter. I straightened up, my mind quickly trying to come up with an explanation. A few moments later, Thomas came back to the counter carrying a book. Find what you were looking for, Harry? What? Oh, you mean me looking over the counter? I was just sort of wondering if you, you know, had any protection back there, you being a former cop and all. You ever worry about somebody coming in here who you knew from back when? You mean like Russ Custer? Custer was a fabled Hollywood division detective who trained a lot of people on the homicide table. One night after work, he walked into a bar to wait out rush hour, and there was a man sitting there he'd put in prison many years before. By the time Custer recognized him, it was too late. They both died in the shootout. Yeah, something like that. I take precautions, Harry. Don't worry about that. I nodded. Good to hear. Is that the book? Yeah. Does she have this one? It came out last year. He showed me a book called The Face. I didn't know if Kiss had it or not, but I was going to buy it. I don't know. Did he sign it? Yeah, signed and dated. Okay, I'll take it. While he rang up the sale, I tried some small talk, which really wasn't small talk. I saw you have the camera set up underneath there. Seems like a little much for a bookstore. You'd be surprised. People like to steal books. I got a collectible section back there, expensive stuff from the collections I buy and sell. I keep a camera right on it, and I caught a kid in there just this morning, trying to shove a copy of Nick's trip down his pants. Early Pelicanos is tough to find. That would have been about a $700 loss for me. That seemed like an inordinate amount of money for a single book. I had never heard of the book, but guessed that it must have been fifty or a hundred years old. You call the cops? Nah, I just kicked him in the pants and told him if he came back again, I would call the law. You're a nice guy, Ed. You must have mellowed out since you left. I don't think the praying mantis would have just let the kids slide. I handed him two twenties, and he gave me the change. The praying mantis was a long time ago, and my wife doesn't think I'm so mellow. Thanks, Harry, and tell kids I said hello. Yeah, I will. You ever run into anybody else from the table? I didn't want to leave yet. I wanted more information, so I continued the banter. I looked up over his head and spotted a small two-camera dome. It was mounted up near the ceiling, 
one lens angled down on the register and one taking in the long view of the store. There was a small red light glowing, and I could see a small black cable snaking from the camera housing and up into the drop ceiling. While Thomas answered my question, I was thinking about the possibility that Bacchus had been in the store and was captured on a surveillance tape. Not really, Thomas said. I sort of left all of that behind. You say you miss it, Harry, but I don't miss a thing about it. Not really. I nodded like I understood, but I didn't. Thomas had been a good cop and a good detective. He took the work to heart. That was one reason why the poet had put him in the sights. He was paying lip service to something I didn't think he really believed. That's good, I said. Hey, do you have that kid you kicked out of here on tape from this morning? I'd like to see how he tried to rip you off. Nah, I just have live feeds. I got the cameras out in the open and a sticker on the door. It's supposed to be a deterrent, but some people are dumb. A setup with a recorder would be too expensive and a pain in the ass in maintenance. I just have the live setup. I see. Listen, if Kiz already has that book, I'll take it back. I can sell it. No, no, that's cool. If she already has it, I'll keep it and read it myself. Harry, when's the last time you read a book? I read a book about Art Pepper a couple of months ago, I said indignantly. He and his wife wrote it before he died. Nonfiction? Yeah, it was real stuff. I'm talking about a novel. When was the last time you read one? I shrugged. I didn't remember. That's what I thought, Thomas said. If she doesn't want the book, bring it back and I'll get it to somebody who'll read it. Okay, Ed, thanks. Be careful out there, Harry. I will be. You too. I was heading to the door when things came together what Thomas had told me and what I knew about the case. I snapped my fingers and acted like I just remembered something. I turned back to Thomas. Hey, I got a friend lives all the way in Nevada, but he says he's a customer of yours, mail order probably. You do mail order? Sure, what's his name? Tom Walling. Lives all the way up in Clear. Thomas nodded, but not in any happy sort of way. He's your friend? I realized I might have stepped in it. Well, an acquaintance, you could say. Well, he owes me some money. Really? What happened? It's a long story, but I sold him some books out of a collection I was handling, and he paid very promptly. Paid with a money order, and everything was fine. So when he wanted more books, I sent them before I got his money order. Big mistake. That was three months ago, and I haven't gotten a dime from him. If you see this acquaintance of yours again, tell him I want my money. I will, Ed. That's too bad. I didn't know the guy was a rip-off artist. What books did he buy? He's into Poe, so I sold him some books out of the Rodway collection. Some old ones. Pretty nice books. Then he ordered more when I got another collection in. He didn't pay for them. My heart rate was kicking into an upper gear. What Thomas was telling me was confirmation that Bacchus was somehow in play here. I wanted to stop the charade at that moment and tell Thomas what was happening and that he was in danger. But I held back. I needed to talk to Rachel first and form the right plan. I think I saw those books in his place, I said. Was it poetry? Mostly, yeah. He didn't really care for the short stories. Did these books have the original collector's name in them? Rodman? No, Rod Way. And yes, they had his library seal embossed in them. That hurt the price, but your friend wanted the books. I nodded. I saw my theory coming together. It was more than theory now. Harry, what are you really up to? I looked at Thomas. What do you mean? I don't know. You're asking a lot of... A loud ring sounded from the back of the store, cutting Thomas off. Never mind, Harry, he said. It's more books. I need to go take a delivery. Oh. I'll see you later. Yeah. I watched him leave the counter area and head to the back. I checked my watch. It was noon. 
The director was stepping before the cameras to talk about the explosion in the desert and say that it was the work of the killer known as the poet. Could this be the moment Bacchus chose to strike Thomas? My throat and chest tightened as though the air had been sucked out of the room. As soon as Thomas slipped through the doorway to the stockroom, I moved back to the counter and leaned over to look at the security monitor. I knew if Thomas checked the backroom monitor he would see that I hadn't left the store, but I was counting on him going right to the door. On the corner of the screen showing the stockroom, I saw Thomas lean his face up to the rear door and look through a peephole. Apparently unalarmed by what he saw, he proceeded to turn the deadbolt and open the door. I stared intently at the screen, even though the image was small and I was viewing it upside down. Thomas stepped back from the door and a man entered. He was wearing a dark shirt and matching shorts. He was carrying two boxes, one stacked on top of the other, and Thomas directed him to a nearby work table. The delivery man put the boxes down and then took an electronic clipboard off the top box and turned back to Thomas for a delivery confirmation signature. Everything seemed all right. It was a routine delivery. I quickly got off the counter and went to the door. As I opened it, I heard an electronic chime sound, but I didn't worry about that. I headed back to the Mercedes, running through the rain after putting the autographed book under my raincoat. What was all of that with you leaning over the counter like that? Rachel asked once I was behind the wheel again. He's got a security box. There was a delivery, and I wanted to make sure it was legit before I left. It's after three o'clock in D.C. I know. So what did you learn from him, or were you just in there buying a book? I learned a lot. Tom Walling is a customer, or was, until he stiffed him for an order of Edgar Allan Poe books. It was mail order, like we thought. He never saw him, just sent the books out to Nevada. Rachel sat up straight. Are you kidding me? No. The books were out of some guy's collection that Ed was selling, so they were marked and therefore traceable. That was why Bacchus burned them all in the fire barrel. He couldn't risk that they'd survive the blast intact and be traced back to Thomas. Why? Because he is definitely in play here. He's got to be setting up on Thomas. I started the car. Where are you going? around back to make sure about the delivery. Besides, it's good to change locations every now and then. Oh, you're giving me surveillance 101 lessons now? Without responding, I drove around to the back of the plaza and saw the brown UPS van parked by the open rear door of Book Carnival. We drove on by, and during the brief glimpse I had of the back of the truck and the open door of the stockroom, I saw the delivery man struggling to carry several boxes up a ramp to the back of his truck. The returns, I guessed. I kept driving without hesitation. He's legit, Rachel said. Yeah. You didn't give yourself away with Thomas, did you? No, he was suspicious, but then I was sort of saved by the bell. I wanted to talk to you first. I think we need to bring him in on it. Harry, we talked about this. If we bring him into it, he may change his routine and demeanor. It might be a giveaway. If Bacchus has been watching him, any little change could be a tell. And if we don't warn him and this thing goes wrong, then we... I didn't finish. We had been over this argument twice before, each of us alternately taking the other side. It was a classic contradiction of intentions. Do we ensure Thomas's safety at the risk of losing Bacchus, or do we risk Thomas's safety to ensure getting close to Bacchus? It was all about the means to an end and neither of us would be happy no matter which way we went. I guess that means we can't let anything go wrong, she said. Right. What about backup? I also think it's too risky. The more people we bring into this, the greater the chance of tipping our hand. I nodded. She was right. I found a spot on the opposite end of the parking lot from where we had parked and watched before. I wasn't kidding myself, though. There were only so many cars in the lot in the middle of a rainy weekday, and we were noticeable. I started to think that maybe we were like Ed Thomas's cameras, strictly a deterrent. Maybe Bacchus had seen us, and it had stopped him from moving forward with his plan, for now. 
customer, Rachel said. I looked across the lot and saw a woman heading toward the store. She looked familiar to me, and then I remembered her from the sportsman's lodge. That's his wife. I met her once. I think her name is Pat. She bringing him lunch, you think? Maybe. Or maybe she works there. We watched for a while, but there was no sign of Thomas or his wife in the front of the store. I grew concerned and took out my cell phone and called the store, hoping the call would bring them to the front counter to where the phone was. But a woman answered right away, and there was still no one at the counter. I quickly hung up. There must be a phone in the stockroom. Who answered? The wife. Should I take a walk and go in? No. If Bacchus is watching, he'll recognize you. You can't be seen. All right, then what? Then nothing. They're probably at the table I saw in the back room having lunch. Be patient. I don't want to be patient. I don't like just sitting. She stopped when we saw Ed Thomas walk out the front of the store. He was wearing a raincoat and carrying an umbrella and a briefcase. He got into the car we had seen him arrive at the store in that morning, a green Ford Explorer. Through the store's front window, I saw his wife take a seat on a stool behind the front counter. Here we go, I said. Where's he going? Maybe he's going to get lunch. Not with a briefcase. We stay on him, right? I restarted the car. Right. We watched as Thomas pulled out of a parking space in his Ford SUV. He headed toward the exit and turned right on Tustin Boulevard. After his car was absorbed into the passing traffic, I pulled up to the exit and followed him into the rain. I pulled out my phone and called the store. Ed Thomas's wife answered. Hi, is Ed there? No, he's not. Can I help you? Is this Pat? Yes, it is. Who's this? It's Bill Gilbert. I think we met at the Sportsman's Lodge a while back. I used to work with Ed in the department. I was going to be in the area and thought I'd drop by the store today to say hello. Will he be back later? That's hard to say. He went to do an appraisal, and who knows, it might take the rest of the day with this rain and the distance he had to go. An appraisal? What do you mean? A book collection. Someone wants to sell his collection, and Ed just left to go see what it is worth. It's all the way up in the San Fernando Valley, and from what I understand, it's a big collection. He told me I'd probably be closing the store tonight. Is it more of the Rodway collection? He told me about that the last time we talked. No, that's just about all been sold. This is a man named Charles Turrentine, and he has over 6,000 books. Wow, that's a lot. He's a well-known collector, but I guess he needs the money because he told Ed he wants to sell everything. Strange. A guy spends all that time collecting, and then he sells it all? We see it happen. Well, Pat, I'll let you go, and I'll catch Ed next time. Tell him I said hello. What was your name again? Tom Gilbert. Bye now. I closed the phone. You were Bill Gilbert at the start of the conversation. Whoops. I recounted the conversation for Rachel. I then called information in the 818 area code, but there was no listing for a Charles Turrentine. I asked Rachel if she had a connection in the Bureau's Los Angeles field office who could get an address for Turrentine and maybe an unlisted number. Don't you have somebody in the LAPD you can use? At the moment, I think I've used up all the favors owed me. Besides, I'm an outsider. You're not. I don't know about that. She pulled out her phone and went to work on it, and I concentrated on the taillights of Thomas's SUV, just 50 yards ahead of me on the 22 freeway. I knew Thomas had a choice up ahead. He could turn north on the 5 and go through downtown L.A., or he could keep on going and take the 405 north. Both routes would lead him to the valley. Rachel got a call back in five minutes with the information she had asked for. He lives on Valerio Street in Canoga Park. Do you know where that is? I know where Canoga Park is. Valerio runs east-west across the whole valley. Did you get a phone number? She answered by punching in a number on her cell phone. She then held it to her ear and waited. 
After 30 seconds, she closed the phone. There was no answer. I got the tape. We drove in silence as we thought about that. Thomas passed by the exit to the 5 North and proceeded on toward the 405. I knew he would turn north there and take the Sepulveda Pass into the valley. Canoga Park was on the west side. With the weather, we were talking about at least an hour's drive, if we were lucky. Don't lose him, Bosch, Rachel said quietly. I knew what she meant. She was telling me she had the vibe, that she thought this was it, that she believed Ed Thomas might be leading us to the poet. I nodded because I had it too, almost like a humming coming from the center of my chest. I knew without really knowing that we were there. Don't worry, I said. I won't. Chapter 41 The rain was getting to Rachel, the relentlessness of it. It never let up, never paused. It just came down and hit the windshield in a non-stop torrent that overpowered the wipers. Everything was a blur. There were cars pulled off on the shoulders of the freeway. Lightning cracked the sky to the west, somewhere out over the ocean. They passed accident after accident, and these just made Rachel all the more nervous. If they got into an accident and lost Thomas, they would carry an awful burden of responsibility for what happened to him. She was afraid that if she looked away from the red glow of the taillights on Thomas's car, they would lose him in the sea of blurred red. Bosch seemed to know what she was thinking. Relax, he said. I'm not going to lose him. And even if I do, we know where he's going now. No, we don't. We only know where Turrentine lives. That doesn't mean his books are there. Six thousand books? Who keeps six thousand books in their house? He probably has them in a warehouse somewhere. Rachel watched Bosch adjust his grip on the steering wheel and add a few more miles to his speed, drawing them closer to Thomas. Didn't think about that, did you? No, not really. So don't lose him. I told you I won't. I know. It just helps me to say it. She gestured toward the windshield. How often does it get like this? Almost never, Bosch said. They said on the news that it's a hundred-year storm. It's like something's wrong, something's broken. The canyons are probably washing out in Malibu, landslides in the Palisades, and the river's probably over its sides. Last year we had the fires. This year maybe it's going to be rain. One way or another, it's always something. It's like you always have to pass a test or something. He turned on the radio to pick up a weather report. But Rachel immediately reached over and turned it off, and pointed ahead through the windshield. Concentrate on this, she ordered. I don't care about the weather report. Right. Get closer. I don't care if you're right behind him. He won't be able to see you in this mess. I get behind him, I might hit him. Then what do we say? Just don't lose him. Yeah, I know. They drove for the next half hour without a word. The freeway rose and crossed over the mountains. Rachel saw a large stone structure on the top of the mountain. It looked like some sort of postmodern castle in the gray and gloom, and Bosch told her it was the Getty Museum. As they descended into the valley, she saw the turn signal flare from the back of Thomas's car. Bosch moved into the turning lane three cars back. He's taking the 101. We're almost there. You mean to Canoga Park? That's right. He'll take this out west and then go north again on surface streets. Bosch grew quiet again as he concentrated on the driving and following. In another fifteen minutes, the turn signal on the Explorer flared again, and Thomas exited on DeSoto Avenue and headed north. Bosch and Walling trailed behind on the exit ramp, but this time without the cover of other traffic. On DeSoto, Thomas almost immediately pulled to the curb in a no-parking area and Bosch had to drive by him, or the surveillance would have been obvious. I think he's looking at a map or directions, Rachel said. 
He had the light on and his head was down. Okay. Bosch pulled into a service station, circled around the pumps, and then drove back out to the street. He paused before pulling out, looking left down the street at Thomas's Explorer. He waited, and after a half minute, Thomas pulled his Explorer back into traffic. Bosch waited for him to go by, holding his cell phone up to his left ear to block any view of his face, in case Thomas was looking and could see in the rain. He let another car go by, and then pulled out. He must be close, Rachel said. Yeah. But Thomas drove several more blocks before turning right. Bosch slowed before doing the same. Valerio, Rachel said, seeing the street sign in the murk. This is it. When Bosch made the turn, she saw the brake lights on Thomas's car. He was stopped in the middle of the road three blocks ahead. He was at a dead end. Bosch quickly pulled to the curb behind a parked car. The dome light's on, Rachel said. I think he's looking at his map again. The river, Bosch said. What? I told you Valerio cuts across the whole valley, but so does the river. So he's probably figuring out a way to get around it. The river cuts off all these streets in here. He probably has to get to Valerio on the other side. I don't see any river up there. I see a fence and concrete. It's not what you would consider a river. In fact, technically, that isn't the river. It's probably either the Aliso or Brown's Canyon Wash. It goes to the river. They waited. Thomas didn't move. The river used to flood in storms like this. It would wipe out a third of the city. So they tried to control it, contain it. Somebody had the idea to capture it in stone, put it in concrete. So that's what they did, and everybody's house and home was supposedly safe after that. I guess that's called progress. Bosch nodded and then regripped his hands on the wheel. He's moving. Thomas turned left, and once his car was out of sight, Bosch pulled away from the curb and followed. Thomas drove north to Satakoy and then took a right. He went over a bridge crossing the wash below. As they followed, Rachel looked down and saw the torrent of water in the concrete channel. Wow! I thought I lived in Rapid City. Bosch didn't answer. Thomas turned south on Mason and came back down to Valerio, but now he was on the other side of the concrete channel. He turned right again on Valerio. That'll be another dead end, Bosch said. He stayed on Mason and drove on by Valerio. Rachel looked through the rain and saw that Thomas had pulled into a driveway in front of a large two-story home that was one of five homes on the dead-end street. He pulled into a driveway, she said. He's there. Jesus! It's the house! What house? The one from the photo in the trailer. Bacchus was so sure of himself, he left us a goddamn picture. Bosch pulled to the curb. They were out of sight of the homes on Valerio. Rachel turned and looked out all of the windows. Every home around them was dark. There must be a power outage around here. Under your seat there's a flashlight. Take it. Rachel reached down and got it. What about you? I'll be all right. Let's go. Rachel started to open a door, but then looked back at Bosch. She wanted to say something, but hesitated. What? he asked. Be careful? Don't worry. I will. Actually, yes, be careful. But what I was going to say is that I have my second gun in my bag. Do you— Thanks, Rachel. But this time I brought my own. She nodded. I should have figured that. And what are your views on backup now? Call it in if you want. But I'm not waiting. I'm going down there. The rain felt cold on my face and neck as I got out of the Mercedes. I pulled the collar on my jacket up and started heading back toward Valerio. Rachel came over and walked next to me without saying a word. When we got to the corner, we used the wall surrounding the corner property as cover and looked down into the cul-de-sac and the dark house where Ed Thomas had parked his car. There was no sign of Thomas or anyone else. Every window at the front of the house was dark. But even in the grayness, I could tell that Rachel was right. It was the house from the photo Bacchus had left for us.
I could hear the river but not see it. It was hidden behind the homes, but its furious power was almost palpable, even from this distance. In storms like this, the whole city washed itself out over its smooth concrete surfaces. It snaked through the valley and around the mountains to downtown, and from there west to the ocean. It was a mere trickle most of the year, a municipal joke even. But a rainstorm would awaken the snake and give it power. It became the city's gutter. Millions and millions of gallons banging against its thick stone walls, Tons of water raging to get out, moving with a terrible force and momentum. I remembered a boy who was taken when I was a kid. I didn't know him. I knew of him. Four decades later, I even remembered his name. Billy Kinsey was playing on the river's shoulder. He slipped in, and in a moment he was gone. They found his body hung up in a viaduct twelve miles away. My mother had taught me early and often, when it rains, stay out of the narrows. What? Rachel whispered. I was thinking about the river trapped between those walls. When I was a kid, we called it the narrows. When it rains like this, the water moves fast. It's deadly. When it rains, you stay away from the narrows. But we're going to the house. Same thing, Rachel. Be careful. Stay out of the narrows. She looked at me. She seemed to understand what I meant. Okay, Bosch. How about you take the front and I take the back? Fine. Be ready for anything. You too. The target house was three properties away. We walked quickly along the wall surrounding the first property and then cut up the driveway of the next. We skirted the fronts of two houses until we came to the home where Thomas's car was parked. Rachel gave me a last nod, and we separated then, both of us pulling our weapons in unison. Rachel moved to the front while I started down the driveway toward the rear. The gloom and the sound of the rain and the river channel gave me visual and sound cover. The driveway was also lined with squat bougainvillea trees that had been let go for some time without training or trimming. But the house behind the windows was dark. Someone could be behind any glass watching me and I wouldn't know it. The rear yard was flooded. In the middle of the big puddle stood the rusted twin A-frames of a swing set with no swings left on it. Behind it was a six-foot fence that separated the property from the river channel. I could see the water was near the top of its concrete siding and was rushing by in a mad torrent. It would flood by day's end. Further upstream where the channels were shallower, it probably already had stemmed its sides. I turned my attention back to the house. There was a full porch off the rear. There were no gutters on the roof here, and the rain was coming off in sheets, so heavy that it obscured everything within. Bacchus could have been sitting in a rocker on the porch, and I wouldn't have seen him. The line of bougainvilleas carried along the porch railing. I ducked below the sight line and moved quickly to the steps. I took the three steps up in one stride and was in out of the rain. My eyes and ears took a moment to adjust. And that was when I saw it. There was a white rattan couch on the right side of the porch. On it, a blanket covered the unmistakable shape of a human form, sitting upright but slumped against the left arm. Dropping to a crouch, I moved closer and reached for a corner of the blanket on the floor. I slowly pulled it off the form. It was an old man. He looked like he had been dead at least a day. The odor was just starting. His eyes were open and bugged. His skin was the color of white paint in a smoker's bedroom. A snap cuff had been pulled tight, too tight, around his neck. Charles Turrentine, I presumed. I also presumed he was the old man in the photo Bacchus had taken. He had been killed and then left there on the porch like a stack of old newspapers. He'd had no business with the poet. He'd just been a means to an end. 
I raised my Glock and went to the house's back door. I wanted to get a warning to Rachel, but there was no way to do it without revealing my own position and possibly compromising hers. I just had to keep moving, going further into the darkness of this place, until I came across her or Bacchus. The door was locked. I decided I would go around, catch up to Rachel from the front, but as I turned my eyes fell back on the body, and I was struck with a possibility. I moved to the couch and patted down the old man's pants, and I was rewarded. I heard the jingle of keys. Rachel was surrounded. Stacks and stacks of books lined every wall in the front hallway. She stood there, gun in one hand and flashlight in the other, and looked into the living room to her right. More books. Shelves lined every wall and every shelf was filled to capacity. Books stacked on the coffee table and the end tables and every horizontal surface. Somehow it made the place seem haunted. It was not a place of life, but a place of doom and gloom, where bookworms ate through the words of all the authors. She tried to keep moving without dwelling on her rising fears. She wavered and thought about turning back to the door and leaving before she was discovered. But then she heard the voices and knew she must press on. Where's Charles? I said sit down. The words came to her from an unknown direction. The pounding of the rain outside, the rage of the nearby river, and the books stacked everywhere combined to obliquely camouflage the origin of sounds. She heard the voices, but could not tell where they came from. More sounds and voices came to her. Murmurs, mostly. And every few moments a recognizable word, sculpted in anger or fear. You thought. She bent down and left the flashlight on the floor. She had not used it yet and couldn't risk it now. She moved into the deeper gloom of the hallway. She had already checked the front rooms and knew the voices were coming from somewhere further into the house. The hallway led to a foyer from which doors opened in three different directions. As she got there, she heard the voices of two men and thought for sure that they came from somewhere to the right. Write it. I can't see. Then a popping sound, a ripping sound. Curtains being pulled off a window. There, you see now. Write it or I'll end it right now. All right, all right. Exactly as I say it. Once upon a midnight dreary. She knew what it was. She recognized the words of Edgar Allan Poe, and she knew it was Bacchus, though the voice was different. He was using the poetry again, recreating the crime taken from him so long ago. Bosch had been right. She moved into the room to the right and found it empty. A billiard table stood in the middle of the room, every inch of its surface taken up by stacks of more books. She understood what Bacchus had done. He had lured Ed Thomas here because the man who lived here, Charles Turrentine, was a collector. He knew Thomas would come for this collection. She started to turn in order to retreat to check the next room off the foyer. But before she had moved more than a few inches, she felt the cold muzzle of a gun pressed against her neck. Hello, Rachel, Robert Bacchus said with his surgically changed voice. What a surprise to see you here. She froze and in that moment knew that he could not be played in any way, that he knew all the plays and all the angles. She knew she only had one chance. That was Bosch. Hello, Bob. It's been a long time. Yes, it has. Would you like to leave your weapon here and join me in the library? Rachel put her sig down on one of the stacks on the billiard table. I sort of thought the whole place was a library, Bob. Bacchus didn't respond. She felt him grab the back of her collar, press his gun against her spine, and then push her in the direction he wanted her to go. 
They left the room and went into the next, which was a small room with two high-backed wooden chairs arranged to face a large stone fireplace. There was no fire, and Rachel could hear rain dripping down the chimney into the hearth. She saw that it was creating a puddle there. Windows on either side of the fireplace had rain washing down them, turning them translucent. We happen to have just enough chairs, Bacchus said. Have a seat, won't you? He roughly brought her around one of the chairs and pushed her down into it. He made a quick check of her body for other weapons, and then stepped back and dropped something onto her lap. Rachel looked into the other chair and saw Ed Thomas. He was still alive. His wrists were held to the arms of the chair by plastic snap cuffs. Two more cuffs had been joined and then used to hold him by his neck to the back of the chair. He had been gagged with a cloth napkin, and his face was overly red with exertion and lack of oxygen. Bob, you can stop this, Rachel said. You've made your point. You don't... Put the cuff around your right wrist and lock it to the chair's arm. Bob, please, let... Do it! She wrapped the plastic cuff around the arm of the chair and her wrist. She then pulled the tab through the slide lock. Tight, but not too tight. I don't want to leave a mark. When she was done, he told her to put her free arm on the other arm of the chair. He then moved in and grabbed the arm to keep it in place while he looped another snap cuff around it and locked it. He stepped back to admire his work. There. Bob, we did a lot of good work together. Why are you doing this? He looked down at her and smiled. I don't know, but let's talk about it later. I have to finish with Detective Thomas. It's been a long time coming for him and me. And just think, Rachel, you get to watch. What a rare opportunity for you. Bacchus turned to Thomas. He stepped over and yanked the gag out of his mouth. He then reached into his pocket and pulled out a folding knife. He opened it and in one swift movement sliced through the cuff holding Thomas's right arm to the chair. Now, where were we, Detective Thomas? Line three, I believe. More like the end of the line. Rachel recognized Bosch's voice from behind her. But when she turned to look for him, the chair back was too high. I held the gun steady, trying to figure out the best way to handle him. Harry, Rachel called out calmly, he's got a gun in his left and a knife in his right. He's right-handed. I steadied my aim and told him to put the weapons down. He complied without hesitation. This gave me pause, as if he was moving too quickly to plan B. Was there another weapon, another killer in the house? Rachel, Ed, you all right? We're fine, Rachel said. Put him on the ground, Harry. He's got snap cuffs in his pocket. Rachel, where's your gun? In the other room. Put him down on the ground, Harry. I took a step further into the room, but then paused to study Bacchus. He had changed again. He no longer looked like the man who had called himself Shandy. No beard, no hat over gray hair. His face and head were shaved. He looked completely different. I took another step, but stopped again. I suddenly thought about Terry McCaleb and his wife, and his daughter and his stepson. I thought about the shared mission and what had been lost. How many bad men would roam the world free because Terry was taken away? A rage as strong as the river built inside me. I didn't want to put Bacchus on the ground, cuff him, and watch him driven away in a patrol car to a life behind bars of celebrity attention and fascination. I wanted to take from him everything he had taken from my friend and all of the others. You killed my friend, I said. And for that you... Harry, don't, Rachel said. I'm sorry, Bacchus said, but I've been kind of busy. Who might your friend be? Terry McCaleb. He was your friend, too. And you... Actually, I wanted to take care of Terry. Yes, he had the potential of becoming a stone in my shoe. But I... Shut up, Bob, Rachel yelled. You couldn't carry Terry's lunch. Harry, this is too dangerous. Put him down. Do it now. 
I broke off my rage and focused on the moment at hand. Terry McCaleb retreated in the gloom. I stepped toward Bacchus, wondering what Rachel was telling me. Put him down? Did she want me to shoot him? I took two more steps. Get on the ground, I ordered. Away from the weapons. Whatever you say. He turned as if to move away from where he had dropped his weapons and to choose a spot to get down. Do you mind? There's a puddle here. Leaky fireplace. Without waiting for an answer from me, he took a step toward the window, and I suddenly saw it. I knew what he was going to do. Bacchus, no! But my words did not stop him. He planted his foot and dove head first into the window. Its framework softened by years of sunlight and rains like this day's, the window gave way as easily as a Hollywood prop. Wood splintered and glass shattered as his body went through. I quickly ran to the opening and saw the immediate muzzle flash from Bacchus's second gun. Plan B. Two quick pops and I heard the bullet zing by and hit the ceiling above and behind me. I ducked back behind the wall and fired off two quick returns without looking. I then dropped to the floor, crawled beneath the window, and came up on the other side. I looked out, and Bacchus was gone. On the ground I saw a little two-shot Derringer. His second had been a little vest gun, and he was now unarmed, unless there was a plan C. Harry, the knife! Rachel called from behind me. Cut me loose! I grabbed the knife from the floor and quickly sliced through her bonds. The plastic cut easily. I then turned to Thomas and put the knife in his right hand so he could free himself. I'm sorry, Ed, I said. I could give him the rest of the apology later. I turned back to Rachel, who was at the window, looking through the gloom. She had picked up Bacchus's gun. See him? I joined her there. Thirty yards to the left was the river wash. Just as I looked, I saw the overflowing torrent carrying a whole oak tree on its surface. Then there was movement. We saw Bacchus jump from the cover of a bougainvillea and start to scale the fence that kept people away from the river. Just as he was going over the top, Rachel raised a gun and fired two quick shots. Bacchus dropped down onto the gravel shoulder next to the channel. But then he jumped up and started running. Rachel had missed. He can't get across the river, I said. He's hemmed in. He's heading up to the bridge at Sadakoy. I knew if Bacchus made it to the bridge, we would lose him. He could cross and disappear in the neighborhood on the west side of the channel or the business district near DeSoto. I'll go from here, Rachel said. You get the car and get there faster. We'll trap him at the bridge. Got it. I headed for the door, getting ready to run through the rain. I pulled my cell phone from my pocket and threw it to Thomas as I went. Ed, I called over my shoulder. Call the cops. Get us some backup. Chapter 42 Rachel ejected the magazine from Bacchus's gun and found it had been fully loaded until she took the two shots at him. She slapped it back into place and went to the window. You want me to go with you? Ed Thomas asked from behind. She turned. He had cut himself free. He was standing, holding the knife up and ready. Do what Harry said. Get us back up. She stepped onto the sill and jumped out into the rain. She quickly moved along the bougainvillea until she found an opening and pushed through to the river fence. She put Bacchus's gun in her holster and climbed up and over, snagging her jacket sleeve on the top and tearing it. She dropped onto the gravel shoulder two feet from the edge. She looked over the side and saw the water was only three feet from the overflow. It was cascading against the concrete, creating the roaring sound of death. She looked away and then further down the track. She saw Bacchus running. He was halfway to the bridge at Sadakoy. Rachel got up and started running. She fired a shot into the air so he would think about what was coming behind him, not what might be waiting for him at the bridge. The Mercedes skidded into the curb on the top of the bridge. I jumped out, not bothering to kill the engine, and ran to the railing. I saw Rachel running toward me, gun up on the shoulder of the canal, but I didn't see Bacchus. I stepped back and looked in all directions, but still didn't see him. 
I thought that it would have been impossible for him to have reached the bridge ahead of me. I ran down to the gate that sided the bridge and offered entrance to the channel shoulder. It was locked, but I could see that the shoulder continued under the bridge. It was the only alternative. I knew Bacchus had to be hiding under there. Quickly I climbed over the gate and dropped down to the gravel. I came up gun pointed in both hands at the dark opening beneath the bridge. I ducked and moved into the darkness. The noise of the rushing water echoed loudly beneath the bridge. The underside of the bridge was segmented by four large concrete supports. Bacchus could easily be hidden behind any one of them. Bacchus, I called out. You want to live? Come out now. Nothing. Only the sound of the water. Then I heard the far-off sound of a voice, and I turned back to see Rachel. She was still a hundred yards away. She was yelling, but her words were lost in the water noise. Bacchus huddled in the darkness. He tried to stave off all the emotions and concentrate on the moment. He had been here before, cornered in the dark. He had survived before, and he would survive now. What was important now was to concentrate on the moment, draw his strength from the darkness. He heard his pursuer call out to him. He was close now. He had the weapon, but Bacchus had the darkness. Darkness had always been on his side. He pressed back against the concrete and willed himself to disappear in the shadows. He would be patient and make his move when the time was right. I turned away from the distant figure of Rachel and focused back on clearing the bridge. I moved forward, staying as far back from the concrete shelters as I could without falling into the channel. I cleared the first two and glanced back at Rachel again. She was fifty yards away now. She started signaling with her left arm, but I didn't understand the hooked movement she was repeating. I suddenly realized my mistake. I had left the keys in the car. Bacchus could come up on the other side of the bridge and get to the car. I started to run, hoping to get there in time to take a shot at the tires. But I was wrong about the car. As I passed the third concrete support, Bacchus suddenly leaped out at me, hitting me solidly with his shoulder. I went sprawling backward with him on top of me, sliding on the gravel to the edge of the concrete channel. He was going for my gun, using both hands to tear it from my grip. I knew in an instant that if he got the gun, everything was over, that he'd kill me and then Rachel. He couldn't get the gun. He slammed his left elbow into my jaw, and I felt my grip weaken. I fired the gun twice, hoping I might catch a finger or a palm. He yelped in pain, but then I felt the pressure even more as he redoubled his effort, now fueled by pain and red anger. His blood worked its way into my grip and helped loosen it. I was going to lose the gun, I could tell. He had position on me and an animal strength. My grip was slipping. I could try to hang on a few more seconds until Rachel got there, but by then she could also be running into a death trap. Instead, I took the only alternative I had left. I dug my heels into the gravel and flexed my whole body upward. My shoulders slid over the concrete edge. I replanted my heels and did it again. This time, it was enough. Bacchus seemed to suddenly realize his situation. He let go of the gun and reached back to the edge. But it was too late for him, too. Together we went over the edge and into the black water. Rachel saw them fall from just a few yards away. She yelled, No! as if that might stop them. She got to the spot and looked down and saw nothing. She then ran along the edge and out from beneath the bridge. She saw nothing. She looked downriver for any sign of them in the cascading current. Then she saw Bosch come up and whip his head around as if to check his position. He was struggling with something under the water, and then she realized it was his raincoat. He was trying to take it off. She scanned the river but didn't see the bald head of Bacchus anywhere. She looked back at Bosch as he was carried away from her. She saw him looking back at her. He raised an arm out of the water and pointed. She followed and saw the Mercedes parked on top of the bridge.
She saw its windshield wipers moving back and forth, and she knew the keys were still there. She started running. The water was cold, more so than I would have imagined, and I was already weak from the struggle with Bacchus. I felt heavy in the water and found it difficult to keep my face up and clear. The water seemed to be alive, as if it was gripping me and pulling me down. My gun was gone, and there was no sign of Bacchus. I spread my arms and tried to maneuver my body so that I could simply ride the rapids until I had some strength back and could make a move, or until Rachel got help. I remembered the boy who had gone into the river so many years before. Firemen, cops, even passers-by tried to save him, hanging down hoses and ladders and ropes. But they all missed, and he went down. Eventually, they all go down in the narrows. I tried not to think about that. I tried not to panic. I turned my palms down, and I seemed to be able to keep my face up out of the water better. It increased my speed in the current, but it kept my head up out of the water. It gave me confidence. I started to think that I could make it. For a while. It all depended on when help got to me. I looked up into the sky. No helicopters. No fire department. No help yet. Just the gray void of emptiness up there and rain coming down. The 911 operator told Rachel to stay on the line, but she couldn't drive fast and well and safely with the phone to her ear. She dropped it on the passenger seat without disconnecting. When she came to the next stop sign, she stopped so short that the phone was hurled into the footwell and out of her reach. She didn't care. She was speeding down the street, checking to her left at every intersection for the next bridge crossing the channel. When she finally saw one, she sped to it and stopped the Mercedes right on top of it in a traffic lane. She jumped out and went to the railing. Neither Bosch nor Bacchus was in sight. She thought she might have gotten ahead of them. She ran across the street, drawing a horn blast from a motorist but not caring, and went to the opposite rail. She studied the roiling surface for a long moment and then saw Bosch. His head was above the surface and canted back, his face to the sky. She panicked. Was he still alive, or was he drowned and his body just moving in the current? Then almost as quickly as the fear had grabbed her, she saw movement as Bosch whipped his head, as swimmers often do to get hair and water out of their eyes. He was alive, and maybe a hundred yards from the bridge. She could see him struggling to move his position in the stream. She leaned forward and looked down. She knew what he was doing. He was going to try to catch one of the bridge's support beams. If he could grab it and hold on, he could be extracted and saved right here. Rachel ran back to the car and threw open the rear hatch. She looked in the back for anything that might help. Her bag was there and almost nothing else. She yanked it out to the ground without caring and lifted the carpeted floor panel. Someone stuck behind the Mercedes on the street started honking. She didn't even turn to look. I hit the middle pier of the bridge so hard that I lost all of my breath and thought I'd broken four or five ribs. But I held on. I knew this was my shot. I held on with everything I had left. The water had claws. I could feel them as it rushed by me. Thousands of claws pulling at me, grabbing me, trying to take me back into the dark torrent. The water backed up on me and rose into my face. Arms on either side of the pier, I tried to shimmy up the slippery concrete, but every time I gained a few inches, the claws would grab me and pull me back down. I quickly learned that the best I could do was hold on. And wait. As I hugged the concrete, I thought of my daughter. I thought of her urging me to hold on telling me I had to make it for her. She told me no matter where I was or what I did, she still needed me. Even in the moment, I knew it was illusion, but I found comfort in it. I found the strength to hold on. There were tools and a spare tire in the compartment. Nothing that would work. Then, beneath the tire, through the design holes in the wheel, she saw black and red cables, jumper cables. She put her fingers through the holes in the wheel and yanked it upward. It was large, heavy, and awkward, but she was not deterred. She pulled the wheel up and out and just dropped it on the road. 
she grabbed the cables and ran back across the road, causing a car to slide sideways as its driver hit the brakes. At the railing, she looked into the river, but didn't see Bosch at first. Then she looked down and saw him clinging to the support beam, the water backing up against him as it grabbed and pulled at him. His hands and fingers were scratched and bloody. He was looking up at her and had what she thought might have been a small smile on his face, almost like he was telling her that he was going to be all right. Not sure how she was going to complete the rescue, she dropped one end of the cables over the side. They were far too short. Shit! She knew she had to go over. There was a utility pipe running along the side of the bridge. She knew if she could get down to that, she could lower the cables another five feet down. It might be enough. Lady, are you all right? She turned. There was a man standing there. He was under an umbrella. He had been crossing the bridge. There's a man down there in the river. Call 911. Do you have a cell? Call 911. The man began pulling a cell phone from his jacket pocket. Rachel turned back to the railing and started to climb up on it. That was the easy part. Going over the railing and climbing down to the pipe was the risky maneuver. She put the cables around her neck and slowly reached one foot down to the pipe, then the other. She slid down with one leg on either side of the pipe like she was riding a horse. This time she knew the cable would reach Bosch. She started lowering it to him, and he reached for it. But just as his hand grabbed it, there was a blur of color in the water, and Bosch was struck by something and knocked loose from the support beam. In that moment, Rachel realized it was Bacchus, either alive or dead, that had knocked him loose. She hadn't been ready. When Bosch was knocked loose, he kept his grip on the cable line. But his weight and Bacchus's weight and the current were too much for Rachel. The other end of the cable was jerked out of her grasp, and it went down into the water and under the bridge. They're coming, they're coming. She looked up at the man under the umbrella at the top of the railing. It's too late, she said. He's gone. I was weak, but Bacchus was weaker. I could tell he didn't have the same strength he'd brought to the confrontation on the river's edge. He had pulled me loose from the bridge because I hadn't seen him coming, and he'd hit me with all his weight. But now he was grabbing at me like a drowning man, just trying to hold on. We tumbled through the water, drawing down to the bottom. I tried to open my eyes, but the water was too dark to see through. I drove him down hard into the concrete floor, and then shifted behind him. I wrapped the cable I still gripped around his neck. I did it again and again, until his hands let go of me and went to his own neck. My lungs were burning. I needed air. I pushed off him to move toward the surface. As we separated, he made a last grab for my ankles, but I was able to kick away and break his grasp. In the last moments, Bacchus saw his father. Long dead and burned, he appeared alive. He had the stern set of eyes that Bacchus always remembered. He had one hand behind his back as if he was hiding something. His other hand beckoned his son to come forward, to come home. Bacchus smiled and then he laughed. Water rushed into his mouth and lungs. He didn't panic. He welcomed it. He knew he would be reborn. He would return. He knew evil could never be vanquished. It just moved from one place to another and waited. I surfaced and gulped down air. I spun in the water to look for Bacchus, but he was gone. I was safe from him, but not from the water. I was exhausted. My arms felt so heavy in the water that I could barely bring them to the surface. I thought about the boy again, about how scared he must have been, all alone, and the claws grabbing at him. Up ahead, I could see the channel emptied into the main river channel. I was fifty yards away, and I knew the river would be wider and shallower and more violent there. But the concrete walls were sloped in the main channel, and I knew I might have a shot at pulling myself out 
if I could somehow slow my speed and find purchase. I lowered my eyes and decided to move as close to the wall as I could without getting pushed hard into it. Then I saw a more immediate salvation. The tree I had seen in the channel from the window of Turrentine's house was a hundred yards ahead of me in the river. It must have gotten hung up at the bridge or in the shallows. Using my last reserve of strength, I started swimming with the current, picking up speed and heading to the tree. I knew it would be my boat. I'd be able to ride it all the way to the Pacific if I needed to. Rachel lost the river. The streets took her further away from it, and soon she had lost it. She couldn't get back to it. There was a GPS screen in the car, but she didn't know how to work it, and doubted she'd be able to get a satellite fix in this weather anyway. She pulled over and banged the wheel angrily with the heel of her palm. She felt like she was deserting Harry, that it was going to be her fault if he drowned. Then she heard the helicopter. It was low-flying and moving fast. She leaned forward to see up through the windshield. She didn't see anything. She got out in the rain and turned circles on the street, looking. She could still hear it, but she couldn't see it. It had to be the rescue, she thought. In this weather, who else would be flying? She got a bead on the sound and jumped back into the Mercedes. She took the first right she came to and started heading to the sound. She drove with the window down, with the rain coming in but her not caring. She listened to the sound of the helicopter in the distance. Soon she saw it. It was circling ahead and to the right. She kept going, and when she came to Reseda Boulevard, she turned right again and could see there were two helicopters, one low and the other above it. Both were red with white lettering on the side, not television or radio call letters. The helicopters were marked LAFD. There was a bridge ahead, and Rachel could see cars stopped and people getting out in the rain to rush to the railing. They were looking down into the river. She pulled up, stopped in a traffic lane, and did the same. She rushed to the railing in time to see the rescue. Bosch was in a yellow safety harness being lifted on a wire out of a fallen tree that was stalled in the shallows where the river widened to 50 yards across. As he was raised to the helicopter, Bosch looked down into the raging current below him. Soon the tree broke free of its catch and tumbled over and over in the cascades. It picked up speed and washed beneath the bridge, its branches crashing into the support pylons and shearing off. Rachel watched the rescuers bring Bosch into the helicopter. Not until he was inside and safe and the helicopter started to bank away did she look away. And that was only when some of the others on the bridge had started to yell and point down into the river. She looked down and saw what it was. Another man in the water. But for this man there would be no rescue. He floated face down, his arms loose and his body limp. Red and black jumper cables were tangled around his body and neck. His shaven skull looked like a child's lost ball bobbing in the current. The second helicopter followed the body from above, waiting for it to get hung up like the tree had before any extraction was risked. There was no hurry this time. As the current thickened to move between the pylons of the bridge, the body's fluid travel was disturbed and it turned over in the water. Just before it went under the bridge, Rachel caught a glimpse of Bacchus's face. His eyes were open beneath the glaze of water, but it seemed to her that he was looking right at her before he disappeared under the bridge. Many years ago, when I served in the army in Vietnam, I was wounded in a tunnel. I was extracted by my comrades and put on a helicopter back to base camp. I remember that as the chopper rose and took me from harm's way, I felt an elation that far obscured the pain of my wound and the exhaustion I had felt. I felt the same way that day on the river. Deja vu all over again, as they say. I had made it. I had survived. I was out of harm's way. I was smiling as a fireman in a safety helmet wrapped a blanket around me.
We're taking you to USC to get checked out, he yelled over the roar of the rotor and the rain. ETA in ten minutes. He gave me the OK sign, and I gave it back to him, noticing that my fingers were a bluish white and that I was shaking with something more than cold. I'm sorry about your friend, the fireman yelled. I saw he was looking down through a glass panel on the lower part of the door he had just slid closed. I leaned over and looked, and I could see Bacchus in the water below. He was face up and moving languidly in the current. I'm not sorry, I said, but not loud enough to be heard. I leaned back on the jump seat they had put me on. I closed my eyes and nodded to the conjured image of my silent partner, Terry McCaleb, smiling and standing in the stern of his boat. Chapter 43 The skies cleared a couple days later and the city started to dry out and dig out. There had been landslides in Malibu and Topanga. The coast highway was down to two lanes for the foreseeable future. In the Hollywood Hills, there had been flooding in the lower streets. One house on Fairhome Drive had broken free and was washed into the street, leaving an aging movie star homeless. Two deaths were attributed to the storm. A golfer who had inexplicably decided to get in a few holes between bands of the storm and was hit on a backswing by a bolt of lightning and Robert Bacchus, the fugitive serial killer. The poet was dead, the headlines and news anchors said. Bacchus's body was fished out of the river at the Sepulveda Dam. Cause of death? Drowning. The seas calmed, too, and I took a morning ferry out to Catalina to see Graciela McCaleb. I rented a golf cart and drove up to the house, where she answered the door and received me with her family. I met Raymond, the adopted son, and Cielo, the girl Terry had told me about. Meeting her made me miss my own daughter and reminded me of the new vulnerability I would soon have in my life. The house was filled with boxes, and Graciela explained that the storm had delayed their move back to the mainland. In another day, their belongings would be shuttled down to a barge and then taken across to the port, where a moving truck would be waiting. It was complicated and expensive, but she had no regrets. She wanted to leave the island and the memories it held. We went out to the table on the porch so we could talk without the children hearing. It was a nice spot, with a view of all of Avalon Harbor. It made it hard to believe she wanted to leave. I could see the following sea down there, and I noticed there was someone in the stern, and that one of the deck hatches was open. Is that Buddy down there? Yes. He's getting ready to move the boat. The FBI brought it back yesterday without calling ahead. I would have told them to take it to Cabrillo. Now Buddy has to do it. What's he going to do with it? He's going to continue the business. He'll run the charters from over there and pay me rent on the boat. I nodded. It sounded like a decent plan. Selling the boat wouldn't bring that much in, and, I don't know, Terry works so hard on that boat, it feels wrong to just sell it to a stranger. I understand. You know, you could probably get a ride back with Buddy instead of waiting for the ferry. If you want, if you're not sick of Buddy. No, Buddy's fine. I like Buddy. We sat in silence for a long moment. I didn't feel I needed to explain anything about the case to her. We had talked on the phone, because I wanted to explain things before it hit the media, and the story had been all over the papers and television. She knew the details, large and small. There was little left to say, but I thought I needed to visit with her in person one last time. It had all started with her. I figured it should end with her as well. Thank you for what you did, Graciela said. Are you all right? I'm fine. Just a few scratches and bruises from the river. It was a wild ride. I smiled. The only visible injuries I had were scrapes on my hands and one above my left eyebrow. 
But thank you for calling me. I'm glad I got the chance. That's why I came, just to say thanks and to say good luck with everything. The sliding door opened, and the little girl came out carrying a book. Mommy, will you read this to me now? I'm visiting with Mr. Bosch right now, in a little while, okay? No, I want you to read it now. The girl looked like it was a life-or-death request, and her face nodded up, ready for a cry. It's okay, I said. Mine's like that, too. You can read it. It's her favorite book. Terry used to read it to her just about every night. She pulled the girl up onto her lap and brought the book up to read. I saw that it was the same book Eleanor had just gotten for my daughter, Billy's Big Day, with the monkey receiving the gold medal on the cover. Cielo's copy was worn around the edges from reading and rereading. The cover had been ripped in two places and then taped. Graciela opened it and started to read. One bright summer day, the Circus Animal Olympics were held under the Big Top in Ringlingville. All the animals had the day off from all of the circuses and were allowed to compete in the many different events. I noticed that Graciela had changed her voice and was reading the story with an inflection of excitement and anticipation. All the animals lined up at the bulletin board outside Mr. Farnsworth's office. The list of events was posted on the board. There were races and relays and many other contests. The big animals got closest to the board and were crowding it, so the others couldn't see. A little monkey squeezed between the legs of an elephant and then climbed the pachyderm's trunk so that he could see the list. Billy Bing smiled when he finally saw it. There was one race called the Hundred Yard Dash, and he knew he was very good at dashing. I didn't hear the rest of the story after that. I got up and went to the railing and looked down into the harbor. But I didn't see anything down there, either. My mind was too busy for the external world. I was flooded with ideas and emotions. I suddenly knew that the name William Bing, the name Terry McCaleb had scrawled on the flap of his file, belonged to a monkey. And I suddenly knew that the story wasn't finished. Not by a long shot. Chapter 44 Rachel came to see me at my house later that day. I had just gotten in after filing my paperwork with Kiz Ryder at Parker Center and was listening to a phone message from Ed Thomas. He was thanking me for saving his life, when all along it was I who owed him an apology for not warning him in the first place. I was feeling guilty about that and thinking about calling the bookstore when Rachel knocked. I invited her in, and we went out to the back deck. Wow, nice view. Yeah, I like it. I pointed down to the left, where a small cut of the river was in the view behind the sound stages on the Warner Brothers lot. There it is, the mighty Los Angeles River. She squinted and looked, and then found it. The Narrows. Looks pretty weak right now. It's resting. Next storm it will be back. How are you feeling, Harry? Good. Better. I've been sleeping a lot. I'm surprised you're still in town. Well, I took a few days. I'm actually looking at apartments. Really? I turned with my back to the railing so I could just look at her. I'm pretty sure this whole thing will be my ticket out of South Dakota. I don't know what squad they'll put me on, but I'm going to ask for L.A. Or I was, until I saw what some of these apartments go for. In Rapid City, I pay five fifty a month for a really nice and secure place. I could find you five fifty here, but you probably won't like the location. You'd probably have to learn another language, too. No, thanks. I'm working on it. So what have you been doing? I just came back from Parker Center. I put in my papers. I'm going back on the job. Then I guess 
This is it for us. I heard the FBI and the LAPD don't talk. Yeah, there is a wall there. But it's been known to come down from time to time. I have some friends with the Bureau, believe it or not. I believe it, Harry. I noticed that she was back to calling me by my first name. I wondered if that meant the relationship was over. So, I said, when did you know about McCaleb? What do you mean? Know what? I mean, when did you know that Bacchus didn't kill him, that he killed himself? She put both hands on the railing and looked down into the arroyo. But she wasn't really looking at anything down there. Harry, what are you talking about? I found out who William Bing is. He's a monkey from the pages of his daughter's favorite book. So, what's that mean? It means he checked himself into the hospital in Vegas under a phony name. He had something wrong with him, Rachel. Something inside. I touched the center of my chest. Maybe he was chasing the case, maybe not. Maybe he knew something was wrong and he went over there to that hospital to have it checked out and to keep it quiet. He didn't want his wife and his family to know, and so they checked him out and gave him the bad news. His second heart was going the way his first one went. Cardio, myo, whatever it's called. Bottom line was he was dying. He needed another heart or he was going to die. Rachel shook her head like I was a fool. I don't know how you think you know all of this, but you can't possibly... Look, I know what I know, and I know he had already burned through his medical insurance, and if he was going to get in line for another heart, they would lose everything, the house, the boat, everything. Everything for another heart. I paused and then continued in a quiet and calm voice. He didn't want that. He also didn't want his family to see him waste away and die, on the public dole. And he didn't like the idea of another person dying so he could live. He had already been through that, too. I stopped there to see if she would protest again and try to dissuade me. She remained silent this time. The only things he had left were his life insurance and his pension. He wanted them to have that. So he was the one who changed out his pills. There's a receipt for a health food store under the seat of his car. I called there this morning to see if they sell powdered shark cartilage. They do. He changed out his pills and just kept on taking them. He figured as long as he made a show of taking them, there'd be no autopsy, and everything would work out fine. But it didn't, did it? No. But he had a backup plan for that, too. That's why he waited for the long charter. He wanted to die out there on the boat. He wanted it to be in waters that would come under federal jurisdiction. His hope was that if anything came of it, his friends in the Bureau would take care of everything for him. The only problem with his whole big plan was that he had no idea about the poet. He had no idea his wife would come to me or that a few lines scribbled in a file would lead to all that happened. I shook my head. I should have seen it. The med switch wasn't Bacchus's style. Too complicated. The complicated ones are usually inside jobs. What about the threat to his family? Whether or not he knew it was Bacchus, he knew somebody had threatened his family. He got those photographs, somebody stalking his family. You were saying he checked out and left his family at risk? That's not the Terry McCaleb I knew. Maybe he thought he was ending the risk. The threat to his family was aimed at him. If he was gone, then so too was the threat. Rachel nodded, but it wasn't in any sort of confirmation. If nothing else, your fact chain is interesting, Harry. I'll give you that. But what makes you think we know about this? That I know about it? Oh, you know. The way you dismissed my questions about William Bing, for one thing. But the other is what you did in that house the other day. When I had the gun on Bacchus, he was about to say something about Terry, and you cut him off. You jumped all over what he was about to say. I think he was about to say he didn't kill Terry. 
Oh, yeah, a killer denying one of his victims. Isn't that unusual? Her sarcasm sounded defensive to me. This time it would have been. He was no longer hiding. He was out in the open, and he would have taken credit if credit was due him. You knew that, and that's why you cut him off. You knew he was going to deny it. She came away from the railing and stood in front of me. Okay, Harry, you think you've got it all figured out. You found a sad little suicide hidden in all the murders. What are you going to do with it? You going to go out there and announce it to the world? The only thing that might do is take the money away from the family. Is that what you want? Maybe you can get a piece of it as the whistleblower reward. Now I turned away from her and leaned down on the railing. No, I don't want that. I just don't like being lied to. Oh, I get it. This really isn't about Terry. It's about you and me, isn't it? I don't know what it's about, Rachel. Well, when you do, when you figure it all out, let me know, okay? She suddenly came up next to me and kissed me hard on the cheek. Goodbye, Bosch. Maybe I'll see you around once the transfer comes through. I didn't turn around to watch her go. I listened as her angry footsteps crossed the deck and then the maple floor inside. I heard the front door slam with a finality that reverberated right through me. It was that tumbling bullet again. Chapter 45 I stood on the porch elbows on the railing for a long time after Rachel left. My guess was that I would never see her again, whether or not she took a transfer to Los Angeles. I felt a loss. I felt like something good had been taken from me, before I really knew how good it could be. I tried to put her out of my mind for a little while. Terry McCaleb, too. I looked out at the city and thought it was beautiful. The rain had cleaned the sky out, and I could see all the way to the San Gabriels and the snow-covered peaks beyond. The air seemed to be as clean and as pure as the air breathed by the Gabrielinos and the Padres so many years before. I saw what they had seen in the place. It was the kind of day you felt you could build a future on. This has been a Time Warner Audiobooks production of The Narrows, written by Michael Connolly and read by Len Cariou. Executive Producer, Maya Thomas. Produced by Linda Ross. Directed by Bob Walter. Post-production by Steven Strassman. The Narrows is also available in hardcover from Little Brown and Company. To listen to samples or read more about the authors, please visit Time Warner Audiobooks website at twbookmark.com. This audiobook is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are either the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead, events, or locales is entirely coincidental. Acknowledgements The author would like to thank many individuals who helped with the writing of this book. They include Michael Peach, Jane Wood, Pamela Marshall, Perdita Burlingame, Jane Davis, Terry Hansen, Terrell Lee Lankford, Ed Thomas, Frederica Leffelar, Jerry Hooten, and researcher Carolyn Chris. Also of great help to the author were Philip Spitzer, Joel Gottler, Shannon Byrne, Sophie Cottrell, John Houghton, Mario Pulice, Mary Capps, Ken Delavine, Patricia and George Compagnoni and the entire staff at Little Brown and Company, as well as the Time Warner Book Group. Two books that were very helpful to the author were 
Zizek's History of an Oasis by Ann Q. Duffield Stoll and Rio L.A. Tales from the Los Angeles River by Pat Morrison with photographs by Mark LaMonica. Special thanks go to Chief William Bratton and Detective Tim Marsha of the Los Angeles Police Department and Special Agents Gail Jacobs and Nina Roseberry of the FBI's Las Vegas field office.